Yo Atlas speaking, and welcome to a brand new series on the channel, and the second One Piece fanfiction on the channel. What if I was reincarnated in the One Piece verse as Monkey D. Luffy? Synopsis. All I know is this is just wrong. I was just reading the latest chapter of One Piece in my computer, and an annoying survey popped up asking me if I want to play One Piece New Beginning. Thinking nothing of it, I said yes, and selected Realistic Difficulty. There was a game loading screen, loading gibberish, and warning me that the world has a lot of surprises in store for me. Not all things are same, because I had to choose the developer's timeline, and then telling me to brace for character synchronization. And before I knew it, I was no longer your average Joe. And this wasn't Earth either. No, this was One Piece. And I was Monkey D. Luffy, the future king of pirates. I mean, what could go wrong? If Luffy could do it, so could I. But this wasn't the same One Piece world I remember. Some changes are small, like Kuina being Zoro's rival, who's alive, while others were huge. Like, did you know Whitebeard had an actual beard? Man looked like Santa Claus on steroids. Jaked and shit. Just what did I get myself into? But does it matter? No. Because I'm going to have the time of my life. This was going to be one heck of an adventure. And without further ado, let the tale begin. Chapter 1. Come on, baby. Last set. The boy said as he pushed the huge boulder from his chest, up and down. The boy was tiny compared to the rock he was lifting, and yet he was doing it. Last one. The boy said, gritting his teeth as he pushed it away from his chest. Yeah, baby. Lightweight. With that he threw the boulder to his side, and he was left panting on the ground. His chest rose and fell with a rhythm, and sweat poured down from all over his body. The ground quacked a bit when the boulder hit the ground. God, that was a good workout. He was already feeling his chest burning, and it's a PR, so it's double the fun. He said, laughing his odd laugh, shishishi. The boy was around the age of 14 and 15. From his goofy smile to the stitched scar under his left eye, it was obvious who he was. More so when he sat on the ground and wore his iconic straw hat. His name is Monkey D. Luffy. But he wasn't from here. He was from the real world. And things happened and now, he was here. It's already been a month, and he had accepted that reality. There was no going back, so he could only move forward. It was hard to accept, but after walking through the endless white room for who knows how long he was finally able to come here. So he wasn't that upset. The last thing he remembered was some weird internet game. Yeah, not your standard ice guy. No death with an overcomplicated backstory or randomly getting smashed by Truxama. So, yeah. No. Reincarnation or transmigration. Even though it didn't make sense, it happened that way. The last thing he remembered was the game warning him about the dangers of One Piece World. And his headset attacking his face, its shape morphed as it attached to his face. And before he knew it, he was in a white room. The lobby. Where he would have to wait. Until the so-called servers were back and the room was basically white torture for him. There was no one there. And after spending, who knows how long there, he was finally brought to One Piece World. Back on Earth, he didn't have any family well. Not that were worth mentioning. And honestly, he didn't remember much. His white torture messed up with his memories, as other than some important info he didn't know much. And that included his name. It seems his brain thought that his name wasn't important enough. But, hey, he wasn't complaining. After spending, who knows how long in the lobby, he stopped questioning the reality of the situation. This world might as well be a supernatural simulation, but did he care? No. He accepted it. And he wasn't the one to give up the chance for a grand adventure, even though it wouldn't start for a long while. Three years to be exact. It was a good thing in a way. He had a few years on his hand, and he was going to make the most out of it. The Straw Hat Pirates would be grand like no other a true voyage for the future pirate king. No, the strongest pirate king. There was another reason why he accepted this world. Even if he was dragged down here by a so-called internet survey, which was a super realistic One Piece game in disguise. You see, he had a dream. He wanted to be the strongest back on Earth. And as a youngster powerlifter, he was already making names. But other than that, he didn't have any goals back there. And even though he might be able to accomplish his dream back there, doing it here, Making himself the strongest man alive would be something to look forward to. Be it Whitebeard or Kaido, he was going to beat them all. 
and claim the place as the world's strongest. And while he was at it, he would make sure to grab the one piece. The strongest king of the pirates has a nice ring to it. So he accepted it. Training again? A voice called out, breaking him out of his musing. It was Ace. Oh, look who came back? Luffy said, rolling his eyes, not getting up from the ground. Yeah, but you won't stop pestering me if I didn't leave. Ace said, crossing his arms. And before you say, no, I'm not going to join your crew. And that's final. Did he try to recruit Ace to his own crew? Yup. Why? Because Ace was strong. I mean, I'm way stronger than when I was back on Earth. Luffy thought. And yet Ace was stronger than me. Of course, I would want him to join my crew. And it would also be saving him from an early death this way. Even though this world is different from the One Piece I know, it should still have some similarities. Did he forget to mention that this world would be different because he so-called chose the developer's timeline in that stupid survey? Yeah, he was kind of fucked. Anyway, he did get the original Luffy's memories, but accessing them was quite the headache. Quite literally. Maybe it's because he only had this body for around a month? He didn't question the logic behind it. Anime logic being prevalent and all. So, went along with it. Anyway, even without the influence of Luffy's memories, Ace was someone he would save. He was the brother he never had. Venturing through Luffy's old memories was like watching a first-person movie. The only con was a head-splitting headache. This world was supposed to be different. So he was trying to see if anything from Luffy's memories changed or not. But Luffy didn't need that to grow a bond with Ace. He had spent only one month with him. But Ace treated him very well. Like an actual family. And as an orphan growing up, he knew he had to keep the bond. Because it was the right thing to do. Back on Earth, he was around the age of 21. So it was awkward when a 17-year-old was treating him like a younger brother of his. But he was treated like a family member. So he wasn't that annoyed. He was glad in a way. Hey, don't give me that face. Ace said, annoyed. I said it already, I will leave today. And I don't want you seeing me off like this. Oh yeah. Ace was going to start his journey. And he already felt saddened by it. Luffy don't be a baby. He quickly shook his head. He wasn't going to stop Ace from having his own journey. Who said, I'm a baby. You are the baby. Ace snickered. Well, something never changes. Before he sighed, sometimes, you worry me, Luffy. He said, don't worry about me. I will be just fine. And you know the promise, right? Luffy nodded. Three years. He said, almost by instincts. Nodded, placing his hand on his shoulder. Be sure to get strong. Or I might just take the title of the King of Pirates. Luffy instinctively waved his hand away. No way. I am going to be the King of Pirates. He said, grin widening. Not just that. I will be the strongest king of the pirate. Ace just smiled. Now that's the Luffy I know. He wasn't going to lie. He was going to miss the freckled boy. Luffy stood at the shore. Everybody had left, and he couldn't even see Ace's boat anymore. He was actually a bit worried. He was here, and it might cause an unforeseen butterfly effect. He was actually worried about the 17-year-old boy, who just left. Ace had started his journey, and he couldn't do anything but wish him luck. It also made Luffy think about what he should be doing for the next few years. After coming to this world, he avoided using his rubber abilities, unless he was stuck in some shitty situation. Like getting stuck under the boulder that one time. But now if he wanted to get strong, he would need to use every one of his abilities. Luffy curiously stretched out his fingers. It felt odd. But at the same time, it felt familiar. He would need to get used to his ability. Also, he looked at his side, picking up the rusted, beat-up metal pipe. He wasn't going to stop using a weapon. He was going to be strong, but unlike Luffy, he wasn't going to be careless. Sharp things were the bane for his rubber body, and he was going to use a weapon if he ever faced a skilled swordsman. And it was a good thing that he could instantly do some tricks with the pipe. Unlike his devil fruit, he had inherited the use of a stick from the original Luffy, so he was going to stick with it. In future, he was planning on going to the Katakuri route or the Whitebeard route. Having a cool named weapon was kind of cool, you know. It would also broaden his skill arsenal. A slash in. Hello there, readers. I would like to say that all of my fanfics will start like this, similar to my Abito story. 
It's a trend I'm thinking of starting, something different from the standard Ice Guy stuff. That's also the reason. I made the intro short. I don't want to tell my MC's slash Luffy's character here. I would rather show it. As the chapters go on, you will see his character. Also, no. I won't finish my story with a boring ending such as waking up from a dream and such. That would be stupid. Unlike Pokemon, I kind of have a good knowledge base over One Piece. So you can expect that I'm going to take some creative jumps. Though the changes won't be much. Just a few things changed here and there. But I will add my own twist on things. Maybe add new arcs and islands. I don't just want it to be another Luffy SI rehash. Luffy and the crew will be strong. But they will have to earn that strength. This story is officially inspired by One Piece. I mean, duh. Also inspired from Second Wind, Kobe's Choice, A Crew for a King, A Boy with a Scar, Anchor and Compass, A Fruitless Start, and many more fanfics that I have read over the years. They gave me ideas and hope to write my own One Piece story. Check them out when you have time. Also, I own nothing but my own ideas. Anyway, enjoy the story and write down your ideas of what you want me to do. Chapter 2 A few weeks later after Ace's first bounty, Luffy was in Makino's bar drinking a lemonade when the bar's door was kicked open. And for some reason, Luffy felt fear. A shiver ran down his spine as he gulped down the food that he was chewing. And with hesitance, he looked over his shoulder, already sweating. In these past weeks, he had fought bears and some pretty wild beasts. But this time, he was genuinely feeling fear, along with some fondness. How did that work? It wasn't previous, Luffy's emotions, or anything like that. It was basic instincts. Where's AC? A middle-aged man called out. Said man also had the build of a giant. The man was at least nine feet tall and had huge muscles. Even though Luffy knew it, it just felt weird seeing giant people. Speaking off, this world also kind of didn't look real. Well, it did in a way. Everything was more vivid, animated, and realistically artistic if that was a word. In some ways, it had its own charm. Anyway, the thing was the person who smashed the door open wasn't a giant. No, it was his grandpa. Seeing the man, Luffy felt a plethora of emotions. He had gone over most of Luffy's memories in the past few weeks, so even though he never met Garp, he already knew enough about him. And honestly, he respected the guy. He didn't get previous Luffy's emotions or sentiments, so he also had to act carefully and maybe a bit childlike, or Luffy-like, in front of him. He didn't want to be found out by a sudden change in personality. But then again, even his previous personality wasn't much different from Luffy's so yeah. It seems he didn't need to act too hard. Still, seeing Garp so large and tall, built like a giant, it also made him jealous, a weird feeling to have. But that was given. After coming to this world, he had lost all of his muscles that he had crafted over years of hard work. Losing them gains is quite the hardball to swallow. But if he could look like that when he's older, then that's worth it. But looking at his so-called grandpa's legs, he was definitely not going to skip leg days. Hey, gee grandpa, Luffy said as remembering the memories of head bonking. Those were honestly painful. The bashing on the head was almost lethal and Luffy genuinely didn't want to experience them. Ace isn't here. The man narrowed his eyes looking at Luffy. And where might he be brat? Who knows? Big world. He started sweating. And that wasn't from knowing that this man could go toe-toe with the Pirate King. It was from those so-called fists of love that he didn't want to experience. But boink and he felt just that, O.W. Oh, you stinking gramps that hurts. Luffy shouted, grabbing his head. Fuck this. This old man hits like a truck. Why was I suffering again? Oh, yeah, because one of my so-called brothers started his pirate journey. Well, fuck him. But then again, if he found out that Sabo was a revolutionary, he might drag him to Marine Ford and start his early career as a Marine. And then came another, boink, ouch. What was that for? You weren't paying attention, Luffy, Garp said. Why did that brat go off to be a pirate? And here I was trying to train you guys to be marines. I won't be a marine. Luffy quickly grabbed his mouth, acting as if he never said that. What's that? Garp asked. You said something? Luffy hastily shook his head. Garp nodded at that before taking a sit on the bar. Makino, give me some lunch. And Luffy, you want something? Um, meat. Luffy tilted his head, 
and Garp nodded, still scowling and irritated. Of course, you would want that. The man scoffed. Meat for two. Well, at least he was going to get something else to eat, rather than a beating. Luffy was seen lying in a clearing inside the forest. Around him were at least hundreds of human-sized monkeys knocked out. Some were around him, while some were on the trees. Heck, there was even a pyramid of knocked-out monkeys, one top of each other. So you were still using your pipe, Garp said, not far from him, picking his nose. I thought you were not going to use that anymore. Luffy supported himself with his long pipe as stood up, still huffing and puffing. Low diff. Asterisk ahim. I mean, my devil fruit isn't anything special. So I have to be creative. He said in between his breaths. Of course, he knew how special his fruit powers were. But he didn't need to market it around. Garp raised an eyebrow. Huh. And here I thought the monkey family's intellect skipped a generation. Wah? Nothing. Garp then stood up. I am leaving today. You better not go out of the island on your own. I don't need you repeating what Ace did. I won't, Luffy said. I still have three years. He blurted out. His Luffy instincts would get him killed. Garp gave a frustrated scowl. But before he could say something Luffy spoke. Gramps, who's my father? Okay. This was the only way he knew to throw the man off. Garp was taken aback by the question. Where did that come from? Well, you know how Ace is the you-know-who's son. So I wanted to know my dad was. Luffy asked, is he dead? The boy looked a bit scared. Acting isn't my strong suit, but I hope it convinces the old man. No, Garp said, already rubbing his head. He sighed when he saw Luffy feeling relieved at the news. Then where is he? Can I meet him? Is he a marine? Is he strong? What's his devil fruit? Does he poop? Shut it, brat. Garp said, massaging his forehead. Way too many questions. Luffy shut up. I can only say his name. Garp said, and Luffy nodded. But don't say it to anyone. He said the last part with a serious expression. Luffy slowly nodded. Yeah, like I want to have a buster call on my ass. Well, not right now at least. Fighting a few vice admirals kind of would be cool. His name is Dragon. He is a dragon? Luffy shouted, overreacting, then comically pointed at Garp. You did it with a dragon? That's disgusting and awesome at the same time. Garp spat blood, before punching the lights out of Luffy. But was it worth it? Definitely, it was worth it. Why you? His name is Dragon. Monkey des Dragons. He's not a dragon, Garp said with a tick mark on his forehead. And I am not even going to ask how you know about birds and bee stuff. Stupid brats growing up too fast. And he left, his irritation back on his face. Luffy smiled cheekily, spitting out dirt before standing up. Oh boy, that hurt. But it was worth it. Throwing the old man off was quite fun. Wait, Gramps. Don't leave me behind. Luffy then followed Garp who grumpily sped up. After the day was over. A marine ship with the head of a dog came to pick the vice admiral up. Luffy unlike other times stayed, Oi, Gramps. What is it now? Garp asked, When are you going to get back? Garp frowned at the question, maybe not having Ace. Changed his grandkid. After six months. On your birthday. He said, not irritated this time. Just curious. Why, brat? Oom. Mm. Luffy said, before opening and closing his mouth. How should he say it? Not gonna lie, it is a bit embarrassing. Just say it, brat. Garp grumbled. Can you bring me one of those weapons that's like a stick, but not a stick? And has a blade on the top of it? Luffy said, in one breath. Yeah, asking something just felt a bit weird and embarrassing. It kind of feels like I'm taking advantage of him, which I am. I'm going to get used to this stuff. Garp grinned this time. You want a spear? Rubbing his chin. Or a Najinata? Uh, I don't know. Whichever you can get. Has to have a good enough to last till I get as old as you. He didn't have a preference. He wanted a pointed weapon just in case he wasn't able to learn the Rokushiki in these three years. Also, he was in a fantasy world. Calling out names and doing sword slashes would be anyone's wet dream. But rather than getting an answer, he got hit in the head. Ow. What was that for? Who are you saying, old brat? Luffy gave him a deadpan look. The old man had gone senile. It was official. And got another hit. I will see what I can do.
The old man muttered as he started walking off, a small smile on his lips. Yeah, I want the best, Luffy said, ignoring the winching pain in his head. Garp smirked a bit thinking things over. Yeah, I will get you one. He had one in mind. It was the first time Luffy actually wanted something from him, and so he needed to show off a bit. Maybe that would put some interest in Marines and the boy. Chapter 3 Six months passed in a blink of an eye. Luffy had improved a lot in these last few months. Sure he wasn't strong like how Luffy was when he started his journey, but he was getting there. 498 For 99 500-inch Luffy said there was a huge rock ten times his size on his back. And after the last push-up, he was lying down on the running water. Uh, I feel so damn weak. He was on a small waterfall inside the forest. A place where he could relatively train his non-devil fruit powers. This was also the reason why he was gaining strength quickly. He took a page out of original Luffy's Wano training, and surprisingly it worked well. As a previous powerlifter, he was well acquainted with monitoring his strength gain, even if it was small. And doing water training was turning out great for him. However, he didn't know if this training would make him gain some form of resistance. In general, a devil fruit user couldn't swim underwater. But was there a way to make yourself resistant enough to gain back the swimming ability? It seemed far-fetched, but he was willing to try. And it wasn't like he had to give extra effort. Gritting his teeth, he stood up, removing the rock from his back. Gaining back his usual strength felt incredible. And it was also good that he was getting used to his devil fruit abilities. Training this way was a hassle. It was a good thing that he had a waterfall on the island. A devil fruit user usually had to immerse one third of his body in water to start getting weak. At the same time, his or her devil fruit powers wouldn't work. And that would be an issue when he would start his voyage. He wouldn't be able to train that way. And he wasn't stupid enough to try and dump himself in the ocean for some small gains. That would be reckless and stupid. Luckily, he didn't inherit those quirky habits from the original Luffy. So he had to look for a way to gain sea stones. He should look around the kingdom. And if that doesn't work, he could always try to sneak up to Garp's ship and try his luck there. Though getting caught would be too much of a pain. Six months have passed, and training kind of got a bit boring. Sure, fighting giant beasts that could give old age dinosaurs a run for their money was fun. But it got boring nonetheless. He barely knew anyone in the village. Sure, Luffy knew the others in the village. But he didn't and it felt just awkward mingling with them. Though Makino was cool, and she wouldn't constantly pester him like the bandits. And yet the bandits and Makino were the only social life he had, outside of the sudden visits by Garp. Maybe he should get a pet. It might help him get rid of some of his boredom. Even though he didn't want to admit it, he felt bored when the Mount Bandits weren't around. So he had gained the hobby of pranking them here and there, just for the sake of it. Having all the free time in the world meant more time for training. It did nothing for his social life, but it did make him strong. But even if he constantly pushed himself harder, without any challenge his strength gain would have diminishing returns. He was following the power route approach to things. But he knew for this world's standards it wasn't the optimal way. He should ask the old man for some training advice next time. The adrenaline you get from wrestling a giant bear is no joke. It was almost addictive sometimes, and he concluded that it was a better way to gain strength. But there weren't that many challenges in the island anymore. Still, he would have loved to have someone teach him some actual combat. Luffy's fighting style was pure chaos. His fighting style fully revolved around his devil fruit abilities. And he was a power lifter back on earth, not a kickboxer. He really regretted not picking up some martial arts in his last life. Today Garp or Grandpa was going to return to the village and it would be lying that wasn't excited. He was eagerly waiting for Garp's gift, but then again he doubted that he would give him something amazing. But who knows I might be in for a surprise. But Luffy shook his head, there's no way I will be getting a named sword, but it would at least be better than these junks. He said looking down on the rusted and almost broken spear he was using. He had gone to Goa Kingdom and searched every shop, but he couldn't find any decent weapons. The current spear he was using was stolen from a marine base in the Goa Kingdom. It wasn't much, but it had to do. And he wasn't going to be a sword user, that was more of a Zoro thing. He was using a spear, by the looks of it, it wouldn't hold much longer. It was a weapon that he could use like his pipe, with the added benefit of a blade on the end. 
Luffy took his spear and started walking down to the village. It was already noon, maybe Grandpa was already there. He needed to be strong, and that meant needed to take every opportunity that he could take. I found you, brat. A voice called out, and Luffy looked up and from the sky he saw a giant man descending. Chapter 4 I found you, brat. A voice called out, and Luffy looked up and from the sky he saw a giant man descending. Luffy quickly jumped back with his rubber body and the man landed in front of him, blowing dust and breaking the ground, creating a crater on the ground. Come on, Gramps. Luffy shouted, picking himself up and dusting off his clothes. I just washed up. Garp grinned. Look what I got for you, brat. And the giant of a man tossed a large thing at Luffy, who barely escaped, as it stuck into the ground. It was a weapon wrapped in dirty white cloth. Check it out, and see if it's to your liking. He needed no more explanation. He took away the covering and a silver metal pole came into view, and the blade attached to it was around three to four feet. A single-edged blade. The design was so that the blade looked like coming out of a golden dragon's mouth, and it even had golden engravings on it. It was a Najinata, a type of Japanese spear. Whitebeard uses one as well. But that wasn't the part that made his jaw drop nope. It was the fact that this was an antique Muzum piece. The cloth had it written on it. This thing was a freaking great grade sword. The cloth had a small description on it. Name, unknown description. Being one of the 21 great grade swords, its durability is unparalleled. The weapon was crafted in the lost lands of samurai and was used by a pirate before the golden age of piracy. There were other information, but they were smudged out for him to read. No, freaking way. Who the heck would gift a 15-year-old that kind of weapon? But he wasn't complaining. Luffy grinned, grabbing the weapon that was a bit large for his size. Mehi will grow into it, and lifted it. Or at least tried to. That thing was freaking heavy. Bah ha ha ha. The weapon is yours if you can lift it. Garp laughed, seeing his grandson struggle. Believe me, Luffy, you aren't strong enough yet. Bah ha ha ha. What was this? A screenplay of Thor? Of course, the old man wouldn't just give it to Luffy. Luffy finally gave up, trying to lift it. He snapped his head towards the laughing old man. Why can't I lift it? He could lift a boulder four times his size. So what's wrong with him? Bah ha ha. Cause you ain't strong enough. Why you gomu goma no? Pistol. The rubber boy punched with his stretched arm only to get deflected by a wave of hand. Bah ha 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 no wonder you are weak, Garp said, really getting on Luffy's nerves. I will teach you to wield that blade if you join the Marines. Yeah, then you can take that back and shove it up Sengoku's ass, Luffy said pointing at the weapon. Garp shut his laugh then looked at his weapon, then his grandson, before he cried out another laugh. Bah ha ha, I'm enjoying this more than I should. You are really a crook you know that. He grumbled. Don't worry, you will grow into it. Bahaha. Fight me, you old gezer. Old gezer? And the fight ensured, or like it always was, a one-way betting ensured. He was improving, he could feel it. But it was nowhere near the old man's strength. Freaking monster. He grumbled. It also motivated him to push himself further in training. And then the old geezer left, saying something about not having enough time to check into the nearest marine base. Luffy picked his broken self up, looking at the weapon. He grabbed the cold silver metal pole. I am going to make you mine one day, and that's a promise. With that, he left the weapon there. He was sure other than Garp, no one else would be able to wield it. And it's not like he had an inventory to store the dang thing. Man having a cheat would have been awesome now. The next day, Garp came back from nowhere. He might have been in Goa Kingdom's marine base, or on his personal ship, Luffy didn't know. But he did come by, and wanted to drag Luffy to some unconventional method of training. But Luffy wasn't having any of that. He wanted to do something else. Come brat, let's get you some training done. You need some muscles on those bones if you want to be a marine just like your amazing grandpa, Garp said, only getting an annoyed look from the boy. And that piqued Garp's curiosity. The boy usually went head first and spoke his mind. So he asked, why the look? You know you are a liar old man? Eh, what do you mean, brat? Asked Garp peeking his nose. Is it about his weapon? This. Luffy pulled out a paper from his pants which had a picture of a man wearing a green cloak and a red tattoo painted on his left side. 
Not just any paper, it was a bounty poster of the revolutionary dragon. Garp's eyes almost came out of his socket when saw that, and Luffy wondered how that was even possible, but he put that thought in the back burner in his mind. Anime logic and all. Garp quickly snatched the bounty poster away. How the heck did the brat find a poster of him? What the? Gramps. Give it back, Luffy shouted childishly, grabbing the Marine's attention, but the old man was still in a daze. Heh, take that old man. Why didn't you tell me my father was a great pirate? Huh. Garp blinked. He looked at the poster then at his grandson. Your father ain't a pirate. Liar. Luffy said, taking out another copy of the same bounty poster from somewhere. See, he even has a bounty. There's so many zeros. It's even bigger than aces. It's kinda amazing. Hey, by the way, who had a greater bounty my pops or his? I mean I didn't know he was a pirate and all. He said. Wait, what? Garp then looked at his grandson, before figuring. Out the kid didn't know about the stuff. With a heavy sigh, he placed his hand on his grandkid's shoulder. He isn't a pirate. He's. He's something even worse. He's a revolutionary. The head of the revolutionary, in fact. So he's strong. Is he dangerous? Luffy asked. Garp nodded. Even more than Shanks. Garp nodded again. In some ways he was. But then he looked at Luffy, who had stars in his eyes. Oh, this was bad. Garp thought. Don't you ever think about it? That's so cool. Luffy shouted, with stars in his eyes. Garp of course boinked him in the head with a fist of love. That's not good, brat. That's worse than being a pirate, he said. And how did you know that this was your old man? Luffy shook his head, avoiding the signs of a concussion. He answered, I didn't. I just searched my stash of bounty poster and found it. I didn't know who he was. Luffy said, looking at Garp, but judging from your reaction, he's my dad, isn't he? Garp scoffed. Why did I have to fall for the oldest trick in the book? And lately, he was showing signs of intelligence. He just hoped that Luffy wouldn't be following in his father's footsteps. I'm getting too old for this shit. Chapter 5 Yeah, and he's a pain in the ass. Said Garp. Don't even plan on being a revolutionary. Nah, I'm good. He grinned. I will be something better. The strongest man and the king of the pirates. Garp for the first time was glad to hear that. It was better being a revolutionary. But then he frowned. Wait. Did you say you have a stash of bounty posters? Yeah, Luffy nodded. There were tons of them in the marine base. Marine base? Garp said, pulling his fist up. A tick mark on his head. Luffy quickly slapped his mouth shut. Shit. He actually found them there after stealing some of their weapons, and kept them. But why did he slip up? Bad Luffy bad. You didn't happen to be the thief who is stealing from the marines, are you? I. it was only once. Luffy said, Maybe twice or three times. But it was accidental. I promise. I just slipped. Garp just sighed. It all seemed to be a coincidence. Personally, Garp didn't want Luffy to know who his father was, and after what happened with Ace, he didn't want Luffy to hate Dragon. Sure, he didn't really like what the brat was doing, but it was an honorable goal. Even though his personal beliefs were more aligned with Marines, Dragon had more radical approach to things. However, he could see why. Sometimes even he questioned if he was in the right side or not. Anyhow, Gramps, teach me something. Luffy said, a bit childishly, teach me something and I might just forgive you for your miss up, he said, pouting and crossing his arms. And I might not ever question about him again, he muttered the last part. But Garp heard it just fine. Honestly, he was willing to give anything to stop the boy from asking about that man. Shanks was a bad influence enough. He didn't want another one for his grandson. And what might that be, brat? Teach me, Luffy said, pointing at the bumps on his head. How you are able to hurt me. Garp laughed. Bah. Oh that. That's called hockey. Not that he would be able to learn it, of course. Luffy smiled. Stars in his eyes. Oh then teach me that hockey thing. Bah ha ha ha. In your dreams, brat. Garp said. Join the Marines. I will teach you personally. Well. It was difficult to train someone in hockey if they didn't have immense willpower to fuel the thing. But from his perspective, Luffy had a lot of it. He was stubborn as they get, 
and recently he found out that he was pushing himself more on training after Ace left. And training like that and being stubborn was the definition of willpower in his books. But the thing was Luffy wasn't strong enough to learn that yet. Luffy gave an annoyed expression. Come on, Gramps. Teach me something cool. Luffy said. Something that makes my punches harder. Garp rubbed his chin. Then an idea came to his mind. I can't teach you hockey. But I can teach you the next best thing. And the Garp jumped off. High. Kicking the air as he did. The heat kicked again. And he started climbing the air. Soon Garp came back with a smile on his face. How was that, brat? He shouted down. Was he going to teach his grandson Rokushiki? Nope. Son Goku would have his ass. But he could show it to him to get him interested in the Marines. Also, he did feel kinda bad that the weapon that he gifted Luffy couldn't be wielded unless he became strong enough. So he could throw a bone or two. There are in total six of those techniques. They are called the Rokushiki. It takes a strong body and mind to learn it. Cool. The boy had stars in his eyes. Teach me. Oh, that's easy. You just kick the air. Garp said as if that was a matter of fact. Or join the Marines. His face turned into a mocking grin as he laughed. Come on. Teach me. Please, Gramps. Luffy said. In a pleading tone. Even giving his puppy eyes. Garp landed down seeing this, but didn't say anything. He just picked his nose with a boring expression, not even getting affected by it. After raising Makino, he was now super resistant to it. Nah, figure it out. Bahaha. Only Dragon was able to do it. And that was when he trained with the Marines, before leaving their cause. And he was sure Luffy wouldn't be able to learn it. Garp grinned, enjoying the frustrated expression of Luffy. But he would help out his grandson. So he took something out from his pocket and tossing it to Luffy. It was a small notebook. There are a few workouts here that will help you with that technique. They are pretty hard but they build up strength in the body overall and will make it so you can learn these cool techniques. Of course, this book was only a demonstration written by Zephyr. They were kind of rare to find these days. To use the Rokushiki one needs to build up their body strength in specific areas and only after that they would be eligible to learn the techniques. This book just covered the first part. The second part was only doable if you went to Marine Ford and trained under an instructor. Sengoku used that to make all good candidates learn in from Marine Ford. So he was basically giving the boy way to get strong, and by his estimate if he was able to gain strength according to the small book, he might have a chance to lift up the Najinata. Luffy smiled, before frowning, when he opened the book, and then looked at Garp, but I can't read. Garp threw his head back and laughed, I know, bahaha. He said, teach yourself that. And be quick. I will take it back tomorrow. He lied. He would give the brat a week. It should be enough to motivate him to learn reading. With that he started to walk away. I am going to catch some fish to eat. Also, he wasn't worried. Sure those workouts would build a body for Rokushiki techniques, but it took years for normal marines to learn them, and that was having instructors. So, this will be his bait to catch Luffy into the marines. This wasn't some highly advanced technique either. This was just the first part. The second part was the most important, where it was detailed how to perform the techniques. The second part of course needed an instructor to demonstrate and correct the small mistakes. But of course, the marines being so old, there were some books here and there which had writings on it. And other than the official marine source, or good black market connections one wouldn't be able to get that. So he was sure Luffy wouldn't be able to learn them. Soon Garp would come to realize how wrong he was and a certain someone would be up on his ass for that. Chapter 6 As Luffy saw Garp leave, he quickly scanned the small notebook in his hands. After making sure Garp left, he ran towards his hiding spot, grinning and laughing along the way. It worked. His acting skills worked. It gave him something that he could finally use to better himself. Sure, acting like Luffy was no big deal, but when you want to be Luffy and be smart at the same time, it was another thing entirely. Show too much intelligence, and you are suspected, and show less, and you are a moron that doesn't need attention. When he came to this world, one of the things he learned was that he could speak and understand Japanese fluently. It came along with Luffy's memories, but he couldn't read or write. It seemed Garp didn't teach Luffy that. Well, the old man was always was planning on making him join the Marines, and they would take care of it. But what the old man didn't know was that before leaving, Ace had learned how to read and write from Makino. 
Of course, like the good big brother Ace was, he wanted Luffy to learn it as well. But the boy was too rowdy to learn anything that needed him to sit for more than 10 minutes. But that was the old Luffy, not him. So Luffy only had to pursue Makino to teach him. And she did patiently. He wasn't an expert of the language or anything, but in the six months, he could now read and write basics. And now Luffy just needed some pen and paper to copy the full notebook before Garp left. Luffy would obviously beg Garp whenever he found him to teach him about hockey. But he was half sure that the man wouldn't budge. That man was stubborn as he was. And that was saying something. But that didn't mean he could smart his way into things. There was an internet theory popular back in his world, where it stated that Luffy and the viewers couldn't see the blackness of hockey was because Luffy didn't learn about it. So in the Summit War, everyone did use hockey, but we the viewers and Luffy weren't able to see it because of that. Of course that was excluding My Hawk's Black Blade, which had permanent hockey on it. So his first step would be to observe Garp's hand every time the giant man attacked him. His rubber body could take all shots, but when it came to hockey, he felt pain like a normal human. So even though it was a painful process, he would see to it that he learned about hockey. Also, even though he officially would start his journey when 17, it didn't mean that he couldn't get help from outside. He wouldn't leave the island. Ace made him promise that. And as a man, he was going to keep it. But getting outside help into the island should be easy. If he played his cards right and gathered enough wealth, he was sure that he could buy some guidebook to hockey from the black market. Also, as he scanned the book, he realized that it was only about conditioning his body. There was no mention of the techniques. Maybe he could find the techniques from the black market as well. I mean, I'm sure Dofi Joker had some guidebook on hockey circulating around the black market. Any pirate that survived a day in the new world would give him all to buy and learn that shit. He thought, also, that guy has one of his crewmates in the Marines, so he should also have the Rokushiki with him. Luffy looked at the notebook in his hand. It was quite big, and copying would be a hassle. But then again, he was a person who didn't back down from any challenge. More so when that challenge aligned with his goals. It's not some Rokushiki manual, but it was the next best thing. He thought to himself, if the original Luffy could figure out how to Jeepo and Soro, or his own version of it, then so could I and this will make it hell of a lot easier. So he was going to start with those, and in the meantime try to get into the local island's black market and see if he could get anything there. But then again, learning all the other Rokushiki techniques might be not good for him. But he could teach them to his crewmates in the future. And this book had all the exercises needed for a person to gain the basic body requirements for Rokushiki techniques. Unlike people like Odin, Kido, or Big Mom, who were born strong, Luffy wasn't. He just trained and fought countless battles to make himself strong. Sure had all the chosen one shenanigan going for him, like his normal devil fruit powers turning into a broken one, but he had to struggle to get to that point. And it would be tough, but he was going to make himself strong enough that he could squat any flies in the first part of the Grand Line. In the Navy headquarters, a man was seen fuming in anger. He slammed the desk. Why that garp? He shouted. It was none other than Fleet Admiral Sengoku. Why didn't you stop him from taking that, if you were there? I felt lazy? Sengoku's veins were about to pop out of his skull. That was one of the grade swords from Rock's era. As an admiral, you should have stopped him. Yeah, me stopping the marine hero? Kazan said, rolling his eyes. He still treats me like a kid, and would punch my lights out. No, thank you. That's too much of a drag. He then started walking away. He didn't need to do anything but report it. Who cares what happened to that old relic? Most marines use swords and guns anyways, so that was mostly left untouched. You sit right here, Akiji, the Buddha shouted. Go and find out where Garp is and call him, and make sure no one finds out about the incident. Kazan grumbled, but nodded nonetheless. Why did I have to put up with this again? Oh, because Garp was former sensei, that's why? Stupid old man. Sengoku was already having a massive headache. The so-called marine hero just stole one of the relics in the marine museum. And how was he supposed to explain that to his superiors? It was a good thing that no one visited that place. It was basically a junkyard for all unusable weapons that marines collected from pirates. The Gora CI built that place for their personal amusement. And he was sure that those oldies wouldn't care that much. Or at least he hoped. But it also made him wonder how Garp remembered about the weapon. 
But then Sengoku remembered that Garp was the one that caught the previous wielder of that blade. Maybe that's why. Senku massaged his temples. But the main question was why would Garp need that? Sengoku didn't know why, but he had a bad feeling about it. Chapter 7 I was right. Luffy grinned looking downwards at the weighing machine. Never in his life, he would have been so happy to gain weight. Luffy had his hands stretched out at least a couple of meters toward the ceiling, using his rubber body. Good thing the room had a high ceiling. So, my weight increases when I use my powers to stretch or expand my body. That means, so does the muscle density and other stuff. Luffy muttered. When training, he always could exhort more strength when he stretched his limbs far. The previous Luffy couldn't see the difference because of having the devil fruit powers from early life but he could clearly feel the weight difference. Normally, one would say it is due to having a rubber body, but a rubber body shouldn't be able to increase someone's mass when stretched out. But then again later his devil fruit was revealed to be a Zoan type. Anyway, that got him thinking and found a weighing scale to test his theory. Luffy's Gear 3, giant punches were actual gigantification of his fists that would expand his everything, muscles, bones, and even weight. And it wasn't only him. Other Devil Fruit users experienced the same thing, like how cop is monster point. But the question came why? Even though logic didn't seem logical in the One Piece world, there was one thing that was a universal rule. Nothing brings nothing. So where did the added mass come from? He came to two conclusions. One was that the fruit gave a power core of sorts that was dense and defied gravity, making it weightless. Anytime a Devil Fruit user uses his powers, they use their powers from the core that's inside, granting them supernatural powers. While the other theory was all fruit users were somehow connected to some supernatural dimensions that granted them powers, with bodily changes. Then again, when Luffy's true fruit was revealed, it broke through all logic. He thought, but that doesn't mean I have to fully follow his route. And this world was different, so I have to prepare for anything. Awakening a fruit would take a lot of time, but he needed power fast. So that's why he was trying to learn more about his fruit's powers. Maybe then he would be close to awakening it. Understanding how your powers worked might give him the edge he needed to gain strength in a short time. Working smart as you put it. Luffy nodded. Now he needed to test his theory out. He looked at his right hand and concentrated his powers on his thumb. Rather than making it long, he tried to make it expand its size. It was a bit difficult and unfamiliar at first, but it worked, making his thumb look like an inflated baseball. But I didn't blow any air into my thumb. So what's in it exactly? Extra blood and muscles? He looked down the weight scale, and there was a notable difference. The weight increased. It was weird. If it was extra blood and muscles that would explain the weight gain. But that might not be the case either, unless of course, his body was in some way connected to some weird rubber dimension. Meh, he was thinking way too much about this stuff. Just throw it as some random anime logic and be done with it. Still he was curious. Anyway, his endeavor was stopped by a sudden shout. Hey, someone broke into the prince's room again. A guard shouted footsteps already coming from the walls. Well, it's time to go, Luffy said. Then looking at the knocked out prince, it was what? The third time. He broke into Sabo's brother's room and beat him shitless. A uh, fun. But then again, Starry really did have a punchable face. The first time, he did. Just for the sake of it. Bullying rich punks kind of felt good. Is that why I had bullies in my previous life? Not that it lasted, of course, after I smashed in some of their teeth in. Also, I was a broke kid. Dipshit poor. So the logic doesn't add up. Oh, he should hurry. He could already hear the foot soldiers trying to bash the door open. Grabbing his hat, Luffy started running towards the window, before jumping with all his might. His rubber body helped to spring the jump, and when he was up in the air, he kicked the air, and it made him jump in the air. He tried it again, but failed this time, slipping as he started his free fall. Still, can't do it constantly. He grumbled to himself as he fell, rubbing his chin in frustration. Oh well. At least it's fun even doing it once. With that he stretched his arms forward, grabbing a nearby building, fingers digging into the wall, and he used that as a means to swing himself forward. It felt fun swinging the air this way. Sure he was no Spider-Man, but this was the next best thing that was similar to Spider-Man, 
and it was pretty fun. Sadly, it only worked on areas that had building-infested areas on it. Finding the two towers, Luffy sent both of his arms forward, mid-air, using the tension to fling himself into the sky as he flew. He straightened himself like a bullet flying through the sky and out of the Goa kingdom. Woohoo! Dropping down into the forest, he rolled forward, stopping himself. This never gets boring, Shishishi. Chapter 8 With that Luffy started walking towards the village, Gramps will come again soon, so I should stop paying visits to the nobles for now. He mumbled to himself. It's been what, almost a year since. Ace left. And the only Rokushiki technique that I can do is Saru and Finger Pistol. I need some real help with the other ones. It was impressive that he went that far, without having the official techniques. He knew his body was already fit for the other four techniques, but he needed to learn those techniques from somewhere. Currently, he was trying to recreate Tekai, Iron Body, and that was why he was looking into his Devil Fruit. Tekai, or Iron Body, would save him from sharp objects until he learned Hockey. After adding the new exercises to the routine that he got from Garp, Luffy's body started to have an even amount of muscles in all areas. Of course, for that, he needed to go the extra mile and do all the workouts in water. It made him grow muscles faster. Even then, most of his muscles looked kind of wobbly and after effect of having a rubber body. He was a power lifter in his previous life, not a bodybuilder. Still, not seeing your gains was kind of a letdown. At least he was gaining strength with this. And man, he didn't know if this was his fruit or that he was a member of the D-Clan. But his recovery was insane. Pushing himself too hard was no problem for him. Having a slim body was also good for learning the techniques. You see the Rokushiki techniques were built so that a user of it would have a balance in all muscle groups. It was actually quite a brilliant method, which favored a balanced body. So it made him wonder how Garp with so few leg muscles could use Saru, his grandfather, and, thinking about it, most One Piece characters had some weird, overly developed upper body. Maybe their leg muscles were compressed. But then again, in his previous like there were people with sleeper builds. Well, I ain't going that route. Maybe when I'm strong enough, I can pull off my own legendary Super Scion. He mused. Well, he did have a technique that did something similar. Still, even with his training, is kind of been getting some diminishing returns. Something that happened previously. There was a reason for that. He wasn't some Waxu hero who trained for hundreds of years. He didn't have that type of motivation. Also, hats off to those lads for doing that. And for the cameraman who stayed with them while training, even if he spent a whole year in this new anime-like world, he was getting bored with the usual routine. Heck, even getting beaten up by Garp was better than boredom. God, how low have I fallen? And the only reason why he was able to discipline himself enough for training was because of the original Luffy's iron will and stubbornness that he, fortunately, inherited, along with his goofy attitude. Hopefully, he didn't inherit Luffy's idioticness. Also, in a few days Makino's birthday was arriving, so he had to get something, and that's why he was snooping into the noble household. Stary, Sabo's adopted brother, was already made the successor for being the next king, and that's why he was messing with him. It was also good that he had a bunch of things that needed to be liberated. Will Makino like the diamond earrings or the diamond bracelet? He asked himself as he walked towards the outgrown forest, away from the kingdom. Eh, I will just give her both. Honestly, the Goa kingdom was a gold mine. There were a bunch of gold and other pieces of jewelry that were up for taking. And stealing from those crooked nobles didn't pester him that much. He had been stealing from them for quite a while now. If he could keep this up, he could have a good sum before starting his journey. He just had to make sure no one saw his face, or his grandpa would give him a thorough beating. But he was fast enough that one saw his face other than maybe his straw hat. He would knock out their lights before they could fully see him. And in a way, he couldn't wait for the two years to be gone. By his estimation, he was a little bit behind when Luffy started his journey. So in the upcoming years, he will cross him. He learned all of the iconic moves of Gomu Gomu no Mi, or as many as he could remember. So he was mainly focusing on Jeppo, which he was having little success over. He could do it from time to time, but he needed to get better at it. I still have no way to do Teki, Kami, Tempest Kick. Well, maybe I could do the kick, 
if I grid myself to the bone, but techie was another deal. And not to mention life return will be very hard to learn alone, Luffy thought, inwardly sighing, Gramps will come soon. I will have to make him teach me something, but convincing him would be such a drag. Also, the fact that he couldn't just ask his Gramps, who was Vice Admiral, to teach him the rest of the Rokushiki. So, Luffy planned to learn another thing from his Gramps, one that would be equally helpful. Chapter 9 He was also going to ask Garp for a devil fruit encyclopedia. He didn't know if Garp would give him that, but he needed it if he wanted to make his future crew stronger. And he had searched the black market of Goa. The price for even the most basic version of the encyclopedia was insane. As Luffy walked he went past where the nameless Najinata was placed on the ground. It's been six months since he got it, and he couldn't even lift the damn thing. But he wasn't here from it. He looked up above and found another Najinata, which was a bit small in comparison, planted on top of a tree. He stretched out his arm and grabbed it, bringing it back. This was the weapon he was practicing for a few months. Horn's Edge he names it, after its carved blade that was supposed to be made out of an iron rhino's horn. A good one that he stole from the royal palace armory. With that he started walking towards the deep parts of the forest. He still couldn't lift the unnamed Najinata, but he was close he could feel it. It wasn't some Mjolnir, it was just heavy. And with enough strength, he was sure he will be able to use it. But more importantly, what should I hunt today, hum? I haven't had wild ox meat for quite a while. Luffy nodded to himself, then mumbled silently, Saru. It was quite fun. Speaking out named moves like an anime character, he grinned. And he was gone, leaving behind a trail of fluttering leaves. A few days later unexpected Garp came to Fusha village. And of course, he first went to Makino's bar to eat. Luffy was currently running there, his Najinata, Horn's Edge, already strapped to his back. He stayed with the mountain bandits last night. Tomorrow would be Makino's birthday, so he was going there for that. But he was surprised when he saw the marine ship from the mountains. The straw hat boy smashed through the bar doors. Good thing it was made of steel. Gramps, you are back. He was kinda excited. Garp might be tough, but every time he visited, Luffy would get strong. And of course the boy had a hunger for strength. Garp looked back at Luffy, with food in his mouth. Oh. Did my grandkid miss his dear grandpa? He asked with food in his mouth. Yeah, something like that. Luffy said, Okay, please teach me something cool. Okay. No, I am not going to take a no wait. Did you just agree? Luffy blinked in disbelief. Garp nodded, grabbing another piece of meat and eating it fully, even the bones that was in it. You seem to have gotten strong. So if you can impress me, I might teach you something. Luffy happily rubbed the back of his head, but inside, oh, the old man has observation hockey, I forgot, but it was a good thing. As he was thinking Garp had finished his meal and stood up, now, let's take you somewhere. As he exited the restaurant, Luffy followed behind, this will be quick, so brace yourself. Huh. That's all that Luffy could say before Garp grabbed his arm and jumped into the air with sound-breaking speed and started using Jeppo to sprint through air. Ahahahaheya. <laughs> Luffy didn't know how much time had gone by, but it was short, and he was barely able to do anything with the wind pressure making him dangle for his life. But the boy took the time to observe how Garp was moving his feet, to sprint through the air. Though he was having little success, as his mouth was open, and he was inflated like a balloon. Soon the old marine landed, bringing along with an inflated balloon human, which was none other than Luffy. Garp let him go, and the boy deflated, returning to normal size, coughing out rest of the air. Shitty old man, Luffy said, of course getting a fist in the head because of it. Can't even win against the wind, and wants be the king of pirates. The old man snorted. Back in my age, I was even winning against my own shadow. He said as if that was an accomplishment very people had. Luffy grumbly looked at his new surroundings. Not gonna lie, that was cool. So, when are you going to teach me that? Bahaha, Sengoku, would be on my ass if I teach you that, Garp said laughing. I will teach you that if you join the Marines. Actually, you will only be able to learn it if you join the Marines. No one can learn the Rokushiki techniques unless they are the Marines, Bahaha. He said the last words with pride. Luffy really wanted to roll his eyes, 
even though he didn't master all of them. He would find his way and learn all of them. I mean, even the original Straw Hats picked up on the techniques by themselves. But it also made him know that he would be in deep trouble if he showed his techniques in front of Garp, and here he was so used to using Saru, but he could try the new technique that he was trying to make. It was still rough around the edges, but he was getting there. Author's Appraisal Report Weapon Name Horn's Edge Weapon Type Najinata Description Created by a famed blacksmith, who later down the line created a named blade. The weapon itself is much more durable and sharp than regular blades, but it is prone to losing its sharpness, if not well maintained. As this was made from the horn of an iron rhino's horn, it has self-repairing properties that has yet to be seen. Chapter 10 Okay, now beat those crabs. I'm feeling like eating some seafood today, Garp said as he picked his nose. And before the boy could say anything he kicked Luffy off the high ground. They were actually on a breaking point of a cliff that was around five to six stories high. But for the old Navy hero, it was considered normal to throw their grandkids from that height. The boy was caught off guard but managed to land on his feet. Landing on his feet like jelly that is. What the? Only then did he notice the surrounding. It was filled with yellow stony rocks and what appeared to be a large sea area. And a destroyed forest as if someone was eating the trees or something. Wait. There aren't yellow rocks in Dawn Island? Luffy said. Looking up where Garp was, the old man was sitting at the top of the cliff, picking his nose. Luffy looked at him. We aren't on Dawn Island, are we? Bahaha, so you figured it out. Garp said, leaning down. This is another small island, which isn't that far from home. Beat those crabs, or I won't take you back with me. He grinned, and that made the boy shuddered. He wasn't lying on that part. Luffy gulped and wanted to ask what crabs, but stopped himself, as the yellow rocks started shacking and large tree-like arms sprouted from the ground. And now in front of him was a sea of large sea crabs. Each one of them was big enough to flip a truck with their claws, and were massive in size, almost one store in height. And there seemed to be, at least a hundred of them. Garp then had a twisted smile on his face. Try finishing it before dinner. I wouldn't want to leave my grandchild behind like that. He said as he yawned. At least try to sound genuine. The boy grumbled. Luffy knew he was facing danger. Even with the strength he gained in those short amounts of time, he couldn't beat all of them. And he had to do it even without using sorrow. And he was sure Finger Pistol won't do shit with how thick their shell was. Oh, he was so fucked up. Gramps, I don't think I'm not strong enough. Luffy said. Honestly, all of them looked quite dangerous. He did fight large animals in Don Island, but it was always one or two at the same time. Not like this massive group. Garp looked at him with a frown. You know you awfully complain a lot. If you aren't strong, then be strong. What kind of freaking logic was that? Oh yeah, the One Piece kind. Luffy gritted his teeth, taking deep breaths to calm himself down. He was going to make a name for himself in this world, and he wasn't going to back down now. He unstrapped his Najinata, horn's edge from his back looking at the crabs. Old man, Luffy said, not looking at his grandfather. I am going to beat all of them and get home. Then you are going to teach me what I want, he said. No, demanded. Garp grinned as he sat down, opening up a bag of chips from nowhere and started eating them. I will hold you to that. Bah. But I want you to teach me how to cut steel, Luffy said. Garp stopped his laughing and blinked at Luffy. He was about to refuse and say that it was some secret technique that Marines can do. It would kind of be a hassle to teach him that. Too much work. But Luffy was quick. Shanks had shown me that it was possible to cut steel. Luffy said, making the old man grumble. And he wasn't a Marine. That two-cent pirate and his toothpick. Like I would. Oh, so does that mean the Marines don't know how to do something that a two-cent pirate can do? Luffy mocked readying himself as the crabs started their march toward him. He was playing on unknown ground here, but who gives a shit? He needed to get stronger. And he was going to take a shortcut if they were there. And here I thought, my gramps wasn't some old fossil from Roger's time. Learning to cut steel would not only help him with his Najinata, it would also make things easier with Zoro, teaching him that before the Grand Line would be a boon for the future. And like the shameless bastard he was he was going to learn it before he set out from Dawn Island. What? 
He liked being overpowered and one-shotting opponents. That made a tick mark appeared on Garp's forehead. Why you? Don't make me come down there and hit you, brat. He huffed, almost destroying the bag of chips he was enjoying. But fine. You beat those yellow crabs, and I will teach you that. Heh. And I will show you what this old fossil can do. He grumbled. Luffy felt a bit worried about what method the old man would use to teach him. But he had more recent concerns. One of the yellow crabs came fast with its claws out and tried to grab onto Luffy. The boy jumped away from danger and midair he spun, Gomu Gomu no war axe. Stretching one of his leg and smashing it on top of the crab's face, and it made the giant creature scritch a little, before he tried to smash away Luffy. Luffy managed to land somehow, using his spear to block the smash that was coming from the giant crab. But it didn't make the boy fling away like expected. Rather, he stood his ground with his inhuman strength, even though the ground almost buried him. Luffy grinned, so all my training wasn't for nothing, he said as he rolled to the side. Time to get serious. Chapter 11 Now's my turn, Mr. Krabs, Luffy shouted, before vanishing from where he was, and appeared right before the crab's face, dynamic bull needle. He thrusted his naginata inside its head, breaking through the skull and hitting the brain. A fatal blow, but the crab tried hard to smash Luffy away, but the boy barely avoided getting cut by the cause, getting smashed away in the process. Still he was able to get his naginata out in time. At least one of them was down, and 19 more to go. One could see that Luffy's arms and legs were a bit bulkier in size. He even looked taller, while his body looked sharper. And when his shirt fell off, he looked like a men's physic bodybuilder a homage to his own passion for bodybuilding. It was a contrast to his slim build. The boy jumped back up before he started running as to not give the crabs any chance to gang up on him. The crabs were smart enough as they started throwing debris towards the boy. Luffy avoided the thrown rocks, but he was also winching in pain. The recoil from his technique and the muscles on his arms and legs, which were now bigger, shrank down to normal size again. This was a technique to increase his speed and strength by expanding his muscles. A technique which he was inspired by the Zoros and I Gorilla, but for him, it was his whole body. With it, Luffy could double his speed and strength for a short period of time. But it had one big disadvantage, and that was the recoil from using it. He was in a general sense, forcefully expanding or stretching his muscles to give maximum output of strength. And it was quite stressful. It's as if he would pop any time, but he could bear it. Also, he mostly used the technique to use it with his Saru, but he had to use this alone. It gave him speed akin to an unmastered version of Saru. But looking at the bright side, he could increase his Gomu Gomu Nomi proficiency with this. This was a technique that was based off his unique ability, a power that he could fully call his. Of course, this technique was using the basics of Luffy's Gear 2 and 3 in a much more compact level so the boost in physical strength wasn't as dramatic. But it would make his body suitable for other gear-based techniques later. And he officially dubbed it Gear 1. Heh, totally original. Luffy looked at the other crabs, and sighed it would take a long-ass time to finish this. He never had used his technique to the fullest. He wasn't a fan of pain, but sometimes you had to ruffle your own feathers. Well, it's now or never. He activated his technique again and jumped high again as he moved towards his enemy with breakneck speed. A slash in. For those of you who are wondering, he looks like Gear 4 Snake Man Luffy without the effects of hockey and steam. You can think of it like this Gear 1 gives Luffy more muscles so he can generate more power, similar to Zoro's and Igorilla. And Gear 2 makes his blood run wild, boosting his speed. In theory, both Gear 1 and 2 can be used at once. But that's for the future. On the other hand, Garp had almost lost his shit when he saw Luffy disappear. Was that Saru? But when he observed carefully, he was dumbstruck. His grandson looked like he had aged five years, and his body had taken on an amazing psychic. The boy's whole body looked as if they were made out of muscles. A bit of steam coming off them, his veins showing, and even his hair seemed to be standing up. His once slim body that showed a few signs of muscles was now totally different. Garp was impressed, he had to say, and it wasn't just because of the physic. His grandson knew how to think outside the box. He also sighed in relief, knowing that he was using his rubber body to enhance his whole body to basically buff up. 
Not using Soru. Sengoku would be mad if that was the case. But that was almost half of the speed of a Soru user. Even though it was impressive, but he had seen this type of usage of power before. But with Luffy's rubber body, the boy took it to another level. He had seen skilled pirates and marines in using this sort of muscle-based tactics. It was a simple form of Saimai Kikin, Kami Ibushin, but it seemed that Luffy figured it out himself. He almost wondered how much speed he would gain if he used his new transformation with Saru. Garp also observed that when Luffy used his technique for speed, just before sprinting towards the enemy, his leg muscles would bulk up just for a second, before the boy disappeared. Garp grinned. So he wasn't buffing up the whole thing. He knew where the pump was needed and used it. Good thing the boy knew to use his head at least in fighting. And not to mention that he was already using it in the combination with his Najinata as Luffy's arms muscles inflated a bit just before striking. This should really work well with Saru and Teki. Garp even wondered if Luffy could figure out Saru himself. Tempest Kick would be easy with how much speed he was generating. But he already was weapon a bladed weapon. So Luffy might not need that. Well, it wouldn't be impossible. The workout notes that he gave him was to build muscles for the Rokushiki techniques. The boy would be a great marine. Hmm. Maybe he should throw a bone or two at him. Maybe that might inspire the boy to become a marine. Luffy still seemed too sour that he can't wield his gifted Najinata. But with how Luffy was progressing, Garp was sure he could gain strength enough to do it. Chapter 12 The fight continued as the boy used his great speed to get the drop on the crabs and finish them off quickly. But after finishing Mr. Krabs number 15, Luffy's movement started getting slower, and he started to huff a bit, and he started to look a bit skinny. Luffy clicked his tongue, he hadn't used the technique so intensively, and it seemed like it was showing the drawback of the technique. The recoil was hitting hard for Luffy, he needed a break or two, before using it again. Rather than his muscles returning to normal size, they shrank making him look skinny, as if he didn't eat for a few days. But then he noticed something. He was surrounded. The last five of the crabs had surrounded him, but were hesitant on attacking him. Luffy clicked his tongue. How was he going to pull that off? The straw hat boy swept the sweat from his forehead. I need some time before I can use my gear one again. Those crabs are way tougher than they looked. My punches and kicks won't do shit against them. The only silver lining is I can kill them if I get the drop on them and pierce their heads with my blade. He panted while thinking. But man, it would be useful if I could practice my Jeppo here. I would be able to get out of the tough spot if I could, even if I don't have full control of it. But the old man would interrogate him later. He thought, as he took his stance and readied himself. You have about ten minutes left, brat. Biting his lips, Luffy tried to calm himself down, not using Saru, and now this. Fuck you, Gramps. He muttered to himself. He was sure the man was having a good time with his chips and tea. Huh. You said something, brat, he said with a yawn. Luffy kept shut, stupid old man, and his broken hockey. He sighed, come on Luffy, only five left, you can do it. But there was no time as both crabs hit him with their giant claws at the same time. Garp watched as he saw Luffy twist himself like a spring and jump of high in air, avoiding the two of the crabs' attack. But Garp wondered how the boy would avoid getting midair. The answer came as Luffy stretched his limbs and grabbed a dead body of a fallen crab to pull himself back, missing the attack of one of the crabs that wanted to cut him with his claws. Garp grinned. The boy was an exceptionally talented fighter. Monkey D.S. thrived in battle. Still, his estimation was right. The growth of his grandson was kinda unnatural. He was growing a bit too fast. But when he looked up how Luffy was training he felt that the unnatural growth made sense. Luffy wasn't playing anymore. He was serious, more determined. Even Garp at that age wasn't like him. He felt proud that this boy was more talented than both himself and Dragon. He could already see the boy making name for himself in the Marines. But if he wanted to use this talent, he would always need to push himself hard. Only after that, he could reach his true potential. Luffy smiled, getting some distance. He was about to charge at them when he saw one of the dead crabs that he killed a few minutes ago. Is it me? Or does the shell of crab look loose? Not waiting, Luffy ran forward and garbed the shell from one side and pulled. Surprisingly enough, it wasn't that hardly attached to the dead crab. And he grinned. 
AUI, crabs. Wanna play fetch? Holding it with both arms, he started spinning the large yellow shell around him with his stretched out arms, before throwing it towards them, Gomu Gomu no yellow shuriken. With their huge size, the crabs were a bit slow. And because of that both of the crabs lost a few of their legs due to the flying projectile. Luffy didn't miss the chance and attacked. Finishing the last one, Luffy panted heavily. Yash, I finally did it. My youth runs wild. But on a more serious note, his limbs felt like jelly. And to make matters worse, I need some meat. He groaned. His whole body hurt and the fact that he felt hungry. Hungry. For God's sake. His pain failed in comparison to the hunger he felt. How did that work? Anime logic, I guess. The ground shook as Garp came down laughing. Bahaha. You did a great job, brat. I trained you well. You will be a fine marine one day. He was too tired to refuse the old man's claims. So he just snorted. Come on, let's roast some crabs for lunch, Garp said, as if he didn't eat a full meal just an hour ago. Chapter 13 Uh, where am I? When Luffy woke up he found himself in a familiar bed, then blinked remembering what happened. After Garp's so-called training, he had eaten some crab meat and then fell to exhaustion. But at least Garp didn't leave him on that island, and judging by the room, his trusty Najinata horn's edge by his bedside. He was at Makino's house, one of the spare rooms that he would sometimes sleep in. Wait, speaking about Makino, isn't today her birthday? Shit, he missed it, didn't he? He quickly got out of bed. All the exhaustion and injuries from the previous day were gone. His recovery sure was fast. Looking at the wall clock, it was already noon. He was late, wasn't he? He quickly took the window to get out and run towards where he hid Makino's gifts. With the gifts in his hand, he knocked on the door. What? He wasn't going to enter through the window. Usually, Makino would be working hard and almost never closes her bar. But not today. The door opened and the older woman was surprised. Hey, when did you wake up? She asked, blinking. And what's that? Luffy grinned. This for you, madam. Is your birthday gift? He said, sorry I was late. Makino didn't say anything but hugged him. Oh, you are all grown up? Luffy didn't say anything and enjoyed the sisterly love. You know this world was better than his previous one. He had a brother that cared about him, a grumpy old man, and a big sister-like figure that also loved him. Sometimes he was just glad that he was here. Well, why don't you open it? He said, getting out of Makino's hug. Oh, why are you having this conversation at the door? She said, come in. Luffy followed her as both of them sat at the dining table. Makino opened her gift and was surprised to see the expensive jewelry. But then she frowned. Luffy, where exactly did you get that? Shit. Uh. But his response was cut off by a sound. Parapirapir. 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 Now Luffy was the one to narrow his eyes. Hey, isn't that a transponder snail? Um. Makino was about to say something. But Luffy was fast and followed the sound, uncovering a transponder snail. Hey, don't answer that. Moshi Moshi. Huh, who's this? The future pirate king of the pirates. Hey, give that back. Makino snatched that snail from Luffy's hand. Oh, it's Makino. Then that means the other one is Luffy. Yeah, but who are you? He was a bit confused. Transponder snail was a bit rare in the blues, and by the looks of it, this one was quite expensive. The one who gave his hat to you. Ha ha. Luffy's jaw hit the floor and his eyes almost popped out of his eye socket. You are Shanks? He would have dropped the snail if it was in his hand. The man chuckled from the other side. The one and only, he said, before the snail's eye looked at Makino. So it seems that Makino you couldn't keep your secret. I'm not gonna be the guy. But I told you so. Makino rolled her eyes. Well. At least he has grown up, and hopefully won't bug me to call you every day, Mr. Yonko. She snarked back. Nah, I'm too busy, so I won't be able to pick up the calls anyways, but it sucks to be you. Hey, Luffy said, I'm missing something here. Why are you calling Makino? Eh, why wouldn't I? She's my wife. What? This wasn't something Luffy was expecting. Makino chuckled nervously, a small blush on her face. I think we shouldn't. Wait, is that why you wear that ring all the time? 
Luffy said pointing at the ring Mikino was wearing. She blushed a bit, but nodded. Wow, I didn't expect that. From the other end, Shanks chuckled. Yes, well, don't go marketing around. Especially not to your grandfather. The last thing I want is to put Makino in danger. Garpsan wouldn't do that. Makino said waving him away. I mean marines aren't that bad. Both the snail and Luffy gave Makino a look. What? Huh. Innocence. The reason I fell for you? Wait, didn't you fall for my beauty? That too. Shanks said, but I don't want history to repeat itself. Yeah, Ace had it real rough, Luffy said. Almost casually. Wait, who's Ace? The transponder looked at Luffy with confusion. How is Ace connected? Makino tilted her head. Wait, you guys don't know? Luffy asked in his own confusion. Ace, as in Port Gas D Ace, or G-O-L-D Ace. Wait, Fire Fist Ace is Captain Sun? Shanks was now surprised. Wait, Roger was your captain. Luffy acted surprised. Dang, Gramps didn't say that. But wait, then why did Garp adopt him? Weren't the late Pirate King and Garp San? Like we're enemies? Makino asked. Yeah, but they both respected each other. And Gramps didn't actually catch him. He just surrendered himself to the Marines. But don't tell anyone that. So even Luffy knows. Shanks mumbled in a low voice. The red-haired pirate already knew about the situation. But it seemed that Luffy was in the secret as well. He was already at the last step in his illness. But how does that relate to the Marines being bad? Makino asked. I mean, Grapsan did a very noble thing. And he was a Marine. It's not about that. Luffy shook her head. You see the reason why Ace's mother is, well, dead. And it is because of the Marines. I don't know the full story, but his mother poor Gasty. Rouge was being hunted down in all blues because somehow it got leaked that Roger had a child. She kept hiding and held Ace for full 20 months before Gramps was able to find her. And she passed away leaving the baby Ace at Gramps' care. I, I, uh, I don't know what to say. Marins suck, Luffy concluded. Shanks sighed from the other side. This day is full of surprises. Some of them was old news, but Luffy did bring some issue to the light. Fire Fist Ace, huh? He does look a lot like the captain, now that you mention it. He said, even though Shanks knew about Ace. He hadn't ever met him before. And the name slipped mind. But it's also a surprise that you know I was from his crew. Not many people know that. Yeah, well, I'm going to surpass him one day, of course, I would know this sort of stuff. But then Luffy suddenly remembered something. Hey, uh, Shanks did you meet Ace? No. Why? Well, he might seek you out. Seek me out? He said, what did I do? Actually, he should seek the boy out himself. Roger did adopt him from a chest as a baby. So by relation Ace is kind of like a brother to him. You know how you saved me in the village from some stupid bandits. He wants to thank you, I guess. Luffy said, So can you do me a favor? Sure, if I'm able to. Beat him up, Luffy said. Am I missing something? Makino looked at Luffy weirdly. Why? Shanks asked in seriousness and a bit of confusion. Well, you know Logias and their intangibility getting them killed in the Grand Line. Relying too much on their fruits and not having skills enough to back it up. Luffy said, so I want you to humble him a beat. Insult him, get under his skin. You know be the pirate that you are. And I don't know, challenge him to learn hockey or something. He's going to get himself killed otherwise. Boy, Luffy, you are actually making sense. You have really grown up? The man chuckled. I will do it. But what's Ace's end goal anyway? Well, he wants to fight and beat Whitebeard. That's not his end goal but he always had deep regret on why he was born. And that's why he would do anything to prove himself. Prove that he's better than his father, and he's... There was a pause before a sigh came and Shanks spoke. That boy is going to get himself killed. And if he's anything like Captain Roger, he will go there head first, without learning hockey. However, the old man isn't the type to go on a random killing spree, but it's better to be on the safer side. Ace really seems to be hard-headed. Isn't he? Yup, that's him. So beat him up for me. Luffy said, grinning. Also, maybe send him to a teacher of hockey or something. He really hates his father. For stupid reasons, Gramps tried to stop the hate. But he couldn't. 
I don't like that. Maybe talking to his father's former crewmates might lessen the hate. Well, I don't know as Roger's former crew mate. I think it's also your responsibility to take care of him. Shanks smiled from the other side. Well, I know just the guy. And thanks, Luffy, he said. There was another pause. Anyway, Luffy, you really did do your research. I didn't know you could. I could what, be smart? Luffy said, well, I lost one of my brothers to a celestial pig, while the other one is a loose cannon. At least I have to have some brains in their stead. Shanks just laughed. I can't wait till you start your journey, he said, and don't go joining into those marines. They suck. That they do. Luffy laughed himself. Well, speaking about marines, there is another favor I want to ask you. A slash in. Okay for those of you don't know. You guys are asking the same questions so I added this to answer all. Makino had a kid after the time skip. And it doesn't seem right that it was Ace's kid. As Makino and Ace has a lot of age difference. And it was also true that Shanks visited the village not once, but many times. From the movie Red and Makino and Shanks seem to be similar of age. And it's also a popular theory. And so I adopted it in my story. As this world is kinda of you. Meaning some things will be different here. That's the fun of making a fanfic. It also makes sense. If Shanks does want to have a kid, what better way to then lay the egg where Hin, Garp, will be guarding it? No need to worry about the world government with Garp as the child support. Also about Roger. From Shanks's perspective, it looked like he got the info from Garp's mouth. Sure, Garp isn't the type of person to share it. But Shanks doesn't have that kind of relationship with Garp to know his personality. Also the same for other infos. If Luffy is smart, Shanks could imagine Luffy snooping around Garp for information. Of course, Luffy knows that because of the canon knowledge, but it's not that hard to mislead people. Chapter 14 Uh, why do you wake me up so early, Gramps? Luffy yawned. The sun didn't even rise yet, and after last night's party, he was kind of exhausted. He was an early riser, but even for him, it was a bit too early. Bah, I'm just keeping my promise, brat. Garp said walking as he held Luffy by the back of his collar. Now, he's all yours. With that, he threw Luffy forward. Already used to his antics, Luffy didn't fall and managed to land on his feet, even if he was half asleep. Now, give me 500 push-ups, someone said, before grabbing him by the wrist and slapping something on it. And Luffy felt extremely weak from that. What was that? When he looked down at his wrist, he saw a metal-like wristband attached to his arm. It was no wristband, it was a handcuff, and Luffy knew this was made out of sea prism stone, by how weak he was feeling. Luffy was a bit surprised, but even more so when saw someone else with them. I saw your training the other day, when you were in the waterfall, using the devil fruit's weakness to your advantage to gain some muscles. Huh, why didn't we think of that, Bogard? Well, most recruits and soldiers and marines gain their devil fruits a lot late, and that's if they are lucky. By then they have the built-in muscles. So they only work on their fruits power. Bogard spoke, and Luffy recognized him from the show. He was Garp's assistant, or was it his right-hand man? The man was tall, yet half a head taller than Garp. He was wearing a matching silver beige suit and hat, a katana strapped to his belt, wearing a coat of white marine with justice written on its back. The man looked at Luffy, his eyes, hiding behind his hat, with a feeling of seriousness surrounding him. Hello, Luffy. The man said, your grandfather has brought me here to train you. I hope we can get along this week, he said, his voice serious and stoic. Now give me 500 push-ups, soldier. Luffy wanted to point out, he wasn't a soldier, but that man had a scowl on his face that could match Garp's grin. So he didn't protest and dropped down started his push-ups. Huh, the things I do for strength. Mask Deuce knew that something bad was going to happen, even before arriving on the last island on the first part of Grand Line. He knew something was bound to go wrong. He had this gut feeling of sorts, or it might be the expired milk that he drank this morning. Ace and his stupid pranks. Wow, those are some huge trees. His captain said looking in awe at the giant trees. And are those bubbles? Those are coming out of the ground? The Grand Line sure is a bizarre place. It never gets boring. As a bit of a researcher himself, Mask Deuce looked at the one he was calling his captain. Port Gas D.A. Ace, 
or better known by his alias Fire Fist Ace. This will be the last island that we have to cross before going to the New World. But Captain, are you sure we are ready? He looked to his side, but the man was gone. Good job with the navigation. Showing appreciation for my crew is part of my duties. Ace said, already off the ship. I will get some food supplies. Captain. The other crewmate said, some joining him, while others stayed. That ace. Masked Deuce already had a tick mark on his face, before he sighed. Why did he even bother? Skull who was the man you said, that does the best coding around here. A man that wore a white skull-like mask looked at him. Master Dew? He's a bit old, but he's the best out there, though I don't know why people are scared of him. The second in command of the Spade Pirate side. Well, we have to meet him first before judging his character. I mean he couldn't be much of a dangerous guy, if he's coding ships. Oh, how wrong he was. Masked Deuce really wanted to slap himself for some reason. Why didn't the name click before? Sitting in front of him was Silver's Rayleigh, the right hand of the Pirate King. Are you the captain? And no. I apologize. I have come as his representative, he said, almost quaking in his boots. The captain was lured away by some delicious smell of food the moment he arrived. Ha ha ha. No matter what era, a captain is always free-spirited, isn't he? He said, almost smiling, fondly remembering something. I also unexpectedly took on a journey. Fate is like that sometimes. You don't know where you will end up. He laughed again. But that's the charm of being a pirate. Uh, thanks. He said, anyway, sorry for disturbing you. We will find someone else to do our coding. No, it's no problem. The old man said, finishing his cup of sake. Ha, that hit the spot. What was your pirate crew's name again? Oh, it's the Spade Pirates. Masked Deuce said, rubbing the back of his neck not seeing the serious expression that dawned on the former pirate's face. Hmm. Then young man you can help me with something. Huh. Mask Deuce looked up, seeing the grinning old man. Why don't you call your captain over? I would like to have a word with him. And by the looks of it, it wasn't a request. It was an order. Mask Deuce gulped. Ace, what did you do this time? Chapter 15 Luffy jumped back avoiding the sword strike that almost hit him in the chest. For a man, Bogard was quite tall, tall as Garp, and that meant he was basically a giant of nine feet. And Luffy found it really hard to avoid his sword with such a height difference. More so when he was in sea prism cuffs. He was hardly keeping up, his clothes being drenched with sweat, and the injuries were adding up with his exhaustion. Start paying attention and fight with your weapon. The Marine said as he slashed horizontally. Luffy rolled to his side with his Najinata in his hand. He came to Bogard's side and saw an opening. And he didn't waste the opportunity, gave a stab with his weapon only for the Marine to avoid it with ease. Too slow. And that was the last thing the straw hat boy heard as he was striked by the flat side of the Marine's blade knocking him off. You would have lost your head if I was the enemy, Bord barked, only to stop when he saw Luffy not standing up. He flipped his body to the side and saw that the boy was out. The strike shouldn't be able to knock him out, but exhaustion did the job for him. His endurance is quite amazing. The marine mumbled, sheathing his sword. Baha, it seems that you won again. Ain't that right, Luffy? Garp laughed, before looking at his grandson, who was out for the count. Huck couldn't keep up. Well, it's to be expected with you around. The marine hero smiled at the bogard who gave him a flat look. He's really energetic, two days of non-stop training, and only now he's out. Quite impressive, Bogard said, while the white marine coat with the kaji of justice fluttered on his back. You know other marines would have been able to survive for that long. But then again, he has quite the fast recovery like a certain someone. So that might be the reason. Some would call it overtraining. Training for two days non-stop without eating or sleeping. Well, Bogard did sleep or eat but Luffy didn't. When he wasn't sparing with Luffy, he would make sure to give the hand over the boys training to his grandfather, or the local monkeys. Meaning Luffy was pushed to brink in the past two days. Well, he wouldn't be pushing the boy so far, if it wasn't his last day of training. Unlike the marine hero, Bogard had some duties, so he could only train Luffy for a month. And it was barely any time to drill the basics of weapon use into the boy. So he had to push the boy beyond his limits, 
he could only keep up because of his insane recovery. But then again, he was the grandson of the marine hero and the son of the most wanted man alive. Of course, he would have some ridicules genetics. Sheesh, he's out cold, Garp said, kneeling down towards Luffy and slapping the boy to wake him up. But Luffy didn't respond at all. Bogard also kneeled down at the sleeping boy and took off the sea prism cuffs. The cuffs were only for trining. Also sea prism cuffs were quite rare, and he didn't want to leave it here on the island. That was marine properties. Sengoku-san is really angry at me for not keeping you at your post, Bogard said as he stood up. He called yesterday. He wasn't pleased at all. He even threatened me with bubble man duty. Garp just laughed, munching on his rice crackers. Just tell him that I am spending some quality time with my grandson. He's going to be a marine one day. He laughed. And he's a very skilled fighter also. The man gave him another flat look. Why don't you tell him yourself? Come on, Bogard. I can't do that. Or he'll scold me for, well, being me. With that, he laughed again. Anyway, how was Luffy's training? He wanted me to help him learn to cut steel. So can he now? Bogard gave the marine hero a deadpan look. Swordsmanship doesn't work like that. Luffy is a skilled fighter, no question about that. But I don't think one month is enough to make someone learn how to cut steel. I tell him about the basic concept, but it will be up to him if he manages to unlock the technique and strength needed for it. The man sighed at the last part, while the marine hero laughed. So, it's his fault that he couldn't learn it, Garp said, grinning. And here I thought he was some prodigy, but it seems that he's just stubborn and hard-headed. At least after that he couldn't say that I didn't keep my part of the bet. He obviously gets that from you and his father. A small smile came on Bogard's face before it turned into a frown, but I don't think you should pull me in next time you make a bet. Garp's laughing stopped as he started coughing. Well, you know me. I don't like fighting with weapons, and you are the only swordsman I know that I can trust. Also, he's going to be a great marine soon. The other man nodded. You said the same thing about your other grandkid, who is you know whose son, and he's making quite the name for himself in the Grand Line. Chapter 16 Bogard raised an eyebrow. You said the same thing about your other grandkid, who is you know whose son, and he's making quite the name for himself in the Grand Line. Garp coughed again. He opened his mouth to respond, but he had nothing to say. So the old man sighed. Wait, he said, but Kazan turned out great. He was already a marine, so I don't think it counts. Garp slouched again. Come on, I don't want him to be a pirate. Bogard tilted his hat forward. It's not something I consider bad, I suppose. When I was their age, I was so passionate about justice. But one thing that I have learned after working in the marines for so long is that we are just dogs with painted justice on our back. He said his tone flat, but there was frustration in it. Garp didn't seem too offended by it. He just grinned. Why do you think I wear a dog mask when visiting the blues? He said, Bahaha. The man just rolled his eyes, honestly. After working under the marine hero for almost two decades, he should be accustomed to it. But then again, the marine hero always had something to throw someone off. So he just nodded. Well, I will have to go back now. The new marines are in need of some training. He said, or Zyphersan will chew me up. He said as he started walking away. Oh, say hello to him for me, Garp said, following his old friend as he munched on his chips, leaving Luffy in the training field. Anyway, I still think Luffy would be a great Marine. If he is at least as stubborn as you, it will be very difficult. He was about to leave but stopped. Also, I don't know about him being a Marine or not, based on his lineage. He will be someone noticeable one day, no doubt there. He might not have the techniques or the skills to back it up, now. But in the future with how things are going, he is going to be strong. He would been a great Marine. As if saying he won't. You know why I want him to join the Marines. He said, I'm getting old, and I wanted him in the sword when I'm not around. But it seems that won't be the case. Bogard glanced at Garp. I think it's for the best. He said, also tiredness in his voice. The world government has been getting more radical these days. You know what happened to O'Hara. And that's the reason why one of my previous students is the most wanted man in the world. I don't think even with your backing would the Marines ever trust another monkey, let alone another D. He was thinking of another D, 
that he once called his friend. Saul was his name. It was sad, really. His burn marks were quite horrifying. It was a good thing he and Garp was there at the time. Kazan was really sloppy at doing his job. I know. But you know an old man can dream? With that Bogard left. He was usually always around with Garp. But he also had some duties as an experienced vice admiral. And that was training new recruits. And it just so happened that it was that time of the year. The rest of the year he was free. But the timing was bad. So he couldn't train Luffy for a bit longer. But then again, he taught the basics to the boy and even cleared out the concept of cutting steel to him. He would need to sharpen his own skills if he wants to learn them. Also, it seems that Garp didn't want him to be trained professionally for that long. If he did, he would have brought him to train him much sooner. Bogard still didn't know what the bet was about, but he was more than happy to train the Marine Hero's grandkid. The last time he trained someone so talented was Kazan, and he turned out quite the amazing figure in the Marine. He wouldn't say Luffy was talented with a weapon, but he was a skilled fighter. His use of Naginata was as unusual as his use of his rubber body. But he had some crappy foundation for his weapon use. That's why he had to cancel out his devil fruit of the occasion to teach him the basics. The boy had a talent for doing the unexpected. But learning to cut steel isn't something one can do in a month. Or so he thought. Weapon. Horn's edge type. Naginata grade. Unknown rumored to be made out of the bones of a iron rhino. Weapon. The Nameless Blade. Type. Naginata Grade. Great Grade Sword being one of the 21 Great Grade Swords, its durability is unparalleled. The weapon was crafted in the Lost Lands of Samurai and was used by a pirate before the Golden Age of Piracy. Abilities. Its chain can only be used once it is wielded by someone that the blade trusts. Chapter 17. Ace yelled as he sprinted forward, fire burning in his fist as he got near his target. You are dead, old man. The old man had a carefree smile on his face as he had his sword out. He didn't even move when Ace landed a punch on him, but it was blocked by with only one of his fingers, which was of course coated in hockey. Though his figure didn't touch the flames at all. I don't even need to use my sword for this, Rayleigh said, stabbing his sword into the ground as he moved his palm near Ace's direction. Ace wanted to blast him away with fire, but he was late as he got blasted away with just the old man's hockey. Still so weak? And you were trying to face Whitebeard with that strength. You can't even use hockey, the old man said, before disappearing from his spot. It's actually a wonder how you have Conker's hockey, when you don't even have the basics, genetics doing half of the job I guess. Your father was a carefree man, but he wasn't weak, and that seemed to tick Ace off. Why you? He wasn't able to finish as he had to roll to the side to avoid the sudden attack. Oh, so you seem to be picking up on observation. At least you are not all waste, Rayleigh said as he attacked again, his sword coated with hockey. You are not getting off this island unless you can land a hit on me. Ace didn't have the luxury to speak as he had to use his instincts and everything he had to avoid getting hit. Of course, Rayleigh was using a rusted out sword, but with hockey, it gave just as much as a regular sword. This happened for a while, several hours in fact before Ace couldn't keep up anymore and he collapsed in exhaustion. Foo, you actually made me sweat a bit, Rayleigh said, grinning, as he had his sword rested on his shoulder. That was a nice workout for HD old bones of mine, but you have a long way to go, kid. For now, have some rest, we will continue this tomorrow. With that the man left Ace behind, bloodied and bruised. The boy was annoyed, being stopped in his journey. Rayleigh had only interest in him, and his crew mates were alone without the captain. Now Ace wasn't worried about his crewmates surviving without him, but he was at the same time, a bit anxious that all of them knew that he was the son of that man. A part of him was afraid that his crewmates would leave him for that, and as a captain, he was doing a poor job. Getting kidnapped by an old-timer that took him to an unknown island in Combelt might be the most stupidest way a pirate crew lost their captain. Sure the said old times was the vice-captain of his so-called father's pirate crew, the Dark King Silver's Rayleigh himself, and he seemed to be very eager to train him and make him learn about hockey, deeming him unworthy of crossing to the new world unless he was able to use hockey to a good level. His crewmates of course tried to stop him and failed miserably. Even after that his crewmates tried to come to the island, with flame dials bosting the ships. Thank God they had those. 
because the clam belt would have been a nightmare for normal ships, but Rayleigh didn't let any one of them come near the island. He also gave them an ultimatum, that unless he deemed Ace worthy, he wouldn't let go of their captain. So for now the spade pirates were captainless, he was sure that Deuce could keep them in check, but Ace didn't like it one bit. Though, if he were to be honest, he wasn't completely against it. Ace had mixed feeling about this. On one hand, he was annoyed and wanted nothing to do with Rayleigh, but on the other hand, he was kind of glad that someone out there was worrying about him. Sure, Rayleigh liked to taunt him, but he could see through it. Maybe being born as the son of the Pirate King was a curse. All his life he watched other people cursing down on his dead father, but now seeing that people actually cared about him, it made him glad in a way. Even though Rayleigh didn't show it, he did care about Ace. It was kind of similar to Garp in a way. His adoptive grandfather was just as pushy with his tough love. But what Ace didn't like was losing. After a year into the Grand Line, his strength had increased greatly. He was sure that he could give some challenge to his grandfather, but if Rayleigh was to go by, then he was off a huge margin. It's already been one month, and the things he saw Rayleigh do with hockey made him quite jealous. Who needed supernatural fruit power when you had hockey? And if he didn't point out the obvious faults in his Logia usage of powers, he would have been in power. Hockey was kind of amazing. Even more so when he was told that his supposed father became the pirate king without the use of any devil fruit. And he was a man that would often clash with the wielder of the strongest known devil fruit user. He was kind of glad that he didn't encounter Garp in the seas. Well, he did a few times, but he wasn't stupid enough to challenge him. It was a good thing he didn't, because then he might have been forced to an early retirement. It almost scared him how strong those old timers were. And Whitebeard still held the title of the world's strongest man. One might think that Ace would get discouraged by it. But no. He was excited. He was going to surpass everyone. And he was going to be better than his father. And if that meant learning the stupid thing called hockey, he will do so. No. He won't just learn it. He will master it. For now, he had to find some dinner. And that was without use of his devil fruit powers. Usually, it wouldn't be a problem, but the creatures in this island were tough opponents even for him. Ace winched as he got up. Almost all of his wounds were non-lethal, but it hurt like a bitch. And he had to find his food this way. After one month, one would think he was used to it. The fire user just sighed. This was going to be a long day. Chapter 18 After a full day of rest, Luffy was back on the grind and that included eating a whole feast that Makino had cooked up for him. He didn't know what to think of his training with Bogart. The man was a slave worker, but it did bring gains, and that's all it mattered. After the Battle of the Yellow Crabs, Luffy didn't expect much from Garp. But to his surprise, he actually kept his promise. Well, he didn't teach him personally, but he brought the next best man there was, Bogart, to train him for one month. And that was the toughest one-month period in this new world. The Marine Hero's right-hand man, one of the best swordsmen in the Marines, came to train me on how to cut steel. Well, wasn't that just awesome? But things weren't that easy. It never was. And even though it was only a month's worth of training, it almost felt like he was given very little time. You might ask how. Well, for first, Bogart, he didn't want to teach Luffy on how to cut steel. Even more so, when he saw Luffy's spear play. As a swordsman and a skill fighter Bogard couldn't let those mistakes slip. There were a few to begin with, because of Luffy's previous training with using a pipe that converted to his spear play. But the training was needed. And there came the brutal beatings that forcefully fixed most of Luffy's mistakes. And that took all the time there was. And just a day before leaving Bogard taught. No more like demonstrated how to cut steel. It was short and straightforward. It was a hectic ride, but Luffy gained some professional training for his Naginata. Also, by seeing Bogard's sword play, he was starting to understand the way of the blades. Honestly, when he picked up the Naginata, it was because it felt cool, and logic dictated that pointy and sharp things were better than a naked fist. But this world's logic is almost non-existent sometimes. You know I am still not sure why I, or any other people call out attack names, when attacking. Luffy thought. I mean saying Gomu Gomi no before every attack didn't increase the attack power or anything. But then again this is an anime world. So, it's to be expected. Luffy stood up, looking at his Naginata, Horn's Edge, 
Let's try making up some cool named moves, shall we, partner? He snorted, chuckling to himself. In just one month, he gained a lot of strength and experience. Bogard had already left as the old man said, and Luffy wouldn't admit it, but the man was quite a good trainer. But he wouldn't miss him though. That man worked him through the dirt, though it did give him results. From his progression, he could estimate that he gained around three times gains if he trained alone. And that's quite a lot. And with improved techniques, he knew he would benefit from it in the future as well. Even though I did improve, but I am nowhere near doing flying slashes. I have to learn to cut steel first. Along with my spear play, I need to increase my overall strength. And with how Bogard said being in tune with the blade, I might need to start on observation hockey. Luffy knew that it wasn't needed to learn to cut steel, but with what he understood observation hockey would work miracles for him, learning to better understand his sword. What Bogard said was vague, but what he got out of it was, that it wasn't something of belief, but was something to do with technique. Like Saru, or Jeppo it could be learned. Every blade worked in a certain frequency, and learning to harness and change the frequency was how you cut steel, which often swordsmen referred to as the breath of steel. But for now, he was still lacking in the strength department. He was sure he could have enough strength in his gear one state, but he needed work on his base form as well. Maybe I should look into getting my hands on some sea stones. That stingy man didn't leave the cuffs behind. But then again, I shouldn't rely on it too much. I also need to get accustomed to using spears with my rubber body. Also, I need to get back to learning Jeppo. With the added strength, I should be near it. But I have to be sure. Man, so many things and so little time. He said to himself, gulping down the meat with a jug of water. Makino, your food is the best. Thank you. The girl just shook his head. Welcome. But I don't speak while food is in your mouth. Luffy didn't bother answering, just nodded as he focused on his food. While this was happening, no one noticed that a certain creature was observing Luffy very keenly through the windows. Only its eyes were seen from the darkness as it looked at Luffy with interest. Chapter 19 A week later, in a forest clearing, one could see a straw hat-wearing young man training under the hot sun. Luffy's body was drenched with sweat as he disappeared from his spot, appearing a bit far from his initial position before again disappearing from his spot and appearing elsewhere. It looked as if he was blitzing from one place to another in quick succession. From his bulky muscles, it was obvious he was in his in-gear one state. 500. With that Luffy almost collapsed to the floor. He panted looking down as he pulled out the small stopwatch, which he paused. Almost one minute improvement for last time. That's quite a lot. And to top it all off, I only failed seven times, Okay, maybe eight, he said while he panting, a grin plastered on his face. If I keep this up, my sorrow will get even faster. Luffy sat down on the ground, as he took the water bottle from the bag with his stretched arm. His legs burned with lactic acid because of the insane workout. He wiped his sweat as he gulped down the water bottle. It was also a good thing that he could keep up in his gear one state longer. The thing about his devil fruit was that he could even now go gear second and third if he wanted to. His body was that of rubber, the original Luffy didn't have those concepts in him till much later. But he did from the very beginning. But that didn't mean he could use them in combat. He was willing to try Gear 3rd if he felt like it. But Gear 2nd needed him to be much better. If his Gear 1 was anything to go by, the rapid increase of blood flow would might knock him out instantly. Too much blood flow for a brain was bad, even if he had a rubber brain. There was something telling him that he needed to be a bit more strong before he could use gear second. But mastering would take time. But that didn't mean he hadn't improved. No, he definitely did. It's been what, over a year since he came to this world, and by his estimation, he was over Luffy's level when he started his journey. And that was a milestone for him. Bogard's training really pushed him a lot. He was actually glad that he was getting such results. But it also made sense. The cannon Luffy only trained with forest animals and basic training while he had been pushing his body to the brink of exhaustion from day one. Using the sea weakness method, he gained a tremendous amount of strength, and the training with Bogard covered the experience part. Training smart is really is the key, even in the One Piece world. The boy mused. Well, it's good to be smart then. He got up from the ground and he stretched his hands to his bag, 
bringing a used-looking book with a marine symbol on it. This book was the Rokushiki book, and no, it wasn't a gift from Bogard or Garp. It was actually from Shanks. When he spoke to Shanks over the transponder snail, Luffy boldly asked the Yonko to send him to marine techniques or any other techniques if was willing to share. What? He was going to take shortcuts to strength if the opportunity arose. He had a bigger dream than the canon Luffy. He just didn't want to be the Pirate King. No, he wanted to be the strongest man or creature alive. He wanted to have the strongest possible crew that would shake the seas. He wanted much more. And so he was going to take every opportunity he gets. Shanks was a bit surprised by the request, but agreed. In the new world, that type of technique wasn't cheap, but the man would pull some strings for him. Actually, he wasn't going to lie. He actually asked for a training manual for hockey at first, which made the Yonko laugh his ass of. It seemed there was no such thing there. It seems that all the fanfics he read in the real world was wrong. Hockey needed to be learned. As most hockey users learned it themselves or were taught by someone. That's why Luffy asked Shanks for the Rokushiki manual. And thank God Shanks knew a person in his crew who could help with that. And so Luffy would need to wait a month for the delivery to arrive in secure lines. He actually got the book a few days later after Bogard and Garp left. And this book was a lifesaver. He was sure he could have figured out all of the Rokushiki techniques over the years, but this book skipped the trial and error process. When all things are considered, in the future this thing was more valuable than gold. His crewmates would need this if they wanted to survive in the Grand Line. Chapter 20 That's why he was training to master Jeppo. One might ask how training in Sara would let him learn Jeppo. Well, it's easy, according to the book. Sara was kicking the ground ten times in less than a second, and when you compress that strength in one kick you get Jeppo. It was a speed-based technique, and that's why he was trying to make his Sara faster. As he still was a bit away from mastering Jeppo, seven out of ten times he would fail. So that's why he was trying to improve that. But there was also a problem. He could only use Saru in the mastered state in Gear 1. And he needed to master it in his base form. His Gear 1 wasn't just gimmicks. It multiplied his overall strength and speed. So he still needed to increase his base strength. He was also working on his own version of the finger pistol. But where the book really helped was the life return kami -E and Teki. Mainly life return. kami -E, that's why Luffy wanted to master rubber kami -E. It might seem odd that a rubber man was trying to learn a lower mimicked version of his own technique. But he had a reason. Life return was fully being able to control one's body. You can take it as an advanced version of Tekai. And kami -E was turning your body like paper using life return to avoid strikes. But he remembered one of the unimportant CP. Nine agents use kami -E sludge version. So why couldn't he make a rubber version for it? What if something like Ace happened to him? He was captured by marines and put in sea prism cuffs. His fruit would be nullified, but what if he could use kami -E rubber, which was non-devil fruit-based, to slip out of them? That's the reason why he was trying to get so familiar with his rubber body and gear one. Call him paranoid. But he might need to fight under the sea, or in cuffs and then having something similar to his devil fruit would help him a lot. For now he was mainly focusing on, techie, he would learn to do it with his devil fruit before doing it without it. The book didn't have any specific info on it, except contracting one's muscles till it matches the durability of steel. So he planned to use his devil fruit to learn it first, before learning it with his fruit powers. But that would take time. After that he would move on the life return and go from there. The Tempest Kick was also something that he couldn't do right now. As with what Bogard hinted at, learning to cut steel was essential for wind slashes. And Tempest Kick was a swordless air slash. So he would need to learn that first. Okay, let's get back to training. Learning Jeppo fully by the end of this week would be awesome. So I don't have any time to waste. With that Luffy stood up, but then he noticed something odd. His hat was missing. What the? He looked around and found his hat in the top of a tree. How did it get there? He shrugged. The wind maybe. He stretched out his rubber hand and tried to grab it. Only for the hat to disappear. Luffy blinked. He saw something at the last moment before the hat moved. And sure enough, looking to his side he saw a small monkey wearing his hat. But this monkey looked a bit different from the monkey that he usually fought on the island. It was also smaller, two feet in height maybe. The most distinct feature of it was that it had six arms. This species of monkey was definitely not from this island. Hey, 
Give that back, Luffy said, not moving from his spot. I don't like playing games with my hat. The six-armed monkey grinned before he pulled down his eyelid and stuck out his tongue. Yes, very mature of you, Luffy said disappearing from his spot and appearing right in front of the monkey. But I will have to take that back. But the moment he tried to grab the hat, the monkey disappeared, and Luffy was wide-eyed. Am I seeing things? He looked a bit foured, where the monkey was dangling from a tree. Luffy was sure that monkey just used Sara now. Was that even possible? But Luffy couldn't ponder on it, much as the monkey gave a mocking scream before it started to dangle of into the jungle. Why you hey wait? Luffy followed the six-armed monkey this time using Saru again, but to his surprise, he missed the little imp. It went on for a while, before Luffy had it enough. Okay, this is dragging on for too long, Luffy said, half annoyed. The monkey was having fun of course. Saru. Chapter 21 I call bullshit. Luffy cussed. First Soro, now Jeppo. What are you the next Marine Fleet Admiral? The six-armed monkey did some weird dance in the sky mocking the human. Why you? Luffy couldn't believe it. The monkey was actually twerking at Luffy. The boy cocked his fist. Oh, I'm going to enjoy this more than I should. With that Luffy jumped off, bouncing from a high platform with his Naginata out. He wasn't going to cut the creature but smacking him down would do some good humbling the animal. Seeing him come near, the monkey quickly used Jeppo to bounce in the air like a bouncing ball and stay out of Luffy's range. Luffy didn't give up and stretched his arms now that he was high in air, trying to land a hit, but of course, the boy missed, and the monkey still had his hat. Luffy didn't feel amused like the monkey was by his silly dance in the air. Show off. Luffy grumbled. The monkey was quite the acrobat, and he had Jeppo mastered unlike him. He quickly chased after the monkey as it went deeper into the jungle. Luffy used his stretched limbs and almost everything in his arsenal, but even after ten whole minutes, he couldn't catch the dang monkey. Kikichi, the monkey laughed as it mocked him, playing around with his straw hat, and still bouncing in the air without his reach. Luffy wasn't fully serious, if he was, he could gotten the hat. But using gear one would an overkill on the poor creature. And not to mention, that might injure the monkey. And after ten minutes he wouldn't change his decision. No, it made him more firm on it. He was curious, about how was a monkey able to learn Jeppo. And not just that the weird bouncing in the air, that was a copy of his own move. Where he would bounce from one object to another to increase his speed. So the monkey learned obviously from observation. And he might be observing him for quite some time by the looks of it. It might be also why the creature didn't rip his straw hat. The monkey knew his boundaries. And also it didn't hold any type of malice. And that made Luffy want to befriend the creature. And he was done with today's anyways. He could spend time chasing the animal. But chasing after it wouldn't be easy without Jeppo. And the monkey seemed to have a lot of stamina, as it could easily stay up in air full ten minutes. So he wasn't going to come down soon. The trees in the jungle weren't even that tall that Luffy could use to catch the creature by surprise. Luffy couched down and jumped up high, the monkey getting far from him already. But this time Luffy used his own Jeppo. He succeeded the first time and almost caught his hat with his outstretched hand. He. <laughs> the key word being almost as, unlike the six-armed monkey Luffy, missed his second Jeppo and gravity pulled him in. Luffy didn't give up and chased after it with vigor. Luffy stopped counting after his twelfth fail, but he didn't give up. I'm ain't giving up, Luffy said. He pushed himself up and used Jeppo and used another one, getting a lot close to the monkey before missing his third step. But as he fell he tried and pushed all strength to his legs, and suddenly he wasn't falling anymore. He was using Jeppo again. But the six-armed creature was quite tricky. It moved away before Luffy could catch it, and went upwards. Luffy didn't stop following it. He just prayed that his Jeppo would work. And before he knew it he caught the monkey. Huh, finally got you. Luffy said, grabbing it with both arms. The monkey giggled. Now that he got a good look at it, it had white fur with some blue highlights. And the monkey didn't seem hostile as he put the hat back on Luffy's head. The boy raised an eyebrow, but the monkey pointed down. Luffy looked down, and he was still in the air. And not falling as by instinct he was using Jeppo to keep himself floating. 
That's the reason for not falling. And he was at his base form, not gear one. That meant he got the technique right. A wide grin appeared on Luffy's face. You wanted me to learn Jeppo? The monkey nodded with a cheeky smile of its own. Luffy had his own odd laugh. Shishishi, then let's become friends. Luffy didn't need any answers as he put the monkey on his shoulder as he started using Jeppo with to move in the air. The monkey was a bit too big to stay on Luffy's shoulder, but it supported itself just fine with its extra arms. Kikichi, Shishishi, it was his first time ever flying, and it was epic, getting hit by the wind and all. And his new friend seemed to even considered enough to press down on Luffy's hat so that it wouldn't fall off due to the wind. As Luffy skipped in the air, he finally looked to the horizon. The sun was setting, and it looked beautiful from up here. And then Luffy's stomach protested in hunger. Okay then, little guy, let's get something to eat. The monkey agreed, and pointed at a giant bird, not from them. That's an island bird. A ten-feet bird that mainly came to eat some large fishes or animals from the island. Luffy was already drooling. He gulped. Those things taste delicious. Luffy had eaten it once from Garp. The man had caught it. And it was something. At that time, he didn't even season the oversized chicken. Only some salt, and it was quite amazing. So he could already imagine how good it would taste if he could get it to Makino. And Luffy tried to catch those suckers multiple times. But most of the time they would be too far. Or would fly away after not being able to harm Luffy. But not this time. It's time for a hunt, Luffy said, with a savage grin. His expression matched the monkey that was on his shoulder. Chapter 22 On a big table, one could see filled with food, mainly all meat dishes, and Luffy and a certain six-armed monkey diving into the feast. They ate as if their lives depended on it, having no manners at all. But from time to time they would moan from the foodgasm, while Luffy stuffed his face with food. The monkey was doing the same with six of his arms. There was a bit of tension between them as they would try to steal each other's food, getting them into silly fights that lasted for a few seconds before they moved their focus back to stuffing food. And before long the whole plates filled with meat were over. God, that was good. Luffy said as his stomach was inflated with food, island bird meat sure is one of a kind. I wonder how Sea King tastes. The six-armed monkey on his side was also in the same state as him slouched back on his chair with an inflated stomach, and hearing about eating sea kings it quickly perked up. Oh, so you want to eat a sea king? Luffy mused, and I thought you were mad at me. The monkey huffed away. The plates that were filled with meat were, now only had huge bones on them. Makino came to the room with some lemonade in hand. Who wants some juice? Me. He. After the round of juice was over Makino giggled seeing both Luffy and the odd monkey. You know, you are the most awesome cook in the world. Luffy praised now that the food was over. Man, we have to hunt some more of those birds. They taste delicious. The monkey didn't comment, but he was just as happy with the food. But he was still a bit mad at Luffy and the other human. His mood had something to do with what Luffy did. After coming back from the hunt and taking the oversized chicken to Makino, she had suggested giving his new friend a bath. The monkey did accidentally get sprayed with blood when Luffy chopped the oversized chicken, so he took his new friend for a wash, which he didn't like, and even with all the protests, Luffy dragged him and cleaned him up. The monkey hated every moment of it. Of course, Luffy did it for his own good. It wasn't like the rubber boy enjoyed seeing his friend's misery. Sure, the monkey might have made him chase after him for some time, but he wouldn't be so low to seek revenge on him. That would be awful. Well, thank you, Makino said, smiling. She sat near the six-armed monkey and started petting it. The monkey was a bit hesitant at first, but now after eating he didn't protest much. And so he enjoyed the petting. Also after the much-needed cleanup, the monkey looked quite amazing. Silver-white fur with blue highlights that dragged from behind his head to his tail. But you have to be careful hunting such large birds. I don't want you to end up in the sea with your condition. Luffy just smiled. In a way... Makino was the best big sister one could ever hope for. Oh, and by the way, does your new friend have a name? Luffy looked at the curious monkey. No, not yet. I think. The monkey nodded as if agreeing with Luffy. Do you want a name? The monkey scratched his chin with one of his right hands while the other two right hands were scratching his head. 
It kind of looked cute, and Makino practically squealed and hugged the creature who enjoyed it. Luffy had a bit of suspicion, it was one of those monkeys that acted all cute to get a woman's attention. Huh, such a simp. The monkey thought like this for a while, before agreeing. Ooh, he. He did a six-handed thumbs up with it. So do you have any names? Luffy asked. Makino thought for a moment. After befriending the creature Makino was the first one to know about him. Well, what about Sparky? Makino said, I mean you guys hit off as friends on the first day. That gotta have some spark. I remember Luffy wouldn't befriend anyone in the village that was around his age. So you gotta have something sparky underneath your cute fur. Luffy wasn't going to comment as to how it didn't make any sense to him. But his new friend liked it. So now he was sparky. Though in Luffy's opinion, the name would have suited him more if the six-armed monkeys had some red highlights in his fur rather than blue ones. But meh. He went along with it. After that, we called it a night and went for the bed. Luffy was actually quite happy with his new monkey partner. While hunting down the giant island bird, he had seen the monkey push down the panicked bird, which was what? Five times its size. That was also the reason why Sparky was half covered in blood. It made sense not anyone could use the Rokushiki techniques without strength behind them. He would be a good training partner if the monkey was up to it. The monkey could copy his techniques with just observation. Training with him would be fun. Luffy was actually curious as to how the monkey got here. He was half sure that this kind of weird animal only appeared on the Grand Line. But then again, wasn't there an island where a jack-in-the-box lived? Maybe from there? Who knows? He didn't question the logic behind it. Not that this world had that many to begin with. Chapter 23 Come one brat. Let's see how much you have been slacking of for the past year. Garp said as folded the sleeve of his shirt. Opposite to him, Luffy stood with his Najinata drawn. You will be surprised, old man. Luffy grinned, tightening his grip on his weapon, horn's edge. I can't use any of my Rokushiki techniques, but that doesn't matter. I'm already way stronger than I was a year ago. This might be the only fight that might break my limits. I just hope that I don't break too many bones doing it. After the previous visit, Garp didn't show up for a full year. And when Luffy had asked him, he told that a pesky pirate from the Grand Line was creating some problems in the West Blue so Garp didn't have time for a visit. Understandable in a way. But Luffy actually missed the old man. Garp didn't show it, but he cared about Luffy and the boy kinda liked it. Also, without Garp getting here, his training had reached a plateau. Or in a more way of saying that he reached a bottleneck. Now he wasn't gaining any strength at all, or whatever he did gain was too small. Technique-wise he improved a lot. Mastering all of the Rokushiki techniques, even the seventh one. And he was even on his way to developing variants from those techniques. But with strength wise, he reached a limit. Physical strength was important. The strongest men in this world could break mountains, cut of a whole island in half, or even a whole fucking meteor to pieces if needed. And that required raw strength along with technique. And that couldn't be gained with routine exercise, it seemed. That was kind of sad. But it was kind of expected. From what he read from the Rokushiki book, one needs to face danger to grow stronger. It seems that extended to all aspects, both physical and technique-wise. Luffy kind of felt jealous about people like Odin, Kido, or Big Mom right now. Those guys were literally born with their strength. And if he didn't break his limits, he wouldn't be able to suppress them. He remembered from the anime that the canon Luffy only trained after the war and in Wano, but even then he was able to suppress Zoro every time while the green-haired swordsman trained hard each day. And funnily enough, Sanji was able to kind of keep up with him. But there was also a theory that, while Zoro was training his ass off, Sanji was fending of Luffy from the fridge. And going by One Piece logic, it might have been just as effective. Jokes aside, the main reason the crew grew stronger was because they faced dangerous opponents. Which thinking back did make sense. Luffy had trained hard these past years, Training with Sparky, all that effort wasn't for nothing. And that was why he asked Garp for an all-out fight. The old man refused at first, but after explaining and a lot of pestering, he agreed. Now it kind of made sense why Garp would put both Luffy and Ace in dangerous situations on the island. But the thing was there wasn't anything on this island that could even be a possible threat. And that's why he needed some hands-on experience. Both grandson and grandpa were in a forest clearing. 
No animals other than Sparky were even near the vicinity. But even Sparky the six-armed monkey was taking a good position to not become a casualty. Of course, Luffy's straw hat was on the monkey. He didn't want to damage it. Brat, ready on you are. Garp couldn't finish his sentence as he had to duck from a wide swipe from Luffy's blade. Huh, impatient are we? He moved forward and did a wide uppercut toward Luffy's jaw. But Luffy's figure disappeared, making the wide man look to the side. The rubber boy had a red skin, steam coming out of it. Gear second. Now, that's something impressive, but can your speed really keep up? Garp dashed forward. This time he used Saru as he appeared right in front of Luffy's face, punching the boy in the face, only for the boy to move slightly away avoiding the punch. It was as if he moved on instincts. Garp was wide-eyed and caught off guard at the same time. And Luffy used that chance to plant a foot on the man's stomach. It made him back away a few steps, but Luffy didn't let go. Gomu Gomu no Jet Gatling, Garp grinned, avoiding each punch with ease by twisting his body around the punches, not getting hit. It wasn't Kami, no it was pure skill of observation hockey. And that's how you use the color of observation, brat. With that Garp again appeared right above Luffy's head and punched downwards. But Luffy knew that he couldn't stop the punch, so he did the only other thing and tackled the old marine. The rubber boy's body got bulkier as he combined gear one with gear two. What the? Huh. Luffy planted his right foot forward as he took the full weight of Garp and body slammed into the ground. Why you? But before Garp could grab him, Luffy used his speed to get far from the old man. The old man didn't say anything as he stood up, dusting his clothes. But he looked pissed. Luffy gulped, but he calmed his nerves. He needed to do this. No backing away now. Luffy tightened his grip on his Najinata, swinging it in horizontally. White slash. A wide arc of wind blade made it towards Garp. This was the next level of cutting steel as a blade user and a geek he loved his flying slashes. However, the naming needed some work. Chapter 24 The giant air slash tore through rocks and ground anything as it made its way to Garp. But the marine hero stood his ground and just backhanded the slash away like it was fly. But Luffy was already behind Garp's back with his Najinata, trying to stab the marine hero. But the marine pinched the blade in between his thumb and index finger with his other hand. Did you really think that would work? When are you this slow? And he kicked Luffy away, taking his weapon. He threw the weapon behind him so that Luffy wouldn't be able to use it. Brat, stop holding back. Use all your strength or you might get knocked out before you can. Garp this time didn't move from his spot, but cocked his fist back and punched the air hard. Luffy narrowed his eyes, but it quickly turned into wide eyes when he saw the air force generated from the punch almost flinging him away. On your left. Luffy was punched to the side as he skipped the battlefield crashing into the nearby forest and going through some of the trees. But he wasn't the one to give up as the boy got out of the mess, only to see Garp above him with a punch ready. Luffy quickly used the Gear Second's ability to skip to the side, missing the punch, which created a large crater on the ground. Luffy could already see that Garp's hand was black. The boy gulped. Uh, hey, isn't using armament hockey out of the rule? Garp laughed. Oh, so you can see it then. Good, then it will help you avoid it. Again Garp disappeared from his spot. This time Luffy was too late to avoid it as he was punched in the gut, knocking the wind and gears out of him. His body returned normal as he crushed through several rocks and trees, creating a drag line in the ground. Asterisk cough, asterisk cough. The boy coughed trying hard not to vomit. You shitty old man. Luffy roared as he used his combination of gear one and two. His muscles buckled as he gained a few inches in height, while his skin turned red and steam came out of it. Oh, so you still have some fight left, Garp said, standing his ground with a carefree smile. Come then, let's see how good you are. Fine, Luffy said as he stretched both of his hands backward, his fist enlarging to a gigantic size. Even though Luffy didn't want to use any of the Rokushiki, he didn't want to hold back either. So he used the rubber version of Teki to make his fist stronger than even steel. You asked for it. Gomu Gomu no. Giant silver gatling. Now that's what I'm talking about. Garp said as his fist again went black, donning the color of armament as he did his own fury of punches. 
in the middle silver met black, and it was obvious who was the winner. Ah! Luffy shouted back as he found his fist mangled and bruised. On your left. Luffy turned but this time the punch came from the right. Did you really think pirates would give you pointers in fighting? That's all Luffy heard before the world turned dark. The next time when Luffy woke up, he was in bandages. But he wasn't in the same place anymore. He was near a small campfire, and there was a lot of food that was near him. His Najinata was on his side as well. Thanks for patching me up, Sparky. Luffy said as he winched when he tried to move his hands. They weren't broken, but he was sure there were multiple fractures in them. Woo! Sparky said as he went into the stash of food and took out a jug of milk from somewhere. And he gave that to Luffy. Luffy didn't question the logic behind this world as drinking milk somehow cured broken bones or missing teeth. So he just chugged the jug, and he was already feeling better. We are not on Dawn Island, are we? Luffy asked the six-armed monkey. The surrounding was definitely different from the one he was familiar with. The monkey shook his head. No, you are not brat. Garp answered. Actually, Luffy thought that he already left, so he was a bit surprised. Didn't you say you have to leave after the fight? Luffy asked. Why the change of mind? It's cause of you. The large man said sitting near Luffy grabbing something from the food stash and started eating. You wanted to become stronger, right? This island has more strong beasts that are mostly above your level, so fighting them will make you break through your plato. But I'm curious. How do you have that? The color of observation. I mean, if you can master it, it will help you quite a lot. Color of what? Luffy acted stupid. Of course, he was showing signs of observation. That's how Luffy was able to see armament hockey. As the definition of armament hockey was an invisible armor made out of hockey. And one can't see it unless he has observation. Of course, there are those that with time and exposure was able to see armament, even if they didn't have observation hockey. It was kind of weird. So you don't know. Of course, you wouldn't. But, you clearly have some talent for it. Garp said nodding. It's something like a sixth sense where you can read your opponent's intent and be more aware of your surroundings. But the fact that you didn't sense me coming here means that you are still new to it. You are lucky you didn't awaken at the middle of a fight. Sometimes it messes you up, if that happens. Luffy could only remember Kobe in the cannon, who awakened his hockey in the war. But it seemed more common than it was let on. Anyway, I will come again in a month to take you back to Dawn Island. Try surviving till then. Chapter 25 Anyway, I will come again in a month to take you back to Dawn Island. Try surviving till then. Luffy didn't complain, just nodded. Hey, uh, can you teach me more about observation hockey? I mean how to use that and all. Also, I want to learn the armament thing. Garp grinned. You are too early to learn armament. But if you want to learn observation, then tie a cloth around your eyes and fight the monsters on the island. It might help you learn observation. But as you already have it unlocked, you can try to master it like this. But it won't be easy. The old man barked a laugh. Talent my shit. I had been practicing for nearly six months with Sparky hitting me from different angles while I was blindfolded. And I can only do this much. Luffy grumbled internally but didn't react on the outside. But from Sparky's reaction, the monkey was shocked, looking back and forth between Luffy and Garp. But Garp didn't seem to notice that. Anyway, can't you stay for a few days to train me personally? Garp only laughed. I have duties, brats. Evil pirates are everywhere so I need to be vigilant. Luffy just rolled his eyes. No, I'm serious. Sengoku actually wants me to stay in Logtown for a couple of months because a failed pirate group with a dangerous devil fruit has escaped to East Blue, and he wants me to handle it as I am already here. Okay, that was actually serious then. But, how big is his bounty then? Fifty million berries, Garp said. So a practically a baby. Sending a marine hero against him is kind of an overkill. Luffy deadpanned. I was thinking something around a hundred mil or so. Well, someone has to clean up the trash. That I can agree on. Both Luffy and Garp sat for a while before they dived into the food. Sparky joining in as well. Hey, Gramps. Luffy said as he ripped some meat off the bones. Do you know what Sparky is? Other than being an awesome six-handed monkey, where's he from? Garp shook his head as he eyed the six-armed monkey, who was also eating with them. No clue, 
but I'm sure he's somewhere from the Grand Line. But that's about it. Then how did he end up on Dawn Island? Maybe it fell from the sky. Bahahaha. Really? Luffy deadpanned, not seeing the flinch that his monkey friend made when heard Garp's comment. Bahaha yup. He has one of those immortal type devil fruits that makes them really hard to kill. Luffy turned the old man down. He was speaking nonsense again. He instead pondered on his abilities. His observation hockey was just new. He could only get basic things down. He needed much more practice before he would be able to fully utilize in battle, as it needs concentration to keep his observation up. And he knew no way of unlocking armament hockey. Observation hockey was not easy, but manageable. Getting attacked by Sparky while blindfolded was enough to make him awaken that. He had to do basically carry out all the tasks in a day blindfolded before he was anywhere near unlocking it. And that took six months, only now and a few ago he unlocked it. But mastering it would take time. Also, this island seemed different, the air was much heavier. He could already sense some of the animals that were eyeing all of them, but were terrified of Garp and didn't make any moves. Now that he noticed it, Hey, uh, Gramps, where is this island actually? Luffy asked now that he noticed that the trees were kinda too big. It wasn't the first time where Garp dragged him to other islands for training, but this one seemed different. Oh, it's one of the uninhabited islands in the clam belt. So don't try to get near the water, unless you want to become seafood some of the sea kings in there. Bahahaha. Luffy's jaw tightened as he gulped. He now felt the danger of the situation, and judging by Sparky's reaction, he was in the same boat as him. This wouldn't be easy. Garp looked at Luffy and internally found some pleasure in seeing him worry. Good. Don't want the power to get to his head. Many people die because of arrogance. He would rather have his grandson overpowered and paranoid, rather than be cocky and end up with a hole in the chest. Not a good metaphor, but it was reality. Garp was also very happy that by some luck his grandson had unlocked observation hockey. What Bogard said was right, he was a prodigy. He had seen a few talents unlock Colors of Conkers first, but unlocking Observation was also a talent. Speaking of Conkers, Garp was quite shocked a few years back when he saw the Conkers hockey from Ace. He was also talented, that's why he wasn't that much surprised that Luffy unlocked Observation just by talent. Of course, the Marine didn't know that his grandson had to put a lot of effort into learning it. Garp also liked Luffy's diligent behavior to gain strength. If Luffy wasn't so opposed to being a Marine, he would have thrown the brat in one of Zypher's boot camps. There he could meet people who were strong and talented just like him, but alas things weren't that easy. Garp internally hoped that Luffy would join the Marines, but knew that there were slim chances. But oh well. He was actually happy about Luffy's strength progression. The boy knew how to use his rubber body to his advantage. If he joined the Marines, Garp had no doubt that he would be able to learn the Rokushiki in months. Luffy was also able to do cut steel and do flying slashes now. For a brawler and hand-to-hand -hand combatant like Garp, it didn't matter much. But Grap knew for Blade users, it was one of those milestones. Garp was a bit surprised when Luffy asked for his help to break through his strength barrier. He knew the reason. Repetitive exercise could only get you so far. What the boy needed was some actual experience and something to push him out of his comfort zone. Now only the boy's mind is craving strength. Without stress or danger the body won't crave strength. And that's why it was always practical fight dangerous to gain strength. That's why he brought him to this island. This island should have just the challenge that Luffy needs to gain some strength. Chapter 26 A month later, Luffy sat on top of a large rock, viewing the empty clouds. That one looks like a donut. Sparky shook his head. Wvu. He did some noises and weird hand signs, before pointing at the cloud again. No, that doesn't wait. No, that does look like a lollipop. Surprisingly enough, Luffy could understand most of what the monkey said. With its varied face expressions and hand signs, it wasn't too hard. The monkey nodded. But that one looks like a pancake. The monkey was about to say something, but its ears perked up. It seems someone is out for a visit. Luffy moved his head to the side as he looked at something that was making its way to here. By air. Is it a plane? Is it a bird? No, it's an ugly grandpa. Shishishi. The monkey deadpanned at Luffy. What? That was a good joke? The monkey shrugged as if saying, Whatever rocks your boat. Now I feel offended. 
the monkey rolled his eyes, before it looked at the incoming Garp and jumped away at the last moment. Garp crashed fist first, breaking the wind and rock, creating a dust cloud in the process. Do we really have to welcome each other like this all the time? Luffy mused as he had his hands crossed blocking Garp's punch. He was already in his gear one and his hands were a lot larger, not quite giant-like, but huge enough to block one of Garp's casual punches. Of course, Luffy was using Techie on them to negate some of the armament hockey's damage. But it wasn't going so well. Nothing could negate the Dagmi from an experienced hockey user. Though, his usage did help him a bit. Techie wasn't supposed to be used while moving, but with Luffy's rubber body he was able to use it while moving. He could use Gear 3 without blowing air into his bones. He never got how that worked, and so he just enlarged them by stretching the insides of his arms, if it made any sense, and then used Techie on it, making it almost strong as using armament hockey. Actually, with his use of Techie, he was excited to use both that and armament together. Using them both would make him more durable than anything. Brat, you have gotten stronger. Garp grinned as he stopped putting force into the punch and started dusting his clothes. He was in his marine outfit. Straight from work? Luffy asked. Yeah, I was thinking of grabbing you and going back to the village. Or else I would have to make a two-way trip, Garp said. He looked to his side as the six-armed monkey jumped at him, hugging the old man. How sweet. Why couldn't you and Ace be happy when I came to visit you guys? Luffy rolled his eyes, ignoring the duo. Sparky had a habit of hugging people and being friendly with people he knew. Any other people he would try to avoid them. And with Garp's cheerful attitude, it wasn't surprising that he went quite well with him. Then Luffy became curious about something. Hey, a uh, Gramps, it's good that I can stay both with the bandits and Makino, but aren't you originally from Goa Kingdom? Yes? Well, uh, I'm not complaining or anything just curious. Why don't we have a house in Fasha Village or in Goa Kingdom? Eh, what do you mean we have Makino? She's also by relation by granddaughter. I took her in when she was little. Anyway, so the bar and the house behind it is technically ours as well, Garp said as he picked his nose. And you didn't ever mention it, till now? Luffy said, finding it hard to believe. But then again Garp adopted Ace as a grandkid, so maybe that was the same case for Makino. As the old man didn't explain further, he wouldn't question it. So, wait does that mean Makino was her cousin? It did, didn't it? Eh, never came up? The man shrugged. Luffy found it almost funny that other than the old man, every one of his family members is kinda related to criminals. Also, he would have to keep his mouth shut about Makino and Shank's relation. A Yonko's wife being the granddaughter of the marine hero. He found the situation a bit too funny. But oh well. Hey, before we go. Can we have a sparing match? Luffy asked, already jumping away from Garp as he took his Najinata prepared for battle. Meh, it wouldn't take long anyway, Garp said. Sparky, you should get some distance away. This will only take a minute. The monkey nodded and quickly daced towards a cover. Don't underestimate me, old man. Luffy was already on Garp with his Najinata. And don't overestimate yourself, brat. The fight went on for full minute before it ended with Luffy getting knocked out, Garp being the undefeated victor. Garp saw his unconscious grandkid, and he had to say, he was impressed. When coming to the island, he had seen that all of the giant creatures in the island were avoiding where Luffy was. That meant that Luffy had already conquered the island, putting himself as the strongest on there. And while fighting him, Garp was sure to notice the massive improvements that he made, both strength and skill-wise. Luffy had changed a lot after Ace left. He was now serious about training. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that in a few years, Luffy might be reaching the ranks of an admiral if he continued with his progression. Maybe four or five years. With his current strength, he was sure most of the pirates in the first part of the Grand Line wouldn't be a problem for him. The wasn't just only dreaming to become the strongest man alive, he was already taking the necessary steps in doing so. His talents were amazing but unlike other, epically Kazan or Dragon, who were lazy when young, he was driven by a goal, and that separated him from others. That's my grandson, Garp grinned, putting Luffy's body over his shoulder like a bag of potatoes. Well, let's go back home. Sparky quickly came out and took his place on Garp's other shoulder. Also, the monkey had a small backpack with him, 
Garp didn't question it. Might be something they scavenged off the island. With that, he took of using a combination of Jeppo and Saru to blitz through air. Luffy's diary entry on observation hockey. Observation hockey. This is plain and simple. Observation hockey is still hockey, which is related to willpower and strength. Unless you are a special case, if you don't have a strong enough body, you won't be properly used or even awaken hockey, especially in battle. Also contrary to popular beliefs, observation hockey is not passive. It's an active skill, so if you are not careful, you might get jumped. It has three branches, one. Enhance perception, two. Aura sensing, trois. Reading intentions, one. Enhance perception. Mostly used for battle. It's kind of like the Sharingan's ability, or one could say you get into the state of flow where you can almost correctly predict what your opponent might do. But this is a guesswork, and oftentimes new observation hockey users will be wrong, and only with hardcore training and battle experience can this be improved. Also, if someone is stronger than you, or has better observation hockey, this becomes kind of useless, unless you get to their level. With this predicting normal bullets and arrows becomes easy, because they aren't as complicated, as well as weaker opponents. Though, extreme speed and unpredictability should be taken into account, if not there is a huge chance for mistake. As even if your opponent doesn't have observation hockey, or has a lower version than yours. If the opponent is faster than you would be to slow to avoid the attack. 2. Aura sensing, mostly for information, can spread out senses to look for opponents or people based on their auras. This can be fooled with invisibility tech exceptions. Some users of it can use it to gauge potential and hidden strength, but it is mostly a guess. One can be wrong, one can be right. One's hidden strength is usually related to how much willpower someone had, but there are always those that had more willpower than strength. 3. Reading intentions. For both battle and information, with observation hockey, one can read his opponent's intention, mainly used for battle. One can use it to predict where the opponent might hit, but it can be fooled if opponent has no intention at all. Also, the prediction can be also wrong. It mostly depends on the user's skill level. Also, the more the number of opponents, the more harder it gets to do it. Exceptions. Some users can use it to hear and understand voice from animals and inanimate objects. Voice of all things, some users can use it to hear and understand emotions of others. Chapter 27. When Luffy woke up again, he was at Makino's place. He quickly got up and found Garp and Sparky having a meal. Of course, Luffy was sour about his loss and challenged the marine hero, who denied his request this time. Too much training won't do any good other than overworking yourself, Garp had said. And if it's about pestering me to learn armament hockey, then no. I won't teach you that unless you join the marines. Besides, your body is quite adaptable. If you were able to learn the Rokushikis, then you might be able to learn armament as well. But to learn that you have to join the Marines, bahaha. The man said the last part mostly to himself, but Luffy heard it just fine. For him, it was eye opening. It meant his physical powers were close, if not ready to learn the color of armament. He just needed to figure out how. After that, Garp stayed for a few days, not even joining the boys' sparing sessions once. So Luffy was left to do regular exercises to increase his strength. And he was right. The plateau that he was facing was now gone. He could gain more strength now, and that felt awesome. Technique-wise, he didn't improve much, other than learning more about observation hockey. He had even started journaling about how it works and what not. Even though the logic of this world was messed up, it still acted on some basic principles, and learning them would help him master hockey. Sparky, so what should we do about this one? Luffy asked his six-armed monkey as he looked at the odd-shaped fruit. When Luffy was in the unknown island, he was able to explore it. Being an island on the clam belt, it had some of the most dangerous creatures that he found. They were a lot stronger than any of the wild beasts in Dawn Island, but were weaker than what Luffy expected. Luffy was actually expecting beasts to be as strong as those that Cannon Luffy fought while training with Rayleigh, but that wasn't the case. They were, of course, stronger than Luffy, even if he used all of his gears with his Rokushiki, he found it hard to beat them but they weren't as dangerous as they hoped. It seemed that holding out against Garp made the old Marine underestimate his fighting abilities. Sure, he did show off the rubber version of Techie, but Luffy made sure to play it off as a rubber body ability. Anyway, 
It took Luffy around 20 to 25 days to conquer the island. And after that, he was able to explore it. Luffy had a bold idea to look for any hidden treasures, and so he asked the island animals about it. Of course, Luffy couldn't understand them, but Sparky could. With that, they found some old shipwrecks that were washed ashore on the beach. And after searching through some skeletons, he found some gold and an odd-shaped fruit. It seemed that the ship was a merchant ship, but looking closely, it was more of a black market merchant ship. Luffy had even found some mermaid skeletons with normal human ones to make notice of it. It seemed the ship was trying to smuggle the mermaids to some rich nobles that lived in the blues. So was the reality of this world, and so Luffy didn't mind taking the fruit for himself. But the problem was, Luffy didn't know which fruit it was. Sparky seemed eager to eat the fruit and gain cool powers like Luffy, but the boy held the monkey off. Just wait for a bit more, little guy. Let's find ourselves a devil fruit encyclopedia first. Don't you to gain one of the stupid powers, Luffy said. There weren't any devil fruit powers, was a bullshit excuse to eat a fruit. Sparky would be a longtime friend and a member of his future crew, of course, he would want the best possible fruit for him. The monkey reluctantly agreed, and closed the small treasure box that held the fruit. Luffy had contacted some of the criminals that were in contact with the black market to get himself a devil fruit encyclopedia, but it seemed they didn't have access to that high level of stuff, so Luffy would have to wait and ask Shanks for it. Asking a Yonko for mundane things was quite shameless, but Luffy never cared that much for anything. Hey, buddy don't feel down. If the powers are good, I have no problem letting you eat it, Luffy said, patting the monkey but I don't want you to end up eating a stupid fruit that won't help you at all. The monkey seemed to cheer up a bit. Luffy didn't know how old the monkey was, but by how he acted it seemed that he was still a kid. So, Luffy could understand the impatience. For now, Luffy stashed the fruits and treasures away. With the added treasures that he liberated from Goa Kingdom nobles and the occasional shiny objects that he found around the island, Luffy was making up a good amount of treasure to start his journey. So after looking over his treasure vault, he went out for a walk. Buddy, let's see if I am strong enough to lift that. The monkey looked at the straw hat boy curiously as he sat on his shoulder. After a bit of walking, he was in front of the nameless weapon, his nameless Naginata. With his observation hockey, Luffy was able to see the strength of the magnificent blade. Well, hello there. I hope you deem me worthy enough to lift you. Luffy removed the dusted cloth as the full view of the weapon came into view. Sparky, you might want to step away a bit. Luffy grabbed the weapon with two hands as he started to put strength into lifting it. Let's put my back into it. But it seemed the more strength he put on, the more heavier it got. Fine, we do it the hard way. Luffy's body bulked up, his skin turning red as steam started coming off. Even his hands and feet were getting enlarged as he put on full strength. You are mine, got it. I will become your master. Luffy roared as he finally was able to lift the blade off the ground for a just few inches. The ground around him was already forming spider cracks due to the struggle. But just as the weapon was lifted, it suddenly became even more heavier and planted again into the ground. Uh. Luffy took a few steps back as he failed to lift the Naginata, and he was panting profusely due to the struggle. So I'm not ready, huh? Well, I will be. I will make you mine, and that's the last thing I will do before I start my journey. And that's a promise. The six-armed monkey looked back from the weapon to Luffy. He seemed shocked that there was something heavy that Luffy wasn't able to lift. Come on, Sparky. Let's get back to training, Luffy said, grumbling his way out of the forest. I should also ask Shanks for some sea stones the next time we talk. Chapter 28 Luffy was out for another stroll on the Gray Terminal. He seemed excited. Well, why wouldn't he? Makino agreed to his request to make a call to Shanks. But it would take some time. Of course it would. Makino herself couldn't call Shanks all the time. And the last time they had seen each other was years ago. Due to pesky marines monitoring each call that was made from in the Grand Line to outside blues, securing a secured line for a transponder snail took some time. Shanks would often notify Makino's transponder snail of a call 6 to 20 hours before the call. That way, she could secure her end, and then the call could be established. Talk about forbidden love. Anyway, Somakino promised that she would notify him if Shanks was up for a call. 
Makino also asked for something because of Luffy's sudden request, to buy a certain type of chocolate that was sold only in the Goa Kingdom. She seemed quite mad this time Garp forgot about her chocolates, and that's why Luffy was on a hunt to buy those chocolates. But unlike Garp, he couldn't just walk into the Goa Kingdom. He had to take the sneaky route that's why he was going through Grey Terminal. Sparky, hold on, Luffy said as he looked up the tall wall of Grey Terminal and started using Jeppo to climb for a bit. He could climb it this way. But what was the fun in that? He stretched out his hands as they grabbed onto the wall as he started falling. When his arms were stretched enough, he slingshot himself away going up the wall into the kingdom. Hoo-hoo. The monkey on his shoulder also seemed to enjoy it. Before long, they were high enough to see the whole Goa kingdom from a bird's eye view. Sparky, check the map for the shop's location, Luffy said as he balanced himself in the air with Jeppo. With two hands still grabbing onto Luffy's shirt, the monkey used his other six hands to get the map out and find the location of the shop, and he then pointed at a southern part of the kingdom. Luffy looked down and frowned. There seemed to be a commotion going on there. The young man hoped that there wouldn't be any problems with his shopping. With that, Luffy freedived toward the location. He didn't need to worry about his hat flying off to the air as Sparky used one of his free hands to push it down Luffy's head so it wouldn't fall off. Good monkey. With silence, Luffy landed on a nearby rooftop, learning Jeppo, Saru, and life return made him very adaptable to being silent. Come on, that's way too cliche. Luffy mused as he saw that the shop was surrounded by marines and they seemed to be pointing their weapons at the shop, or at least who was outside of it. Luffy got down from the sky to a nearby building rooftop, observing the situation. Wait, is that Starry? He narrowed his eyes. I should have brought some popcorn. A man who looked like a psychopath was holding down Starry with his claws extended. I demand that the kingdom is handed over to me, or the boy gets it. The man was definitely a pirate and a sly one it seemed. His clothes had patches of blood on it. Okay, the demand seemed unreasonable, even for this world's standards. I wouldn't bargain a gold coin for that failed prince, Luffy said, while Sparky laughed. But you know this is kind of cringe and cliche at the same time. Not that I'm complaining, I have already killed all of the royal nobles, but it seems that I have missed one. Give me the kingdom, or the boy gets it, and the plot thickens. But, that is serious matter. Luffy said, how am I going to collect my early funds if all the royal bastards are dead? Sparky deadpanned. What? Luffy asked the monkey, that's a serious matter, and I don't like getting dragged into cliché scenarios. Well, you know what's the best thing to do in a cliché? The monkey rolled his shoulder. Well, you punch him really hard and break him to pieces? The pirate seemed to notice Luffy's presence up on the rooftop, and he pointed his claws near Starry's neck. Hey. You you on the rooftop. Yeah, you with the monkey. Get down, or I will kill the boy. Oppos. My bad. Please continue. With that Luffy jumped down from the roof, and he landed between the tense marines. By the way, I don't care about the brat. Kill him, and be done with it. I only want the chocolate shop that is behind you. Huh. The pirate looked behind, but that was a mistake. The next moment Luffy was in front of him, and a punch to the throat made him skid away toward a nearby wall, freeing the useless prince. Luffy punched the man in an angle so that he wouldn't hit the shop behind, but the lamppost that was in front of him. It's, it's you. Starry was wide-eyed recognizing Luffy. Luffy crouched down with a gentle smile. Yes, it's me, Mario. Luffy said in an overly cheerful voice, but his eyes were sharp. And when he was near the boy, he said something in a whisper. Act as if I saved you, or you die. Do something funny, you die. Now who am I? He grinned wickedly. Sparky kind of felt bad for the prince. Only a little bit. Am I H hero? Starry said with a panicked expression as he sweated bullets. For some reason, he was afraid of the straw hat boy more than the pirate. No, need to fear price. I'm here. Luffy said as he patted the prince before he looked toward the dumbfounded marines. And you lot, don't go near that chum just yet, he ain't dead. The marines looked at the fallen pirate in question, and all of them saw that the pirate's throat was caved in, and his neck might as well be broken. So they were confused as to what the straw hat wearing young man meant. Chapter 29 And you lot, 
don't go near that chum just yet. He ain't dead. The marines looked at the fallen pirate in question, and all of them saw that the pirate's throat was caved in, and his neck might as well be broken. So they were confused as to what the straw hat young man meant. Coo coo coo. So you are not someone ordinary boy, are you? The pirate who seemed to be dead just a moment ago stood up, dusting his clothes and rubbing his throat. But you have made a huge mistake. Do you know who I am? I'm the famous captain of the Blackberry Pirates. Some of the Marines gasped, while Luffy just picked his nose, taking out a booger and wiping it on Starry's head. Never heard of it. The prince seemed to struggling to get the large booger out of his flaky hair. Brat, I have a bounty of fifty million berries. A man that survived the Grand Line? With that, the pirate jumped on Luffy with Wolverine like claws coming out his arms. Face the power of my claw claw fru and he was silenced again with a punch to the diaphragm that most likely popped his lungs and busted most of his ribs. The man again hit the lamppost, breaking the thing over his head. Oh, so you wouldn't happen to be the pirate that Grandpa's looking for? Luffy mused that his own Grandpa's home was being threatened by a pirate that the old man was chasing. You, you, are you that Garp's grandson? The pirate questioned this time with anger as he threw the lamppost on Luffy, who just sidestepped which almost hit Starry. Eh, don't you see the resemblance? Luffy said, picking his nose again, and flinging his booger at the pirate. Fuck you. I don't swing that way. Gore. I will kill you. The pirate stood up again fully recovered from his injuries as he jumped at Luffy. Now, that's not a good way to handle rejection, my friend. Luffy comically punched the screaming pirate in the head, planting him head first into the road. Some of the marines now looked at Luffy with newfound respect. They didn't know their hero had a grandson, but now they could see the resemblance, while others found the whole situation funny. However, other than the marines, there was a certain someone who was taking photographs of the situation. Luffy was already on his merry way, entering the shop. Luckily, the shopkeeper was still inside and Luffy found the chocolates he was looking for. The shopkeeper was thanking him profusely for not getting his shop damaged and even didn't take the money. Huh. Who knew playing a hero gave free chocolates? Seize the criminal, Starry ordered, before he looked at Luffy with newfound courage and anger, and surround him. The marines were shocked seeing the prince pointing at Luffy. But prince, he's your. One of the marine captains wanted to say something, but Starry cut him off. Are you questioning me, marine? Now that my parents are dead, that makes me the king. Starry screamed at the marine. For a boy, he sure did have a high-pitched voice. I will have your tongue for. But this time he was the one who couldn't finish his sentence. As he looked down and saw a blade that exited out of his chest, the prince coughed blood. You scream like a bitch, the pirate said, annoyed by the prince's high-pitched voice. Luffy would have agreed if he didn't have some of the sweets stuffed in his mouth. But once he gulped them down, he convinced himself otherwise. Oh no, the useless price. No, I mean the king is dead, Luffy said, handing the chocolate to Sparky. How sad. As an honest citizen of this island, I can't let you go on your evil ways. Luffy grabbed the handle of the horn's edge. You, I'm not done with you, brat. That's all the pirate could say before he was beheaded. The entire people around them looked at the scene with silence and awe. They didn't even see the blade move. The pirate's head started rolling in the air. And funnily enough, it rolled and fell to a nearby fountain, donning the water bloody red. And the head seemed to be struggling. And before long it stopped. Well, there goes the captain of the black bitch pirates. Luffy mumbled as Sparky jumped onto his shoulder before he disappeared from everyone's view with a sudden gust of wind. Of course, Luffy didn't leave, but he didn't like people crowding him. It didn't matter if Starry died or not, because the whole royal nobles in the kingdom were trash, with the main family dead, he was sure other trash would take its place. Not that Luffy cared. He just wanted the whole ordeal to over with so that he could buy his stuff. And now he was waiting for something. Luffy was a bit far from where the incident happened, standing above one of the shop's roofs, and was looking at a certain fruit vendor, waiting for something. Sure enough, one of the fruits started shaking, and so Luffy quickly snatched the fruit away. And he and Sparky looked in awe as the fruit transformed into one of the devil fruits. Luffy looked at the fruit. The claw-claw fruit. 
The ability of gaining claws is kind of subpar, but that level of regeneration, that's kind of op depending on who the user was. But oh well, this could really be a useful fruit. The only reason why the pirate lost was cause he was relying too much on the fruit and sneak attacks. A good fighter would have more use for this fruit's ability. This day was not a waste at all, huh? Luffy said grinning. Sparky nodded. Let's get back, shall we? With that, they were off. Chapter 30 The next day, Luffy glared at the newspaper. He glared at the damn paper so hard that any moment now the thing would catch fire. Who the fuck wrote this? Language. Makino called out from the kitchen as she giggled. Luffy bit his bottom lip. He was angry. No scratch that he was furious. He didn't want to be seen in the newspaper this way. On his side, the monkey was rolling on the floor laughing. This is no laughing matter. Luffy grumbled. Now Grandpa might actually send me to boot camp. Shitty news agency. Luffy actually forgot to collect the 50 million bounties, so he thought that today he would go and collect it, but now he had no one to do that. Language, Makino said playfully as she came out of the kitchen with food. You know this is all your fault. Luffy pointed at Makino. If you didn't send me to buy the chocolates, nothing like this would have happened. Makino's grin just broadened. Now, don't go all angry on me. You are the new hero of Dawn Island. Luffy practically groaned. Do you know how bad this is? Makino just rolled her eyes. It's not that bad. But then the transponder snail started ringing. Okay, but it can't get any worse. Luffy gave Makino a stink eye. As he received the phone call, Moshi Moshi, the future king of pirates speaking, the future king of pirates my ass, when did you become the new hero of Dawn Island? It wasn't Shanks, no it was Ace. Language came from both sides, one from Makino, while the other was from Shanks. They framed me I tell you. Luffy grumbled, but then he blinked. Ace, how did you end up with Shanks? It's been almost two years since he heard his voice. Well. The boy came to thank me for caring for his little brother. Came Shanks' reply from the other side. Anyway, continue? So you became a hero, huh? Good for you. Ace said, trying to hold back his laugh. At least one us is following Grandpa's footsteps. Ha ha ha. Oh, shut up. Luffy grumbled. They didn't even get my name, right? Ace was laughing his ass off from the other side. Monkey D. Mario. I don't know why, but that sounds even lamer than Luffy. Hey, I like my name. Luffy complained. The newspaper had one headline. The new hero of Dawn Island. With a picture of Luffy standing over the defeated pirate while Starry was still alive. Presumed to be the grandson of the marine hero. Monkey de Mario. Are we seeing the dawn of a new hero? Well, don't worry, Mr. Mario. You can entrust your dreams to me. I can take your place as the next pirate king just fine. Ace said. I hate you. Love you too, lil bro. Ace grinned from the other side. But you have to know, your name is kinda making huge waves in the Grand Line. I'm pretty sure most of Gramp's old enemies will searching for a Mario. Anyway, it's good that we can talk like this. Oh yeah. Note down our ship's transponder snail number. After a quick note, they spent some talking about other stuff. Well, I'll go for Whitebeard. I wanna see just how strong my father's old rival was. Ace said. And the rubber boy picked up no malice when saying something about his father. That was quite the improvement. I want to test my sword against Thaman. Oh, Shanks wants to speak to you as well. Let us meet in the Grand Line then. Be safe, little bro. Luffy sighed. You too. He didn't ask anything about the sword usage of Ace. In his new bounty, a few months ago, one could see Ace standing atop of a cliff with a wild grin and a red blade resting over his shoulder. It seems hockey wasn't the only thing he picked up from Rayleigh. Well, Luffy, I didn't know you would place yourself as a hero. Shanks mused. Not you too, Shanks. Luffy groaned. The boy heard Ace and a few other snicker. Shanks just laughed. Don't worry, you can still keep the straw hat if you want to be a Marine. You guys are the worst. Luffy could hear Shanks, Ace, and the others laughing from the other side. Just so you know, I still plan to become a pirate not just for the title of the Pirate King. And I am also aiming for the title of the strongest man alive. Shanks chuckled, a hefty goal Mario. But anyway, it's good that you are even naming yourself even before starting your journey. I can't wait when you start the real one. Yeah, 
The pirate was still all things considered a 50 million berry bounty holder. That's quite the achievement. Ace's voice came a bit muffled. That is impressive. Shanks agreed. Anyway, thanks for taking care of Makino. She tells me you help out a lot. So yeah, thanks. Wait, how do you know Makino? Ace asked Shanks. Well, why wouldn't I know my wife? Understandable. Ace said, wait, Makino-san is your wife? A bit late to party, no? Luffy mused. That's unexpected. Ace said, but Luffy did tell me that you used to visit the village a lot, huh? I wouldn't even be surprised if you told me that you were a part of my father's former crew. The boy laughed. Because he is? Luffy answered. Another dose of shock later. Luffy asked for the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia and some questions about hockey. Both Ace and Shanks were surprised that Luffy had unlocked one of the hockeys even before starting his journey. But they didn't hesitate to give some pointers to him. Hockey, swordsmanship, and even some good areas to check out in the East Blue. Luffy was sure to note them down. And after everything was over, Shanks spoke to Makino for a while before ending the call. That was not too bad after all. Chapter 31 After the phone call, Luffy finally knew what he would need to do. Why hadn't he thought of it before? Everyone was saying he was strong, so the strength wasn't the issue. What he needed to change was his approach. He looked at the nameless blade, walking towards it. Sparky already got down from his shoulder and stayed back. When giving tips on how to better use observation hockey, Ace revealed something odd, which was communication with his weapon with the color of observation. It seemed while training with Rayleigh, Ace had picked up the sword. It came naturally to him. Shanks teased that Ace was still not anywhere near a swordsman according to his standards, but for a brat who took the blade for only a year, it was impressive. It seemed that Ace didn't just come to thank Shanks, he already challenged the Red Yonko and lost in his duel. So Luffy seeing the opportunity asked his brother on his secret. Ace wasn't even hesitant and directly said that he was able to get used to the sword because of his use of observation hockey. Being a Logia user Ace had to always work on his observation hockey. And for a new swordsman, it should have been a drawback. But Ace was able to make it his strength. He was able to communicate with his blade. It also helped that the blade he was using wasn't any ordinary blade. So Luffy took a page out Ace's book. He grabbed the cold steel of the blade, not even putting effort to lift it. He didn't know if it would work, but he had a gut feeling that this was the way to make the nameless blade his. So he poured his observation hockey in it, or at least tried to feel the blade was trying to tell him. The boy opened his eyes with new conviction. I am sorry for being weak all this time, but I promise you, now that I'm strong, you won't have to meet any humiliating defeat again. And that's a promising partner. With that Luffy grabbed the Najinata with both his hands and pulled it. The blade almost accepted him, but this was the blade's last test for Luffy. Itchy. Luffy poured his will into the blade as he tried to show it his ambitions, goal his drive for strength. He didn't hold anything back. If this blade was going to be part of his journey, then he would treat it like any of his crewmates. I will become the strongest. Luffy yelled as the ground beneath his cracked. His muscles were already bulking and red, and even his hair stood up. Luffy didn't know it but he unconsciously released a wave of Conqueror's Hockey. Sparky, who was a bit far from Luffy, felt the wild use of Conqueror's Hockey, but it didn't make him kneel or put any pressure on him. No, this hockey was derived from his ambition, and this was a power that wouldn't harm his friend, so the six-armed monkey only felt the raw strength and will of his friend. But the other's animals surrounding the island weren't that lucky as most of them fell with foam in their mouth. Even the trees that were near him cowered at the presence of a king as they leaned away from Luffy. I have done it. That brought the monkey's attention back to Luffy, who was holding the nameless Najinata on his hand. The Najinata that was a bit big for him had shrunken to fit his size while a chain came out of weapon and wrapped around Luffy's right hand. Luffy was lightheaded. The sudden use of conquerors was too much for him. But he didn't kneel, as he was able to support himself with it. No, it seemed that Blade didn't let Luffy kneel. Luffy had a shit-eating grin on his face as he was finally able to feel the Blade. It was asking him to be strong. Strong enough to fulfill his ambition. And Luffy nodded. So are you going to tell me your name? The Blade hummed in response. Fine, beat Sundra, Luffy mused. It seemed that the Blade didn't deem him worthy enough to know its name it. 
But anyway, thanks for giving me a chance, you won't regret it. With that Luffy planted the blade on his back, the chains wrapped around his shoulder and waist crossways, making a place for itself on his back. Huh, neat. Only then did Luffy look around, and see the utter destruction of the environment around him. Hmm, that's unexpected. Luffy could see multiple birds and animals already knocked unconscious with foam in their mouth. He could kind of guess what happened, but oh well. Sparky, let's do some training with our new friend. The six-armed monkey was still at awe, but Luffy's voice broke him out. He saw the straw hat boy grinning ear to ear as he already took out Najinata from his back and was doing some light work with it. Chapter 32 Straw Hat Luffy woke up groaning in the small boat, and he looked around. Wow, what did I miss? The boy yawned as he woke up from his nap. The six-armed monkey on his shoulder was banging his rubber head, but alas as the monkey couldn't use hockey, it was just a mere annoyance. But that didn't mean Sparky couldn't get his attention. He grabbed onto Luffy's lower lip and stretched it over his head. Hey, what was that for? Luffy asked now fully woken up from his sleep. He rubbed his chin as he eyed the monkey. He half wanted to throw him over the deck. The monkey pointed at the upcoming whirlpool. A flock of three twisters surrounded it, and their small boat heading toward it. Oh, Luffy, that was all he could say. How did the original Luffy get out of this again? He glanced at the barrel next to him as it rocked back and forth with the waves. Should he try it? It should work. The scream of the monkey brought his attention back. Yeah. No Sparky is pansy today, well, he wasn't a fan of water, to begin with. And after eating one of the devil fruits, he was a lot more cautious about it. And the storm was a bit too much. Even though the heavy downpour wasn't a problem for him or Sparky, it was different for the small vessel they were on. Soon his small boat was going to flip over. He glanced at the barrel one last time. It was almost tempting. Woo. Kiki. The monkey again pointed at the storm. Yeah, yeah. I noticed. Luffy rolled his eye. As he stood up, he strapped both of his naginata on his back in a cross formation, while he wore a simple red shirt and blue jeans that were up to his ankles, with some leather black boots to go along with it. His shirt was mostly unbuttoned, showing off the impressive physique that he built over the years, and the straw hat was on his back. Sparky, on the other hand, had a small bag on his shoulder. Well, the bag was quite similar to the size of Sparky's two feet body frame so it might be considered large. And there was some of the essentials, a change of clothes, a small transponder snail, with the most important book for the journey, the Devil Fruit Encyclopedia. Now that he thought about it, he should have probably checked if Sparky's bag was waterproof was not. If not his cloth and the book might get some rain damage. So he should probably get out of the storm. Regardless, he didn't want to risk it. It would not do for the future pirate king to die at the hands of a tiny-ass whirlpool like this. So he took a quick leap off the boat, propelling himself over the waters with a force that almost sank it. Any sane person would have wondered if he was losing it with this recent action, but sane people didn't last very long in the Grand Line. He should be able to handle the recoil. After reaching the highest point of his jump, he took another step, and the air below him responded in turn, propelling him higher and further. He took more steps until he was cruising through the air at a comfortable speed. Now to get down to business. It should be close by. He reached out with his observation hockey, and more than a few dozen weak auras flickered to life within range of his senses. He also sensed slightly stronger auras approaching them. HM, wait, isn't it where Alvida's ship ambushed a Marchette ship? He looked from above, and he was right. It was an ambush after all. He accelerated quickly and made his way over to the slightly stronger auras in the distance. One, in particular, Dwarf them all in power. Hmm, who could it be? And he was more surprised when it wasn't coming from the overly giant lady. No, it was from a person that was inside the ship with two other weak auras. It couldn't be, could it? He reached the pirate ship with the Jolly Roger that confirmed Luffy's already solid guess and touched down after quickly decelerating. The two pirates that were guarding the deck looked at him in shock, but the shock quickly turned to malice. If they gave any more thought to the fact that they hadn't even noticed his approach until he had landed right in front of them, they may have been a bit more cautious. Luffy was in deep thought, but spared them a glance as Sparky punched both their lights out. Was the aura from Nami? Let's check. Leaving the unconscious fodder on the deck, 
He made his way through a door and caught sight of the person who he had come to find. At first glance of the bright pink hair and pudgy appearance, he had to resist the urge to laugh out loud. That was defiantly Kobe. Man, that boy was the definition of a nerd. But a nerd with ambition, that's for sure. His aura was quite amazing compared to others. He wasn't completely against the boy's choice of style. Even he had some poor clothing sense in his high school years. Kobe was being relentlessly harassed by a small group of pirates who were too busy taunting him to even notice Luffy's approach. Excited yet? Kobe? This is gonna be a big haul. You looking forward to some good old-fashioned pirating? The boy weakly glared at him, causing him to laugh. The others followed suit. Nah, he's the brat still not used to being a man, one thug said. Wanna have some milk? They all howled with laughter. Cody turned red but didn't do much. Luffy actually wondered how such a timid boy had such a powerful aura. It didn't do much in the grand scheme of things. But in some way, it did matter. Garp wasn't a man of explanation. But once he said something that, possessing a powerful aura meant possessing hidden talent or a strong will. It made sense for Kobe, as even after seeing the corruption of the Marines he still became one, because of his strong sense of justice. Not to mention that he stood up against a prick like a kainu, that took some inborn brass balls to pull that shit. He just needed to be strong. We'll have to work on that, Luffy thought. He almost wanted Kobe to drop kick their asses through the floor, knowing full well that he wasn't capable of it. Yet. Chapter 33 Luffy stepped in front of Kobe. The unobservant idiots who by all rights should have been dead by now finally took notice of his presence. And he wasn't even trying to hide it or anything. Who the hell is this guy? I've never seen him before, one said suspiciously. New recruit, maybe? Another piped up. The one who had been taunting immediately before Luffy stopped and glared at him. Boy, identify yourself. Luffy looked him dead in the eye and grinned. Well, I'm the guy who likes milk, and I'm going to sink your ship with the big whale on board. That's all you really need to know. The pirates laughed at first, but then gaped at his audacity, but didn't hesitate to attack. You'll wake up in about ten minutes. Try not to drown, I guess. This stopped them in their tracks as they stared in confusion upon hearing the cryptic statement. Then they dropped to the ground, foaming at the mouth. Luffy observed Kobe carefully. The blast, although weak was enough for most cannon folders who didn't have the balls to go to the Grand Line. Sparky seemed to be rolling his eye at Luffy's display of power, almost as if saying, did you have to do that? Luffy grinned, yes, I did. Observation hockey was amazing when you explore it. He was even able to understand Sparky with just his simple expressions. Kobe was kneeling on the floor, sweating profusely and panting for breath, but he was still conscious. Not bad. Luffy smiled to himself, realizing that even this crybaby Kobe, who had zero confidence and next to zero mental discipline, was still much stronger willed than your average East Blue Pirate. That wasn't saying much but it was something. Hey you, you're Kobe, aren't you? If I heard right, anyway, mind giving me some food? I'm starved. Luffy said, meat should be preferable. Sparky Luching. The six-armed monkey rolled his eyes, before jumping down and checking the bodies of the unconscious pirates. Though they didn't have that much, Kobe was scared shitless at being addressed so casually by the person who had quite literally brought him to his knees with the use of an unknown, overwhelming power. And what was up with the six-armed monkey? That was some weird-looking animal. But he didn't comment on that. He nodded weakly and stood up on trembling knees. He walked forward, refusing to stumble, and led the mysterious boy and his monkey to a supply storage closet, if only to appease him. Kobe looked back at him as he walked, and gulped. The straw hat boy didn't seem to be hostile to him despite the display earlier. If anything, he should thank him for saving him from a potential beating. He was too intimidated at the moment to think of the ramifications of what the boy had just done. If those pirates were waking up in ten minutes, they would surely run to Alvida, and the thought would have sickened him if he had been in a state of mind to worry about it. Instead, he opened the door and let the boy walk into the storage closet as if his life depended on it. Wow, thanks Kobe. He dove into a barrel full of apples and started inhaling them. That was the only description Kobe could really use. If he was chewing at all, Kobe couldn't see it. 
It was all a blur as he bounced from one side of the room to another and gradually emptied the supply closet of its precious food. The six-armed monkey was no different. He even seemed to fight with the straw hat boy for the food. And the young man and his monkey started expending enough to even give Alvita a run for her money in the fat department. The boy and the monkey were inflated balloons by the time he finished, before shrinking to normal size. There was some notable steam coming out of their body as they shrunk back to their normal size. That was a good breakfast, the straw hat boy said. The six-armed monkey shook his head and pointed at one of his arms. There was an actually a small wristwatch there. Oh, then that was a good lunch. Luffy corrected himself. Kobe almost couldn't believe what he was seeing. Actually looking at the behavior, the six-armed monkey seemed much more civilized than the straw hat boy. And somehow that worked. The six-armed monkey also wore some good clothes, a similar-looking shirt like Luffy and short pants. Looking closely, he could see six small guns strapped to his chest. Those couldn't be real, would they? The monkey also seemed to say something to the straw hat boy. Wow, W. Yeah, you are right. The food wouldn't last us till dinner. We should probably look for a civilization to eat something. Kobe looked at him dubiously and found the courage to speak for the first time since the boy's introduction. H, how much can you eat? What are you? The boy and the monkey looked at him and Kobe froze, wondering if the slip had been a mistake. To his relief, the boy just laughed and the monkey just rolled his eyes. What am I you ask? Well, I'm the most basing and charming man alive, the boy said flexing his muscles. Kobe only now noticed that the straw hat boy some amazing physique that he had ever seen. He didn't know that many muscles even existed in a body. The boy was lean, not overly bulky, but the muscle and the vascular made the boy look quite sharp. Kobe didn't know if the boy could be considered charming, but he did have an amazing body, he would give him that. It also made him a bit jealous. He looked down at his noodle-like arm and almost became depressed. Luffy seemed to see the boy's distress. So he patted the boy on his shoulder. Don't worry. If you eat and train in a routine way, it wouldn't take you a year to build an amazing physique yourself. Uh, thanks? Then Kobe mustered up the courage for another question. Um, if you don't mind me asking, what was that thing you did back there? You knocked those guys out cold without lifting a finger. The boy smirked. Saw thee. That's a secret, but you'll find out one day. Again with the vague responses. Kobe nodded despite his lingering curiosity. Meanwhile, Luffy was internally wondering if he should just tell him. He didn't really feel like explaining the concept of conqueror's hockey to someone who had yet to truly see the world. Even a small glimpse of its vastness might discourage the boy from pursuing his dream at this point. Oops, he said suddenly. I forgot to introduce myself. Saudi. He stood up and Kobe nodded to convey his desire to know. The inside of the ship was a bit dark, so only now he noticed that the boy had two spear-like weapon on his back. Immunkai de Luffy. The man who is going to become the Pirate King. And the man who will be the most strongest in the entire ocean. He said the last part as he balled up his hand with a wide, wild grin on his face. Chapter 34 Kobe's jaw hung loosely in response to the bold statement. Pirate King? And the strongest man? Do you even realize what that means? He asked in shock. Yes, Luffy said simply. But Kobe shook his head furiously. You're insane. Your desire is to stand at the top of this great age of pirates. Not just shoot for the title of the Pirate King, but you also want the title of Whitebeard. A hint of fear crept itself into Kobe's voice at the thought of the boy he had unwittingly started to like dying a gruesome death. Luffy just smiled, while the six-armed monkey just had a raised eyebrow. Don't tell me you're going to the Grand Line to challenge Whitebeard. And finding the One Piece is no joke. And beating Whitebeard? He's a giant. Luffy just smiled, confirming his suspicion. Kobe continued shaking his head. It's impossible, Luffy. Give up now before you get yourself killed. I know I just met you and have no right to order you around, but I don't want you to die a premature death. If the sea doesn't kill you, then challenging Whitebeard definitely will. Luffy's held back from bonking him on the head, if only because Kobe had worked up the courage to shout at him, something he wasn't sure he would have the nerve to do after Luffy kind of overdid it with testing his will. Instead, he just gave the boy a confident smirk. Not likely. 
It will be a while before things actually get dangerous, but I'll be ready when they do. Also, living with unfulfilled dreams is a life of coward. And do I look like a coward to you? Kobe looked awed. That made the boy look at himself. Did he have the courage to fulfill his dreams, to serve justice to the criminals, to help the needy? Could he truly lead a life like Luffy? I wonder if I can be like that. Kobe's quiet voice pulled him out of his thoughts. I wonder if I can live with no doubts, confidently fulfilling my ambitions. Luffy shrugged. No reason why you can't. He said, in fact, why don't you accompany me on my journey? I can see great things in you. Luffy cringed internally at that stupid line. His recruiting pitch needed some work. Wah. Hmm. Do you have a dream? I have a dream, he whispered. It's nowhere near as amazing as yours, but I wonder if I can do it. He looked up to meet the focused gaze of Luffy, who smiled widely. Only you can answer that one. But Kobe continued on, ranting as if he'd been discouraged, which Luffy thought was hilarious. No, I will do it. I will become a Marine. A great Marine who follows the code of justice to the end. And I will stop pirates from wreaking havoc on the innocent. Luffy felt a bit disappointed. Some things never change, huh? But Luffy quite liked Kobe, not as a fictional character. No, it was because of his dream, and he wanted him on his crew. Oh, really? Luffy said, did any Marin help you get out of the ship? I mean, the East Blue isn't that strong for having pirates, excluding me, of course. The boy thought it was a bit strange that in his one and a half year of staying in Alvida, no Marines ever came to stop her. There was always the talk on the ship that the marines were increasing more and more bribes. But the boys came out of his stupor at Luffy's next question. Kobe, what's being a marine to you? The pink-haired boy blinked at the question. M. I, it's to follow what you think it's right. To serve justice. Luffy rubbed his chin. What if being a marine changes you? No, shoot that. I know that sometimes the government forces you to do bad things to people. Then what? The pink-haired boy thought seriously for a moment before answering, then I will quit being a marine and do what I think it right, even if it means punching a Tenryubito, one of the world nobles. Yeah, I don't care who it is, Kobe said. The boy's lack of knowledge of what a Tenryubito was a good thing. I will kick anyone's ass if it means doing the right thing. Luffy's smile grew even wider. Does that include Alvida? It was a calculated risk, he knew. Kobe's eyes widened in fear before the determination flooded back into them stronger than before. He took a deep breath and shouted, I will capture Alvida. There was a sudden crash and Kobe caught sight of a giant mace sticking out of the ruined wooden wall. I was wondering where the hell you were while the others were attacking our target. And here I find you aiding a bounty hunter and entertaining thoughts of mutiny. Kobe stared in horror at the still smiling boy. Did he do that on purpose? Why? What would his motive be? He had essentially just gotten Kobe killed for revealing his traitorous thoughts, but that didn't mean Alvida would have mercy on him. What was he trying to do? Alvida addressed Luffy directly. And who do you think you are, planting thoughts of treason into my gullible cabin boy? Do you know who I am, brat? Luffy looked at her, pinky already in his nose, picking it due to boredom. The biggest whale in East Blue? All doubts vanished from Kobe's mind. Luffy was definitely trying to get them both killed. Luffy's thoughts were elsewhere. Wait, does Laboon count? Nah, he's on the other side of Reverse Mountain, so that's not in East Blue. I guess there might be whales bigger than her in the Eastern Seas. So as far as I'm concerned, she's the biggest. He was amused in a way, before he snapped back to reality, just as Alvida's shocked expression melted away to make room for an enraged one. Before she could compose herself enough to act, Luffy turned to Kobe with the same bored expression. What do you think, Kobe? I guess there might be bigger whales out there, he said. Comprehension dawned on Kobe's face. It was a test. He was to become a Marine. Marines could not simply bow their heads in the face of insurmountable power. Their job was to protect the world from injustice when no one else would. How could he ever be a Marine if he couldn't stand up to a single pirate? That's what it's about, isn't it, Luffy? The resolve to put your life on the line. His eyes hardened and something shifted within him. He snapped. The fattest bitch-ass whale from here to Logetown. Iron Mace Alvida. 
He shouted it at the top of his lungs. It seemed Luffy's persuasion in letting the boy quit his dream was having zero effect. Alvida wordlessly swung at the offending stain of a child with all her might, only for him to disappear from sight along with the bounty hunter. When her perception of reality caught up with what had just happened, she recognized that there had been a crash directly above her. She looked up to see a hole in the ship's deck. The shit stain of a bounty hunter was standing above deck with Kobe sprawled down beside him in shock. He was casually taking down pirates who had reacted with hostility to his sudden interruption of their pirating. As they kept coming, he seemed to get slightly annoyed and his arms seemed to blur out of sight. As Alvida climbed out of the hole he had made, she realized that all of her henchmen were now unconscious. The rational part of her brain told her to be wary of this boy, the same part that was ruthlessly stomped into submission by the part of her brain that desperately wanted to process the image of his bloodied body dead at her feet. She screamed in frustration as she jumped into the air and came crashing down behind the boy, swinging down with her mace. Kobe's eyes widened. He didn't even have time to shout a warning before the iron mace came crashing down on Luffy and shattered upon contact with his head. What just happened? Kobe saw that on his shoulder, the six-armed monkey had covered Luffy's head with one of his arms and was glaring at the fat pirate. Wait, did the monkey shatter the giant mace? Kobe asked internally. Chapter 35 Alvida started to back away as her brain registered that perhaps she wasn't a match for this boy at all. And then she recognized who it was. You aren't you the hero of the Dawn Island? Alvida asked as she took several steps back. The crooked pirate knew not to mess with a few people in the blue, one of them being the new bounty hunter who was rumored to have connections with the marine hero garp. His first bounty was a whopping 50 million berries. Of course, he would be strong. Luffy's eye twitched slightly. No way. You are Monkey D, Mario? Kobe said, but wait, did they get the name wrong? Didn't you say your name was Luffy? The six-armed monkey on his shoulder started laughing much to Luffy's frustration. Yes, they accidentally got my name wrong. He grumbled. I regret making that joke. Wait, wait. Please don't kill me. I will give you all my treasures. She continued to back away until the boy disappeared from her sight once again. A fist collided with the back of her head, robbing her of her consciousness. Yeah, I don't usually kill people, Luffy said, finishing off his opponent. But for you, I might just man an exception. Oh, you're already gone. Oh, well. Kobe watched as his preconceptions of the world were shattered right before his eyes. But it also made sense. The hero of the Dawn Island, of course. If he was the grandson of the marine hero, he would be strong. But why was he trying to become a pirate? The boy's thought was broken by Luffy. The marines will be here soon. You can try to join them, but it would be suspicious in this situation. In fact, they might just arrest you. Kobe nodded sadly at that. It was an accurate assumption. Why don't you come with me for now? I'm going to a certain island, but I honestly don't know how to get there. So I also need some help. He laughed sheepishly while saying it. But there's a marine base on that island. So let's help each other. Kobe heard the proposal smiled and nodded with enthusiasm. It was then that Luffy realized he didn't have a boat. He had abandoned his to its fate at the hands of the whirlpool. The thought saddened him. It was no going merry, so he just shrugged it off. Still. A pirate should look after his ship when he can. Anyway, he was still thinking about the pink-headed boy. He didn't know if he could make Kobe change his dream. If it didn't work, he wanted to let the boy a chance to start over in the Marines. Luffy, we should leave. The Marines are on us. Kobe's comment brought back Luffy from his imagination. He could see some of the cannonballs that were already heading toward him. Yes, we should look for a way out. Luffy casually said as he used his observation hockey with closed eyes. The colors went away, only the aura of living remained in his observation hockey. The color of observation was personal for everyone. Everyone saw things differently using this hockey. If Luffy used his hockey with closed eyes, he could see all around him, the shapes of non-living things and the aura of the living things. It appeared like a glitch to him. He could even guess the emotion they had based on how their aura or the glitch fluctuates. It was quite an interesting skill. And with his hockey, he could see an odd orange aura that was trying to hide from him. And Luffy wouldn't have noticed if he didn't know what he was looking for. 
It was an aura of a female that was on a small rowboat, getting away from the conflict. Yup, that should be her. Well, let's hitch a ride. He grabbed Kobe and nonchalantly jumped off of the ship and onto her boat. Sparky seemed annoyed that he was left behind, but the monkey didn't complain much as he used Jeppo to follow Luffy. Of course, Kobe was screaming like a little girl due to sudden fright. With that, all three of them jumped onto Nami's small boat. Don't mind us. Nami's eyes widened comically and she gasped. She had been planning to get away while she still had a chance, but he had found her somehow. And did he just walk in air? No, she might be seeing things anyway. This guy, he was dangerous. Also, is that a six-armed monkey? The thing actually looked kind of cute, but she wouldn't comment on that. Hello, the boy greeted. Sorry for the trouble, but we're kind of stranded. Would you mind giving us a ride to Shellstown? We have some business there. Nami calmly assessed the situation. She knew Shellstown was on the same island as the 153rd Marine Branch. She was planning to go there herself to investigate a lead she had acquired. Perhaps it would be best to take this guy there to appease him long enough to get out of danger. He just single-handedly defeated a notorious pirate crew and trashed their ship. Having been far from Alvita's dramatic reveal of Luffy, she was unaware of Luffy's identity. So, she wondered if this guy was a pirate, but decided against asking. She simply nodded in response to his request. The obvious signs of fear Nami were showing amused Luffy. Also, she was kinda hot. But, she was seriously lacking the chess department. Eh, she will get big soon. Thinking about how things happen in the original story, Luffy didn't like to go through the ordeal. Seeing Luffy's eye ogled at her chest and the obvious disappointment on his face made Nami angry. Hey, eyes up here, pervert. But then she winched. She didn't want to scream at him. Uh, sorry, but there wasn't anything to look at. Nami seemed genuinely offended by the comment. It was as if someone had stabbed her heart. And Luffy realized that he was being too blunt. Don't worry. Give it a few years. I'm sure they will grow big with proper food and nutrition. Milk will make those tits grow in no time. Kobe felt a sense of deja vu for some reason. And then he looked at his arms. His noodles like arms. That's it. Mister. I had enough. She said covering her chest with her hands. Say any more about my boobs and you will be swimming yourself there? Luffy gave a salute. Aye aye, Madam Flat. Why you? Wait. Luffy said cutting her off. He stood up as he looked again towards the pirate ship that was a getting further and further away. I almost forgot about that. I did make a promise to sink the ship. Kobe frowned and looked back at his former home. He hated that place. But Luffy wouldn't be able to sink it now that they were this far. That wouldn't be humanly possible. His eyes comically enlarged when the ship suddenly split in half in the middle as it started to sink. Looking at his side, he could see the orange-haired girl having a similar expression and Luffy was already putting back one of his naginata on his back. When did he draw his blade? He couldn't even see it. Just how strong was this guy? Kobe gulped. He was glad that this guy wasn't one of the bad guys. Also, could he someday be as cool as him? While Kobe was running through his thoughts. Luffy was paying attention to Nami's expression more. He did this to show off that he wasn't just some weak nobody, and that she wouldn't need to be afraid of Arlong, and help was just one call away. Of course, Sparky just rolled his eyes at the display of power. Sometimes he couldn't get what the rubber head was thinking. But oh well, he had a good snack. Now he could get some shut-eye. The last time Luffy had put him on watch duty, this time there were more than enough people to keep an eye on things. Chapter 36 Nami's day turned out to be weird, and that was saying something. It was mostly because of the three passengers hitching a ride on her small boat. She barely had any space left to stretch her leg. She was desperately trying, for the sake of her own safety, not to comment on the stupidity of a person actually trying to navigate the sea without a map, compass, or general sense of direction. Of course, it was the straw hat-wearing boy called Luffy. Don't worry. There's only so and so chances of me dying out of hunger, thirst, or even drowning. So, if it didn't happen, then it won't happen. Luffy said, without a care in the world, though I hope if it did happen, I wish my body would wash up to shore, rather than being fish food. Fish don't eat rubber, do they Kobe? Shishishi, 
while Kobe was sweating in exasperation, and the six-armed monkey just rolled his eyes, used to his antics. The pink-haired boy wondered what he meant by rubber. Luffy had forgotten to explain his devil fruit powers. That's not something to laugh about, you know, she said flatly. Luffy stopped laughing and looked at her, blinking, before laughing again. She wondered if it was the same by had cut a whole ship with a swing just a few hours ago. The same boy that took down a whole crew by himself. The same boy who also happened to be the so-called hero of Goa Kingdom. The pink-haired boy seemed to already idealize the boy, because of his saving. She also heard the boy saying that Luffy was the grandson of the marine hero garp. She was almost sure that was a lie. Why would the grandson of a marine hero want to be a pirate? The pirate king no less. She didn't know if it was the charm, but people felt at ease around the straw hat boy. And that was saying something. Nami just couldn't profile the boy's character. It was all over the place. No, I guess it's not. Nami just rolled her eyes. She wasn't a person who was always cautious around people, even her own shadow to speak. And yet she kind of felt at ease around the young man. Almost safe, actually. And it wasn't only her. She could see that the pink-haired boy being much more at ease as the conversation went on. Had she completely misread him? So far since they set out, he hadn't made any move that could be considered hostile. He had just been chatting amiably with Kobe and the monkey the entire time. Nami felt a bit frustrated that he couldn't get red on the boy. But she also was very interested in his strength for reasons. Maybe just maybe. Oh, what's your name anyway? Luffy asked. I mean, I can you buy your nickname, Flat? But the lady cut her off. Nami. Then she winched. Why did she have to give away her name? Ugh. It felt like she was playing into his mind games. Luffy nodded and accepted this without further question. Which was good in a way. Nami didn't want to give any more information away. There was no point giving him any other information that he could potentially use to find her, and the chances he'd ever set foot on her home island were slim. Speaking of home, the boy had displayed some amazing strength. But would that be enough? Nami was no saint that would shy away from asking help, even using her charms if needed, if things got done. But would asking someone like help with her situation? She was almost finished with collection funds, betraying Arlong. Might get not only her, but the whole village killed. Though for some reason, her gut told her to trust the boy. She didn't know why. Sure, he was unnaturally strong. But strong people didn't necessarily have to abuse their strength, even if most did. There was an air of confidence around him, as if it calmed people down. So she had some hope that he might be of help. But Nami quickly shot that thought away. No way a human could ever fight a fishman. They were ten times stronger than men. Yeah, I am just going to give him a ride and be done with it. She told herself, then blinked. That came out wrong. But then she looked at Luffy. He might have a goofy smile. But damn that was a body. She shook her head. It wouldn't work out. And anyway, the boy was aiming to be a pirate. Asking the marines for help would be much better in her comparison. Who knows Luffy might be more dangerous than he let on. But those abs though. Yes, take a picture will you? Luffy said amused, before putting his hands behind his shoulder, flexing his abs. These babies can shred cheese? The girl hit her blush. And didn't say anything just focused on navigation. Yes, because it wasn't like she was a pervert. Chapter 37 As the journey, she became comfortable enough to ask some simple questions. Um, Luffy. He turned to her. Hmm. He looked at her. Why are you heading to Shellstown? What business do you have there? Luffy smiled brightly at the question. I have heard there was a strong swordsman there. So I'm going to ask him to join me. His name is Zoro. Two sets of eyes widened at this new information. As in? Kobe started to ask but trailed off. Nami recognized the name too. It wasn't exactly common. Roranoa Zoro. He's known as the pirate hunter, Luffy confirmed. Kobe broke into a cold sweat. He's a friend of yours, Luffy? Luffy nodded to him. The thought of the pirate hunter having friends sounded very far-fetched to him. But then again, Luffy did hunt a big-time pirate but a year ago. So maybe. But didn't he want to be Pirate King? Not yet. Luffy said, grinding. I was wanting him to join my crew. Kobe silently wondered how someone who was aiming to be Pirate King wanted to recruit most infamous bounty hunter in East Blue. That just sounded like a betrayal waiting to happen. 
They didn't speak much, but that's all he would get. Kobe found the six-armed monkey. Sparky was his name quite cautious of new people, but he wasn't any different. At least the monkey had the strength to protect himself. Kobe might be a coward sometimes, but he was not stupid. He had seen the monkey break Alvita's mace just by blocking with one of its little hands, and had seen the monkey perform the same airwalking technique that Luffy used. By his observation, even if Luffy didn't do anything, the monkey would have been enough to take the whole of Alvita's crew himself. And that was saying something. We're all six-armed monkeys that's strong. He had seen and heard of some weird creatures. So maybe they were just born strong this way. Kobe didn't think of it anymore. As he tried to focus on the journey, at least by the day was over. If things didn't happen, he would be able to join the Marines. When they finally arrived on the island, Luffy locked onto Zoro's aura. It was easily the most profound presence on the island, towering above the others. That was pretty cool. But what made Luffy curious was another aura that was just as profound near Zoro. Now that was interesting. Luffy was already ready for things to be not according to canon. The timeline would be similar, but not identical to the canon. So he was curious. The boat docked and Luffy was the first one to go off. Funnily enough, all of them followed Luffy like a mother duck. Including Nami, he didn't know why though. Maybe he made her interested. If so, that was good. On the way to the bar, he listened in on some conversations as he walked down the street, gathering information on recent events, one of which seemed to be the topic of almost every conversation he eavesdropped on. This is interesting. Someone already broke Zoro out and took out the giant captain. And here I thought I would be able to show off. Luffy mused. Someone had managed to break Zoro out from the marines and raise hell in the base, plowing through unfortunate marine soldiers with his sword sheath and finally knocking an enraged marine Captain Morgan out cold. And what's even more interesting was it wasn't a swordsman, but a swordswoman. Hmm, real interesting. The entire town had been stunned by the news. This marked the end of Morgan's reign of tyranny, and it had happened so fast. While the marines were grateful, they were also slightly disconcerted at the level of strength the unknown female blade user had so casually displayed, as if it was a walk in the park. It seems someone caused quite the ruckus here, Luffy said. Sparky got down from his shoulder, jumping onto a nearby house stop. Well, someone's eager? Luffy said, with a raised eyebrow. But I don't think you will find any good guns here. The monkey made some sounds which Luffy translated as, Yeah, but I'm getting bored the monkey said, before going off. Impatient, Luffy said as he walked slowly toward where the monkey was going. Sparky picked up the gun recently after learning about observation hockey, and he was eager to see if there were any guns around the marine base. Kobe and Nami had taken to following Luffy silently, and now looked at him with confused expressions. And so Kobe asked, uh, where's your friend going? To find some new toys? Luffy said amusingly. Kobe didn't enjoy the vague answer, but didn't comment on that. But he was curious about how people were interacting with one another. Of course, after seeing the large weapons strapped to Luffy's back, they made themselves move sideways. They weren't afraid but were cautious, saying something along the lines of another bounty hunter. But they seemed happy almost glad. The people around seemed cheerful today, Kobe said. It's almost weird. Is today a festival or something? Oh, you didn't know? Luffy said, apparently Marine Captain Morgan, who was in charge of the Marine base here, was abusing his rank to oppress the townspeople. Kobe looked baffled and somewhat angry while Nami just narrowed her eyes, not really surprised. His idiot son, Helmeppo or something like that, also used his influence to gain special privileges, and when Zaro put him in his place for harassing the townspeople, he threatened to start executing them. Zoro agreed to be locked up for a month in the marine base without food to avoid having civilian deaths on his conscience, but Helmeppo never intended to let him go. And it just seemed to happen that one of Zoro's friends was near the town and helped him break out, beating the crap out of Captain Morgan in the process. The marines decided to apprehend Morgan right then and there. Kobe looked outraged now. How could a marine let that happen? Luffy didn't really care either way. Kobe seemed to be a good candidate for the crew and he won't shy away from manipulating him to join his crew. What he was a pirate, a greedy one no less, and he would get what he wants. 
Kobe went from being a scrawny rat to someone that could patiently be a marine admiral in the future. When he last read the One Piece manga, he was already considered a hero of the Rocky Port incident. He didn't know what he did there, but anyhow he made a name for himself, and that was the kind of people Luffy wanted in his crew. Chapter 38 Besides, the Marine and the World Government was a failed organization. One could notice it just by reading between the lines of newspaper. Luffy had done some research. Did you know in the New World, some of the safest islands were those that were under Whitebeard's banner? Well, he didn't actually get that from the newspaper but from the information brokers in the black market. And it wasn't all. The West Blue was one of the safest blues because of the Chinjo family or better known as Hapo Navy. Sure more pirates originated for West Blue than others, but it was safer than East. And that's because most of the island was under a pirate's protection. The world government only were out for the tax, other than that they turned a blind eye to the most corrupt marines in their ranks. The only reason why the rumor about East Blue being safer than the rest was because of the government had spread. To symbolize that this was the blue where the pirate king was killed, this was also where the marine hero lived. So joining that kind of organization wasn't any better than joining a pirate crew in his opinion. If Luffy were to be honest, even joining the revolutionary was much more beneficial for Kobe's sense of justice. But Luffy didn't want Kobe to join other parties. Because the boy had some potential. He wouldn't go around with his crew to serve justice and all that. But after he established himself as the pirate king and the world's strongest, he wouldn't mind taking over the world government. While the canon Luffy was more inclined toward freedom, he was more inclined toward ambition. Nami turned to him with curious eyes. How do you know all that anyway? Luffy just hummed, before answering, It's a skill that I've picked up on. I listen to fragments of conversations while walking through crowds to try to gather a full picture of what's going on in the area. It's pretty useful. That was utter bullshit. Maybe that was something no one. No, maybe Robin could do. But not him. He just went along with his canon knowledge and picked up on some cues and made a wild guess based on his observation. Also, observation hockey also enhanced one's hearing ability, so it wasn't all that though. The color of observation was weird in a way. It not only granted a supernatural sense, but also boosted his already five present senses to a supernatural degree. Nami nodded, wondering if she should try to learn how to do that. Kobe was impressed. That's amazing, Luffy. Where'd you learn how to do that? Luffy put on a cheeky smile. A trade secret, my friend. When they arrived at the bar, Luffy noted that Zoro and the others had sensed his presence as well. They might have not known about observation hockey, but a small burst of conquerors was enough to make them stand on their feet with their guards up. Did he have to do it? No, but he was going to make his entrance epic. All dramatic and such. Luffy walked in, followed closely by his two traveling companions. He stopped behind the bench on which Zoro and a female sat. No, they actually were now standing on their guard, one hand on their sword, already ready to draw at a moment's notice. You must be Zoro? Luffy said casually, standing carefree with arms crossed. The green head in question only narrowed his eyes. And you are? The girl asked. She had black hair and fair skin. She wasn't your average fair skin beauty, had more of an athletic build and she was someone that Luffy couldn't recognize from the show. Well, she did look like Toshiji. But why would she be here? You a marine? Zoro spoke this time. No, actually, Luffy said, a grin on his face. I'm a pirate. Monkey D. Luffy, but not just any pirate I might add. I'm someone who's going to go to places. He jabbed his thumb towards himself, the future king of the pirates, if I might add, humbly. The others present in the restaurant would have laughed at Luffy's declaration, but they didn't. Why? Because of a small burst of conquerors, not enough to knock them out, but enough to make the eat any words they had. Was he abusing his hockey? Yes, but he convinced himself that this was training in its own way. You know what they say, never stop the grind. Zoro gulped as he looked at his friend. Both of them made small eye contact. If the straw hat boy made any sudden moves, they would make theirs. Zoro knew the younger boy might be stronger than him. The green pride hurt even thinking that, but if both of them jumped in together, he wouldn't have a chance. And what do we owe the pleasure? Zoro's grip on the sword tightened. Heard you are the strongest around this water, Luffy said, 
Everyone in the bar had put their conversations on hold and looked on, including Nami and Kobe. They watched apprehensively as if expecting a fight to break out. And so I have decided. Luffy continued looking at Zoro and other women. I want you in my crew. There was a sudden pause before. You want to what? Zoro flabbergasted. As the straw hat boy laughed, the tension lifted off everyone's shoulders. All of them let out a unified sigh that they didn't know they were holding. Sorry for being overdramatic, but you guys seem really strong. So I wanted to do a small test. I hope you don't mind. The boy said politely. Everyone around then wondered if it was the same young man that just a moment ago was drawing thick tension around them. Can I get two more rounds over here? It's on me, the bartender nodded, looking relieved, and poured two more cups as Luffy sat down. Alcohol? Luffy frowned. Do I look like a peasant to you? Bring me milk. And it better be ice cold with no sugar mixed in it. Kobe sweat dropped. Luffy wasn't kidding when he said he liked milk. If anyone had any complaints, they didn't question the boy's odd choice of drink. But now looking at the boy's amazing physique, they could guess that he was one of those health-conscious guys who counted everything they put in their bodies. With that out of the way, Luffy moved his attention to the two blade users. Oh. Why are you standing? Sit down, he began. By the way, what's your name, pretty lady? The two of them reluctantly took their seats opposite to Luffy. Kuina. Luffy's eyes slightly widened, but he hid it well. Ah, uh, a wonderful name. He expected changes, but not this soon. But oh well, her aura was just as strong as Zoro's if not stronger than the green head. Well, she did seem a few years older than Zoro. Might be already in her early twenties. Anyway, I have a proposal for you guys. Luffy began, but this time Zoro cut him off. Chapter 39 Look, we don't want any more trouble. The Marines have already blacklisted my bounty hunter's license, he said, jabbing towards Kuniya. I'm pretty sure they might do the same thing for her, as she took down one of the Marine captains. No matter how corrupt he was, at the end of the day he was Marine, so we don't want any more trouble. But that's awful. It was Kobe who spoke. You guys didn't do anything wrong? Kuniya sighed. That's how the world works. As bounty hunters, we have to be more wary of the marines most of the time than pirates. Bounty hunting isn't as easy as hunting down pirates and giving them to marines. Some marine check posts don't even want to hand over the cash unless you put some pressure on them. So we don't want any more trouble. Luffy raised his eyebrow. I don't get it sometimes how Gramps is still in the marine. He mumbled mostly to himself, of course, it was to let Kobe hear it. Anyway, that's why you should join my crew. Both Zoro and Kuina frowned, but Luffy wasn't finished. Don't you guys have a dream? Yes, both of them said at the same time. And if I may able to hear them? He said politely, leaning on the table. To become the strongest swordsman in the sea. To become the strongest swordswoman in the sea. Luffy's grin widened, bold goals. And are you going to let some man-made rules block you from that path? He asked. You can hide like a rat in the East Blue for a couple of months. Change your looks, take on a new name, and start your occasional pirate hunting. But will that help you gain strength? Luffy leaned in. Even more. He had a sharp fire in his eyes. Or, you can join me. I just don't want to be the pirate king. No. I also want to be the world's strongest man. You see, I'm a greedy and ambitious man. I don't just want Roger's title, no I want Whitebeard's title as well. And like the greedy pirate I am, I want you guys be part of my crew. Both Zoro and Kuina could see the ambition in his voice and a fire behind the boy's eyes. He had an air of confidence that said that he spoke nothing but the truth. And he seemed to be a man that would do anything for his goals. It almost made them admire him. Even if the boy was a few years younger than them. I promise you strength, I promise you wealth but I can't promise you, your goals. That's something that you have to do for yourself. He said, I can help you get strong and make it easy for both of you to reach your goal, but it is only your conviction that will make you fulfill your dreams. So, are you willing to join me? Join the future king of the pirates. The man that will conquer the seas and the land in between. The man that will be one day the strongest in the world. World domination wasn't Luffy's plan, and nor would the two-sword user care but he had to make his marketing speech impressionable. So what's your answer? Both of them thought over what Luffy had said. 
It was true. After what had happened, they couldn't actually continue in their line of work in the East Blue. They could just to another blue and forge new identities. But what Luffy said was right. Their target were the likes of Mihawk and Shanks, and being here won't make them reach their goal. They could have tried to join the Marines, but they had too many limitations and rules, and after this incident joining them was not an option. Zoro and Kuina knew the boy was right, but joining piracy. The two of them had some lines they weren't willing to cross, and knew that not all pirates were bad. And the Straw Hat boy seemed genuine, so the offer was quite tempting. For Zoro, he had a goal to visit a certain island. And that island wasn't just anywhere in Grand Line, that island was too far for him to reach right now. He needed strength, and if that meant joining a pirate crew so be it. For Kuina, it wasn't something she planned. But was eager, she did have a history with a certain blue-haired pirate, and the straw hat boy did say he was going to challenge the white-beard pirates. So joining his crew wasn't a bad deal. And unlike Zoro, she had the chance to start her journey a few years before the boy and visited each of the four blues. Only the Grand Line remained unexplored to her, and she had gut feeling that this boy would not only be able to sail the Grand Line, but conquer it. We will join. Zoro answered for both of them, and Kuina didn't refuse, but I will like to challenge you to an official duel. You are strong, and I see no way of defeating you, but that my swords are humming for a hunt. Luffy's grin widened. That's the kind of thing I want to hear. It's almost as if it's a music to my ear. The boy snapped his fingers, but only on one condition. No make it two. Do you accept? Yes. Zoro grinned manically. Anything for a good fight? Not even knowing what those said conditions are. Kuina sighed. It seemed that when it comes to fighting, Zoro was still as impulsive as before. But she didn't protest, as she just crossed her arms. She also wanted to challenge the boy. The straw hat boy did have two good-looking blades on his back. At least one of them was a named blade. First, we won't fight here. Let's go to another island. Luffy leaned in with a whisper. That made both of them raise their eyebrows, but didn't refuse the condition. Maybe the boy didn't want to show his powers to others. It was understandable. While others might underestimate and think that the straw hat boy was trying to isolate the fight, so as to not get too embarrassed while losing. Zoro and Kuina didn't think that way. Their instincts screamed to them to not underestimate the boy. And they wouldn't. They would follow their gut. And for the second condition, Luffy added, I want the two of you to fight me at the same time. Chapter 40 After that whole ordeal was over, the townspeople came outside the restaurant to look at their heroes. Actually, they were already there. But after seeing Luffy enter, some of them left thinking that a dangerous fight might break out. But nothing like that happened. So they came back. Even Kobe was a bit of awe at the appreciation that people gave them. And at the same time, he questioned himself if all Marines were like this. He still wanted to pursue his own brand of justice, but he wasn't sure anymore. And also the fact that Luffy was pushing him to join the crew. Luffy was the strongest person that he saw alongside Zoro and Kuina. He hadn't seen them fight yet but he could guess they weren't to be messed with. Kobe really wanted to be like them. Stand strong, bold, never backing down, and stand for his own beliefs. And he felt a bit of happiness hearing Luffy telling Kobe that he had the potential to be strong. And Kobe would have joined in if Luffy was a bounty hunter, but the straw hat was a pirate, and he didn't know if it was the right thing to do. But there was also the fact that Luffy's grandfather was the marine hero. Maybe he saw something that made him dislike the marines. Kobe might be a nerd, but he wasn't as naive as he let on. If the marine base in East Blue had this kind of corruption, from Luffy's demeanor, he couldn't see the boy joining the marines. But it wasn't like he could downright ask Luffy about it. They weren't that close yet. Pirates were bad right, they destroy villages, kill, rape and other stuff. And he already had some experience in that department, so pirates should be bad. That's what common logic told him but all logic didn't work with the straw hat boy. Maybe he should think about it for a bit before joining the marine, maybe sail with him for a bit. Yeah, I should spend some time before taking such a huge step. Kobe told himself, now that I'm free I can join the marines anytime I want. He watched in exasperation as Luffy devoured plate after plate of food. His body was gradually expanding before their eyes, 
and some had lost their appetites just watching the process. And he wasn't the only one. Sparky, the six-armed monkey joined in on the feast and started devouring the food. Maybe strong people needed more food? Or maybe... Kobe sweat dropped. Yeah, logic didn't work with him. Zoro and Kuina looked at Luffy a bit weirdly, and... Nami, where was she? She was with them just a moment ago. Did she leave? She did say she would leave after giving them a ride on her boat. Luffy sighed in contentment and stood up, his round physique sagging in response to the action. The same thing happened to the six-armed monkey who gained a foot in height due to his bulging stomach. A few bystanders wondered how this was possible. When Luffy's face scrunched up in concentration and his round physique rebounded into his moderate muscular figure, muscles bulging as if the mass had been redirected, red-hot steam coming out of him, the bystanders gave up trying to make sense of anything they were seeing. Ah, that's better. Kami -E really helps with quick digestion, Luffy said in satisfaction, and I feel like I can beat a sea king right now. I digested it too much, too soon. Kobe and the other sweat dropped. Kuina spoke. Are you guys staying here for a while? It will get dark if you want to go to another island. Luffy glanced at her then back to Kobe and grinned. Actually, we're going out to sea. Zoro, and you will be my first crewmate. Or at least human crewmate. Sparky has you beat there. The monkey in question rolled his shoulder. It was weird seeing a six-armed monkey rolling his shoulder. Did it have two shoulders or six? We didn't join your crew yet. You have to show us that you are at least strong enough to become my captain. Kuina said crossing her arms. You are overwhelmingly underestimating us. Against two of us you wouldn't stand a minute. Luffy just smiled amused as he leaned back on his chair. We'll see. Two former pirate hunters joining a pirate. Luffy said, I find it quite the tale. Kobe still tried to wrap his mind around the two pirate hunters becoming a pirate. Anyway, we should head for the next island. Zoro said, the sooner we can fight, the sooner we can get rid of you or join you. Ow, you're such a cold sourpuss, Zoro. Luffy whined back to his comedic demeanor. Kobe just sighed. This was the time to make a decision. So, when do we set sail, Luffy? He said. Just as soon as we get a ship that can take us. Luffy grinned hearing it from the boy. Kobe face bombed. He almost forgot that Nami was gone. Oh, he also wanted to be clear with Luffy. Uh, I hope you don't mind, but I'm not actually joining your crew yet. The boy clarified, a bit nervous. If it's not a problem with you, I want to accompany your journey and see a bit more of the world. Before making a decision, Kobe was almost proud of himself that he said that without stuttering even once. But he had to stand up for his own beliefs if he wanted to fulfill his dreams in the wide sea. UW, come on Kobe, not you too. Luffy whined like a baby. That went better than expected. But hey, at least now you are following your dreams. Shishishi. Kobe smiled. T thanks. But we need to get a boat first. I think I can fix the issue. Kuina said, the marines want us to leave the island anyways, so we can all take my boat. It should be able to house all of us for a trip to the nearest island. She was actually not present when Zoro was captured by the marines. No. She got a cue from the Bounty Hunter Association that he would be near these islands. It had been two years since they last met, so she wanted to meet him as well. She had already gone and visited her father beforehand, as she was planning to venture into the Grand Line all by herself. So she wanted to meet one of her childhood friends and rival before going on the dangerous journey. But having found no clue after a week of searching, even after getting the cue, she came here to Shell's town to refill her rations. But then things happened and she found out about what the marines were scheming and had no choice but to get involved. So she did have a decent boat for the journey. She would, of course, have to sell it as there was no chance that the small dingy would make her cross to the Grand Line. But it could be used for nearby visits. Anyhow, where do you want to go? Orange Town. Without further ado, they set sail for the place they knew to be called Orange Town to meet a future Yonko of the sea. Chapter 41 I can already see the island, Kobe said. He was now actually wearing a black and white mask that only covered the first part of Kobe's face. A cheap one that he bought much to Luffy's recommendation before starting the journey. The boy had asked why, and Luffy said, something along the lines of, 
He didn't want Kobe to lose his chance to join the Marines if he was recognized. What? Luffy himself might be greedy, but there were some lines that he wasn't willing to cross. If he couldn't convince Kobe, he would at least not take away his chance to fulfill his dream. Which made Kobe very grateful, also adding to his dilemma. He didn't know if joining the Marines was a good thing. After the experience with Captain Morgan, unlike the original timeline, they didn't make a show when taking down Captain Morgan, and of course, those Marines were scared that they tried to impression a powerful bounty hunter like Zoro. So, they didn't ask many questions. So none of the Marines knew that they were actually sailing out to be pirates. Oh, neat. Luffy shouted, rocking the boat. Stop it. You are going to sink my boat? Kunia said frowning a bit. The boy was really out of control sometimes. Her small sailboat was crowded enough, and she didn't want it to sink it in the middle of the ocean. Zoro just lazied around the boat, indulging in a small nap. His three swords by his side. Kobe wondered if he used all of them in a fight. But then again, Luffy's two large naginata were currently used for rowing boats, and he was sure that wasn't their purpose. Also, Luffy did have two naginatas, and but he only saw him use one at a time. He only saw him once using that though, so he wasn't sure. Rather than giving a response, Luffy instead opted to jump out of the boat, hovering in the air using Jeppo. Yo, I am going to get a head start, Luffy said, ignoring the weird looks that the others gave, excluding Sparky. Is that a devil fruit power? Kuina asked, the unanswered question. Actually, before today Kobe didn't believe about the rumors about the devil fruits. But seeing Luffy and his unordinary power, that could be explained with a supernatural fruit. The monkey made a sound while shaking his head as if denying their claim. That's not his devil fruit power. It's something else Zoro said. Now that he was woken up from the shaking of the boat, Kuina raised an eyebrow. How do you know? The now awakened swordsman pointed at the six-armed monkey. He said that wasn't his devil fruit power, but something called Skywalk or Jeppo. Zoro said, the monkey said something else. So the green swordsman added. And he also added that anyone can do that. Kuina and Kobe both blinked at the green-headed swordsman being able to understand monkey speech. Even Sparky was a bit surprised. But Luffy could understand him so he wasn't that surprised. It also made him appreciate the swordsman a bit. Yeah, I also saw Sparky use the same technique as Luffy. Kobe said, wait does that mean I can learn that as well? The monkey shrugged while the only female member thought over something else. So he did eat a devil fruit. Kuina muttered, nodding to herself. She had seen people use those in recent years. These things were considered legends. It's a technique that you do by kicking the air or something. Zoro looked at the monkey weirdly. You cannot be serious? He asked the monkey. The monkey rolled his shoulder as if saying whatever you want to believe. Even Kuniya and Kobe questioned the logic behind it. That didn't make sense. But also, Zoro being able to communicate with a monkey didn't make sense either. Luffy reached the town pretty quickly, and Sky walked around a bit, taking in the sights. He was high enough so that civilians weren't likely to take notice. Then again, he knew this island was the one they were searching for by now. And he also knew that there were more than just civilians in town. As if reacting to this revelation, a cannonball came into his peripheral vision. It was aimed right at him. He could have maneuvered out of the way pretty easily, but he quickly came up with a better idea. He looked down and confirmed that the timing would be right. He caught the cannonball with one of his hands and let gravity pull him down, landing with a crash onto the ground and making cracks in the pavement. For witnesses stopped running and looked at him. Am I seeing figs? One of the three armed men asked. Hey, Nami someone threw a cannonball at me. The girl in question flinched. How did he come here? She had made sure to make a run for it after he was meeting with the bounty hunters in Shell's town. Was he following her? You don't throw cannonballs. Yu Shuqing. One of the men said, but more importantly, how did you catch that? Eh, I do that all the time, Luffy answered as he spun the cannonball on his figure. Gramps used to play fetch with me and Ace when we were little. Somehow Nami actually believes him. Also seeing Luffy she got an idea. Boss she shouted with feigned glee. The pirates looked from the new arrival to her and back to the new arrival. You're here, she continued. Great. Mind taking care of these guys for me? I got the map, so I'll head back to the ship. Luffy watched, amused. 
as she hastily retreated without giving him time to potentially refute her words. Not that he would. Actually, he was planning on hold her to the statement that he was her boss now. The pirates quickly rounded on him, completely missing the sharp turn that Nami took as she sprinted behind the houses to their left. So you're her boss, huh? I guess we can just take you to Captain Buggy, then. Luffy scoffed. Sorry, I already have an appointment with Big Nose, and I'd rather make the fight with a future Yonko a bit flashy. The pirates looked outraged and slightly fearful at the disrespect the man showed. Luffy mused at the inside joke. He had been in this world for nearly three years now. He almost missed the One Piece manga and other forms of entertainment, but then again gaining strength was in itself entertainment for him. Anyhow catch. And Luffy tossed the cannonball that made the three pirates comically widen their eyes. But before the ball could get near them, it exploded, making a non-lethal blast that blasted them to a nearby building, knocking them unconscious. Luffy on blue air at his right hand's index finger which had whips of smoke coming out of it. This was his special version of his finger pistol, which he dubbed as air pistol, a technique he had perfected to use with his devil fruit ability, like the King Kong gun. His index figure would get compressed like a spring and shoot out a finger pistol without moving his whole arm. And because of him being a rubber man, the attack would be even faster than if someone using the normal version of the technique. He can also fire it in rapidly. He was inspired by Ace's original fire gun technique. Chapter 42 Nami hid behind a wall, climbing it in a way, to get a better view of the fight, which was over. The three men had been beaten easily, but she wondered what Luffy did with his finger. She had only seen him point his hand in a child's finger pistol motion before the cannonball exploded. Did he fire off a bullet from his finger? How is that even possible? Was that the legendary devil fruit power that Arlong and his men talked about? She had a lot of questions. Luffy seemed to notice her, so she had to get down and act naturally. Thanks, by the way, she said, trying not to be nervous. Nice job kicking their asses. She hesitated, then added, Mind if I treat you to some food? I have a proposition for you. No, she wasn't going to ask for him to fight Arlong just yet. She wanted to gouge his strength first. She didn't want to send the boy to his death. Sure, why not? Luffy nodded in agreement. Despite knowing what this would lead to, he wasn't about to turn down free food. Nami winched when she remembered how much food Luffy ate. Yeah, that wasn't a good offer in her part. But anyways, what done is done. She would need to think of something later. Let's form an alliance. She said, before explaining. Luffy was tuned out at the moment. So he just nodded. He was thinking about other stuff. Like how it would be a hassle to explain hockey if the Marines got the wind of it. Garp wasn't a person who would put that info on the table. But if he used hockey willy-nilly and people recognized it, he would be in trouble. He wasn't worried about the Marines. But some Paradise Pirate having hockey users got leaked, they would put a huge target on their back. Luffy wasn't against a good challenge, but his crewmates were barely ready for it. And he didn't want that until he made his crewmates strong enough. So he had to kill any potential leaks on that info. It would be best to not use them, willy-nilly. Nami for the most part needed to be strong. Even after Wano, she didn't gain any kind of hockey. And that was something that needed to be fixed. If Nami picked up Bo's staff this time, he wouldn't mind teaching her. As his Najinata use was almost similar. And he did have some experience with using long pipes. The Nami's talk broke him out. Her proposition was to infiltrate Buggy's base of operations together and split their treasure 60 40ths. Luffy just nodded his head. He seemed bored. He was also a bit excited to fight both Zoro and Kuina. But Zoro needed a day or two fully recover from his hunger torture. So he would wait a bit, fight them at their strongest, and show them his strength. But if they pushed for a fight, he wouldn't decline. He liked being overpowered. He wasn't like your average shonen protagonist that's hungry for battle. No, he did enjoy it from time to time but he enjoyed training more. And most of the battle he did enjoy were one-sided beatdowns of him beating the enemy. However, he didn't like it when Garp gave him a one-sided beating. Call him a hypocrite, but he didn't like losing. Nami didn't tie him up with ropes for now. He briefly wondered why, but quickly dismissed it as Nami recognizing that he wasn't as stupid as he made people believe. But while they walked towards the area that Buggy's crew was occupying, 
A small grin stretched across Luffy's face as he realized that Nami had adapted to this minor detail and simply planned to betray him when they got there. Though she was trying to double-cross the double-cross. Hey, I'm going to tie you up loosely, Nami whispered. It seemed that he was wrong in his conclusion. I know you can easily break out of them, but I want them to let their guards down. Luffy was impressed. So she was mainly playing a double game. Or was she trying to test him? Not that some ropes would be a hassle to him. Luffy nearly laughed at the thought of her naivete as they continued to walk. Nami wasn't stupid, far from it. Her true problem was that she was blinded by her preconceptions and common sense. But she should fix that. This world was lacking in the common sense department. A few pirates took notice of them as they walked into the plaza and signaled their captain. Buggy showed up and looked at them with no small amount of hostility. That's the girl that stole our map, someone from the group said, and the other guessed that the other person was her companion. And aren't you the guy I shot? The Blue Nose said some other stuff, but Luffy turned it down. The Straw Hat Boy also was a bit bewildered by how strong Buggy's aura was, compared to how weak he was. Was the Blue Nose lazy or something? He had some gold nugget potential there. Those that had a strong aura, they had an easy time growing strong. Though as they grew stronger, their aura strengthened as well. It was a continuous cycle of sort. Or that's how his garp had explained to him. There were many strong marine that started of with a weak aura, but grew strong over time. It mainly depended on their ambition and the effort they were willing to put in it. So it wasn't a very good estimate. What do you flashy bastards want? I hope you're here to return the map you stole. Nami took on a devious grin as her plan unfolded. In no more than a few seconds, Luffy's hands and torso were tied up with a rope that seemed to come out of nowhere. She really was good at this. That's right. I'm sick of working for this guy. I've come to return the map and join your crew. You can have my boss as a gift, she shouted. Buggy looked thoughtful at this turn of events and then started laughing. I guess you're not as stupid as I originally thought. Good work for me. Figures. Pirates soon surrounded Luffy and he rolled his eyes. Hey, before this goes any further, I have a proposal for you clown guy, Luffy said. That made Buggy frown. What did you just call him? But he was cut off. Join my pirate crew. What Luffy needed was strong people, and even though the clown was another us up to his party, he wasn't unwelcomed. Though convincing him would be tough. Chapter 43 Join my pirate crew. That's what the boy had said. The surrounding pirates looked at Luffy as if he gained a second head. Buggy wasn't even angry anymore. He just laughed. Sorry, but I don't want you in my crew, flashy bastard. No, I mean, leave your crew and join mine, Luffy said, ignoring the sarcasm and the ropes that tied him. You can be someone strong if you put your mind into it. Of course, just looking at an aura one couldn't guess someone's potential. Some people have weak aura till they awaken their hockey. Still strong-willed people had a type of aura that shone brightly to observation hockey users. But being strong-willed doesn't mean they were actually strong. But Buggy's aura seemed to be strong. He was sure he would be able to handle Luffy's full burst of Conker's hockey. And that's saying something. But then again, he was a former member of Roger's crew, so he might have just gotten used to it. And his impressive aura was because of that. Buggy almost got a flashback from a certain redhead wearing a straw hat saying something similar. Wait that hat. It couldn't be. What are you guys waiting for? Buggy almost turned hostile. Get that flashy bastard. Okay then. Nami get on the ground. This is fucking shoot out. Luffy ripped away from his restraints as the pirates poured around him to attack. But the moment the orange-headed girl dived under, Luffy made his hands mimic a handgun and started shooting. Taste my fucking railguns, lads. Asterisk bang, 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 asterisk bang. A second later, every one of the pirates got shot down with some coming out of their bodies as if they were shot by a bullet. There were no bleeding, but Luffy made sure to break some bones and give some lasting damages. There might be internal bleeding, but blood was supposed to internal anyway. Buggy and Nami looked and widened their eyes comically. Fairy jaws hit the floor in unison. Luffy brought his hands up which had some coming out of his index and middle finger, as if they were actual guns. And Luffy breathed in the smoke, blowing it out of his mouth. Uh, I almost want to touch myself. 
Both Nami and Buggy were still wide-eyed and jaws dropped to make any comment about it. So, now do you want to join my crew? Buggy quickly came out of his stupor. Never. And he shot toward Luffy with six small blades in his hand. Luffy also grabbed his Najinata and swung it. Buggy smirked internally as he knew that his devil fruit powers would be able to avoid the sharp attack. But what he didn't expect was to be hit by the side of the blade, making him blast away half screaming across the island. That's what I call a home run, Luffy said as he planted Horn's edge into the ground as he put one arm over his eyes to look at his shot. Nami again was bewildered at the impressive feats of strength. Those muscles weren't for show after all. Luffy just shot Buggy the pirate away like a freaking baseball. Oh, when did you guys come here? Luffy asked, acting ignorant. Sparky rolled his eyes. The straw hat boy was showing off again. Kobe, Zoro, and Kuina saw what Luffy did. The sword users actually wanted to help Luffy when they saw him in danger, but the monkey stopped them, and they saw how quickly he dealt with all of them. This might be even faster than Alvita's crew, Kobe said sweating a bit. Okay. That might be because of the new mask that he was wearing. But he actually thought Luffy was in danger for a moment. Even he was willing to join the fight. But it seemed that he forgot how overpowering Luffy was. Nami turned to the voice seeing the rest of the crew and Luffy laughed. Anyway, guys come aboard. There's free food here. Luffy said. And he started pulling out the foods that the buggy pirates were eating. Only Sparky seemed to join in. Later on, the others were still processing it. Zoro was the first one to break out of the stunned expression. He had smirked in a challenging way. Hey, fight me today, Zoro said. Now he got why Luffy wanted to fight both of them at once. Fighting him together might just give him a chance of beating him. But he still wanted to go against him alone, and the green-haired swordsman was just itching for a fight. He already took out three of his swords and put one of them in his mouth. He was about to put his bandana over his head. So he does use three swords at once, Kobe muttered to himself as he took a few steps back, in case a fight breaks out. Nope, Luffy answered. But before Zoro could speak, Luffy continued, I want you to fight you at your fullest. I mean that isn't a condition, but I want some challenge at least. Your recovery is great, so let's fight tomorrow or the day after. Zoro wasn't that patient, but Kuina stopped him by putting a hand in front of him. Yes. Let's do what he says for now. You just say that because you already had your good share of the fight against Captain Morgan. Kuina rolled her eyes. Oh, please the man wasn't even a challenge. But this isn't the time to fight. She pointed it at a certain direction. From where townspeople came out and were looking at Luffy like a savior. They had their town taken from them by Buggy, but all of them came prepared today to fight. But it seemed that Straw Hat Wearing Boy had already dealt with them. Of course. No one noticed that a certain bird that was dressed like a mailman snapping pictures of Luffy and the crew. Chapter 44 Kuina didn't know what to say about the straw hat boy. He seemed young, and most of the time stupid as well, or that's what he tires people to believe. But he was strong. One other key feature of the boy was his inhuman strength and skills. She had traveled to all four blues in her journey. Her father wasn't keen on her learning the way of the blade, so she had left home early before she was deemed ready by her father. And she had seen and learned the way of her sword on her own, mostly. And in all four blues, Luffy's level of skill would be usually shown by veteran pirate, those who have traveled the Grand Line. When Luffy had left with his unusual technique of skywalking, she had asked Kobe about him. Kobe was a bit informed about him, and there were rumors that Luffy was the grandson of the marine hero. The strength made sense if Luffy was from such a family. But, why would he want to be a pirate? It didn't make sense. And then Zoro had also pointed out from Sparky, the six-armed monkey, who he was someone able to communicate with, that Luffy had indeed eaten a devil fruit. But the monkey went on to detail that just eating a devil fruit won't make you stronger. It will give you supernatural abilities, yes, but won't make you stronger until you train and master your abilities. When Luffy left from the boat, Zoro said something to her that she still remembered. If we want to be strong, we should join us, Zoro had said, and he was serious, something tells me, he isn't bluffing about his strength. It had more value to her as Zoro was good at judging people's strengths. At that time, when she was at the boat, she didn't think about it much. 
But now when she saw the straw hat boy seemingly knock out almost a hundred pirates with just pointing fingers at them, she didn't know what to expect. Zoro was as amazed as she was, and it seemed as if Luffy was just playing around. But then again, Kobe did say, Luffy had taken down a 50 million pirates when he was dubbed the new hero of Goa Kingdom. Even if that was the case, she couldn't be as strong as her. A flash of a woman with blue hair welding a green-hilted saber came to her mind. Her graceful swordplay still played along her mind. That day, any doubt that she couldn't be strong as a woman vanished away. She was using her short-sightedness when the world was truly vast. Even one of the Yonkos was a woman. Though she didn't have a good reputation, it broke her perception of the world. And Kuina made a promise to the blue-haired woman to meet her at New World. Though where that was she still didn't know. Maybe an island on the Grand Line. She did teach her a few things before going. In their short encounter, she had learned a lot from her. Taking on Luffy alone might be hard, but she was still confident that both her and Zoro might be able to take down Luffy. She was already stronger than Zoro, but the green-haired swordsman always had a way to surprise her. Nami looked at Luffy's back as him and all the villagers enjoyed a small party on Buggy's former ship. All of the villagers were celebrating their town's freedom. It was odd when all the villagers found out that Luffy was also a pirate, but then soon put that back to his head when he said he wasn't like any of bad pirates. Also, it eased them that he didn't have any official crew or a ship, or anything for that matter, not even the pirate flag. So they took that as the boy being delusional and thought of him as nothing more than a self-proclaimed pirate. They evidently treated him as a hero, throwing a party and all. It lasted for no more than one hour as Luffy needed to continue on his journey. Hey! Nami called as Luffy, and the rest were already docking their small boat. You needed a navigator, right? Luffy looked at him curiously. Yes, I do actually. Want to join my crew? He asked with a welcoming smile. Nami hesitated. No. I can't join your crew, but I can help you along the waters of East Blue. She said, this was a bit of a gamble, but... I tried to trick you, she reminded him. I almost got you killed. Luffy laughed, not to brag or anything, but I don't think that will work. Well, unless I get caught by Gramps, but then I would be dead. He mumbled the last part to himself, but I'm alive, aren't I? Also, I'm pretty sure I only broke out of those ropes because you tied them loosely. Nami could practically hear the sarcasm in his voice. Others would take that as a cue and back away. The boy might try to get rid of her at the sea for trying to play the double agent, but something in her told to trust the boy. You're not mad? She asked quietly. Luffy just smiled. Nah, don't worry about it, he replied. But I will make you stay permanently in my crew one day. He winked playfully. Nami let a small smile grace her lips, but still felt guilty. She didn't have the heart to tell him that she couldn't join his crew permanently. She was so close. Sadness welled up inside her. She was really starting to like Luffy despite his affiliation as a pirate, but this couldn't last. Then I will be in your care, she told him. Luffy's smile grew wider. Welcome to the crew, Nami, he responded. Where do you want to go next, then? If she couldn't stay in the crew, then she'd be damn sure to do her job well while she was here. Our next destination is Syrup Village, he replied. Chapter 45 Our next destination is Syrup Village he replied. Nami looked thoughtful. She knew where it was. It was a small village on the Gecko Islands southwest of here. What did Luffy plan on doing there? She doubted there was anything of significance. But there might be. The boy was full of mystery. Also, she actually needed a boat to get off the island. By luck it seemed that her boat was taken by someone, so Luffy's boat was the only way off the island. What she didn't know was that Luffy had made taken the opportunity to sink it when Nami wasn't looking. He wanted the girl to on his journey, and a bit of manipulation went a long way. Are you sure you want her on the boat? We are already overcrowded. Kuina said, My boat isn't really meant for that many people. Meh. Zaro could go for a swim if it gets crowded, Luffy added with a carefree expression. Yeah, that might work. Kuniya nodded. I never agreed to this. The swordsman complained, but both Luffy and the swordswoman ignored that. With that they set sail. As the island grew more distant, Nami noticed with slight panic that there was only one bag of treasure on the boat. 
They had separated everything into two. Um, Luffy? Where's the other bag of gold? She asked nervously. Ah, I left in on the shore for the townspeople. It took a moment for this statement to register in Nami's mind. You left it? That was worth at least five million belly. She yelled in frustration. Oh, come on some charity work never hurt anybody, Luffy said. And he pointed at the bag that was on Sparky. And we have tons of valuable stuff in there. Nami looked at the six-armed monkey. And he did have a small bag carrying some valuables. As if seeing her stare, the monkey narrowed his eyes and kept the bag more secure. Now Nami was curious. What treasures could that type of small bag hold? But she did remember that Luffy once took down a pirate of 50 million. She gulped. She knew it wasn't right. But she really wanted to get that amount of money right now. Maybe joining him wasn't such a bad idea after all. No, Nami, don't think about it. She told herself. Don't let your greed fool you. Luffy is a good guy. He might call himself a pirate. But he has done nothing but good. Don't steal from him. The girl sighed internally. Luffy was the type of hero that everyone needed. Helping others when it's not their damn business. Her village was a prime example that needed help. But Nami wasn't sure if she should ask for Luffy's help. She might get the boy killed. They're not a very wealthy town. They'll need it for repairs. Besides, one of these days we will go to the City of Gold. And you can have all the gold you need. Shishishi. Nami just sighed and gave a small smile. That would be a dream come true. She chuckled herself. She still felt a bit bad about losing her money, but she could live with that. Sometimes helping others felt good. Zoro and Kuina found it ironic a pirate of all people was helping others. Maybe the rumors about him being a hero wasn't just a rumor after all. What the straw hat boy didn't notice was a glimmer in the eye of a certain pink-haired boy who was looking at Luffy with admiration. After that, it wasn't long before they reached their destination. As the island came into sight, Luffy was getting more and more excited about the prospect of seeing one of his favorite characters. Stop right there. I am Captain Usopp, the great protector of this village. State your business here. Otherwise, my 80 million followers will chase you to the ends of hell. Impressive, Luffy said. But how does this small island have so much population? Usopp hadn't really thought that one through, but it looked like they were buying it. He's lying. The other members said, with bored look. Crap. I've been found out, Usopp exclaimed as Luffy burst out laughing. Usopp swayed back and forth comically as he wondered out loud what he was to do now that he'd been discovered. Don't you dare laugh, he said firmly with his slingshot raised. I am a man of intense pride. I don't take well to being laughed at. That's why everyone calls me Usopp the Proud. This was another lie. No one called him that, but they didn't have any proof of that, did they? Hey, calm down, Luffy managed as his laughter subsided. You're Yasop's son, right? Let's just talk about things over food. We're not here to pillage or anything. Usopp lost his balance and fell off the hill he was standing on, landing face first in the dirt. He got up with an embarrassed expression. It's true that I'm Yasop's son, but how did you know? Luffy smiled genuinely. You remind me of him. Even the way you gloat is the same. Which wasn't a lie, considering his canon knowledge. Usopp's chest swelled up with pride upon hearing this, and he agreed to talk things over as a restaurant town. He even went as far as to offer to treat them. The restaurant they were eating at had a sign that simply said, food. This suggested that it was basically the only restaurant in the area. This really was a small village. As they ate, Luffy told Usopp stories of the boy's father and his incredible marksmanship, and Usopp listened eagerly. Some of the stories were from what he remembered from canon. Others were the tales of the marksmen of red hair pirates he had gathered from the underground sources. Chapter 46 There was also a rumor that Yasup once accidentally shot Admiral Akinu's robe, burning a hole in the kanji justice. Man the lava freak was angry, but the most funny part was he couldn't even find Yasup's location, Luffy said, laughing out loud. Even though it's a rumor, I can actually see that happening. A sniper's job is to be invisible and do his work quietly. Usopp had stars in his eyes, so did Kobe. No, wonder he's in Shanks' crew. Wait, Shanks. Kobe said wide-eyed, Usopp fearing no better. Do you mean red-haired Shanks? Luffy nodded, grabbing his hat. Yup, 
the one and only, the Red Yonko of the Sea, he said fondly tugging his hat. The world's greatest swordsman, Kuniya muttered, but the others didn't hear it except Luffy, which made the boy frown. It couldn't be. Hawkeye should be unless. And a wide grin dawned on his face. This world was different after all. Maybe a certain pirate didn't lose his arm. Usopp always knew his father was amazing, but it felt good to hear someone confirm it. Oh, by the way, Usopp, do you know where we could find a ship? Luffy asked, which made the boy lie, before excusing himself. They continued eating after Usopp left until the three kids from earlier rushed into the restaurant, almost falling over each other. We're here to defend the village captain, one shouted with newfound resolve. He then looked around confused. Where's Captain Usopp? Another demanded, holding up a wooden toy dagger in what he hoped to be a menacing manner. Ah, that was some good meat, Luffy sighed, patting his stomach in satisfaction. Sparky copied Luffy getting the gist of the situation. The three kids looked at him in horror. What? No way. Don't tell me you ate the captain, the third one shouted indignantly. Kobe blinked a sad expression towards the kids and muttered, I tried to stop them. The boys grew paler hearing that. Well, our swordswomen here can chop anything in fine pieces. Luffy said. She wasn't part of the crew just yet, but that was manageable. Kunia raised an amused eyebrow before nodding. Though, the man didn't have much meat on his bones. Good thing the bones weren't too tough to chew on. Now that turned dark right there. Kobe sweat dropped at the details. About your captain, Zoro said, catching their attention. He put on his best evil grin. He was delicious. No. They shouted in unison, pointing at Nami. Which? What the heck did I do? Nami said, with a tick mark on his head. Every one of them laughed. Once Kobe managed to calm them down enough to convince them it was a joke, Luffy asked if they knew why Usopp took off in such a hurry. Captain usually goes up to the mansion on the hill to recite his far-fetched stories to the girl that lived there. One of them, who introduced himself as Carrot, replied, she is always sick and isolated, and that Usopp's lies cheered her up. Most of the crew softened at that. Luffy got up. All right, let's go then. We're actually not allowed to go there, Carrot said disappointedly. Captain gets in through a secret entrance. The boy who had introduced himself as Pepper added proudly. All the more reason why we should go, Luffy said, stepping on the tool that he sat on, pointing at a random direction. Aye, mates. We go on an adventure. Rest of the crew looked dumbfounded at the captain's expression. Wow, they are totally real pirates. The three boys cheered at Luffy's shenanigan. Nami wanted to protest the logic, but the three boys cheered and took off in the direction of the hill, led by the boy who had introduced himself as Onion. Luffy laughed and trailed after them while other followed wordlessly. A tall gate surrounded the mansion, stretching around the full perimeter. The vegetable trio was wondering if they could find the captain's way in when something wrapped tightly around the waist of Sparky, Nami, Kuniya, Zoro, Kobe Pepper, Carrot, and Onion. Gomu gomu no. Luffy said jovially. The entire group, minus Sparky, looked in shock from Luffy to what was wrapped around them and back to Luffy. It was his arm. It was coiled around them like a snake. His other arm was also stretched out and had grabbed the top of the gate. Before anyone could question the absurdity of what was currently happening, Luffy shouted, Slingshot! They tried to avoid the inevitable, but were pulled along with him as he launched himself past the gate and high into the air. Luffy just enjoyed the breeze as the rest of them, minus Sparky, screamed their lungs out, tears leaking down their eyes. Before they landed, Sparky pulled free of his grip, knowing this would only be painful if his landing was dependent on his captain who wasn't exactly worried about him dying from a fall like this. He landed on his feet and skidded in a long line before finally coming to a stop. Luffy stuck the landing with his knees bent and one arm wrapped around his captive passengers, which were dangling above his head, gasping for breath. He promptly let go of them, his arms snapping back to his side as they fell to the ground in a thud. Yeah, we are in, he said. Surprisingly, they didn't crash landed as expected. Well, Luffy made sure they didn't, but they did feel the shock and terror of their quick ride. Kunia was shaking and tried to unsheathe her Wado Ikamanji, 
with a murder's glare at the teen. Looking at Kunia, Luffy quickly took cover behind Zoro's back. Save me. Ah, uh, even I'm tempted to do the same. The green swordsman gave a tired sigh. But he got that this will often happen. Hey, that was fun. Luffy protested. Like hell it was. Nami shouted, wondering how they were still alive. She was about to ask what the hell he just did, but was trying to find the right words, and the veggie trio beat her to it. Kobe was on the ground, shaking. I saw my life flash before my eyes. Sometimes Luffy wondered how this kid got into a rear admiral position in three years. That was awesome. Pepper shouted. Can we do that again? Carrot pleaded. How did you do that? Onion demanded. Chapter 47 That was awesome. Pepper shouted. Can we do that again? Carrot pleaded. How did you do that? Onion demanded. Luffy addressed them in order as he turned to each of them. Yes, it was. Maybe later. I ate the goma goma no me. I'm a rubber man. Roba man. Nami repeated helplessly, and her head sagged. Of all the ridiculous things in the world. Rubber? A few voices repeated. Now both Zoro and Kuina knew about devil fruits. And they sure knew that being rubber wasn't considered anything special. Both of them heard about Whitebeard's quack quack fruit. With how much Luffy displayed his strength, they were expecting something similar. A slash in. For those of you unfun people out there, I know I messed the name up. But it became a meme now, and I don't want to ruin it. The name should be Quake Quake Fruit, or Gura Gura no Mi. That actually brought some respect for the rubber boy. That only meant Luffy's power was no shortcut fruit, but was result of training. Something both the swordsmen could admire. Devil fruit. So it's not a rumor after all. I've never seen him do that before, she said surprise written on her face. I assume that you were just superhumans or something. The devil fruits are supposed to be a legend. Don't tell me you guys ate one too. No, not me, Zoro said. Me neither, Kuina said. Kobe didn't say anything, just shook his head. Oh yeah, only Sparky ate one. Luffy said. I actually have another fruit in the bag as well. All eyes looked at the six-armed monkeys. Some wondered if the six arms were part of the devil fruit powers. But no one voiced their question. Nami's eyes widened in realization. A devil fruit user. She didn't know a lot of it. But there were rumors that it made people invisible. True or not. The prospect for asking Luffy and Sparky for direct help against Arlong. The more she stayed with Luffy, the more he seemed to be appear like one of those aloof main characters from fantasy books she read when she was little. But Luffy was anything but aloof. He was acting that way. But underneath Luffy was more smarter than he let on. That was also the reason why she was a bit more cautioned against him. What if all of this is an attack? To let all of Thier guards down. But something in her told otherwise. Hey. What the hell are you guys doing here? They turned to the familiar voice. They hadn't noticed Usopp up in the tree until now. He was on a branch level with an open window that a young girl was leaning out of. Luffy grinned widely and pointed at Usopp. We're here to recruit you. Usopp's eyes widened to epic proportions. Recruit him? Weren't they pirates? Excitement welled up inside him, but we quickly composed himself. He pointed to himself confidently, chest inflating. Finally, someone recognizes my talent. He said with his arms crossed and a confident smirk on his face. Tell you what, let me be the captain and I'll join you. No way. Luffy shouted, still smiling. This caused Usopp to lose his balance and almost fall out of the tree. You can be the sniper, though. Uh, why not be one of the officers of the crew? Sharpshooter of the straw hat pirate, Officer Usopp, has a nice ring to it. This caught Usopp's attention, and he almost forgot about being captain. You bet it does. You won't find a better sniper in all of East Blue. They all looked at the bold statement with mixed reactions. All of them was wondering what kind of sniper used a slingshot. Except for Luffy who fondly smiled at his new crewmate. Or his future crewmate. Usopp cleverly neither confirmed or denied his joining his crew. Luffy also found it amusing how most of Usopp's nature for blatant lies his statement might actually be true. Well, when you lie so much as Usopp, some were bound to be true. This time, though, Luffy promised himself that he would make Usopp the amazing sniper he was meant to be. He already had some plans for him. The girl leaning out the window, who had been silent up until now, 
spoke up, Are these friends of yours, Usopp? Usopp looked at her and waved his hand dismissively. Oh, them? They're just fans of mine. They wanted to join my awesome pirate crew. Nami felt embarrassed for the guy. Did he have no humility? Luffy had just invited him. Come to think of it, he hadn't really given an answer yet. But Luffy seemed complacent as if he had already said yes. Oh, is that a six-armed monkey? But the girl was cut off. Hey, you delinquents. What do you think you're doing? Everyone, minus Luffy, turned to the new voice. It was a tall man with slick black hair and round glasses. He wore a formal suit and tie and walked with rigidity. Usopp and Kaya stilled upon seeing him. He stopped in front of the tree and looked at everyone other than Kaya with distaste. You are all trespassing on private property. I suggest you leave now. Clahador. It's okay. We were just talking. You don't need to kick them out, Kaya said pleadingly. The caretaker looked at Kaya and shook his head. I cannot allow this, Miss Kaya. Your condition is bad enough without that ruffian's influence. I will not allow him to poison your mind with his ridiculous fabrications. Usopp was trying his best to take the not-so-subtle insults in stride, but everyone could tell he was having trouble. Kaya looked angry but held her tongue. Nami was confused. Kaya did look pale, but not letting her have visitors wouldn't help at all. She herself felt most weak when she was alone for long periods of time. If anything, Usopp's visits should aid her mental well-being. What she needed was social interaction, not isolation from her peers. Didn't this Clahador realize that he could very well be making her condition worse by insisting on her seclusion? Kobe wanted to stop the man himself, but didn't know how to refute those arguments. Kunia just stayed silent looking at Kaya. She got enough of the picture of what was happening. Zoro just frowned. Something didn't feel right to him. Chapter 48 Usopp, although disgruntled, decided to ignore the insult and try to reason with the caretaker. Listen, I'm sorry I trespassed and I don't want any trouble or anything. I just thought Kaya could use the company. She never sees anyone and... And... Clahador interrupted. Do you presume to insinuate that you know what would best aid in Miss Kaya's recovery better than her own caretaker? What could a person of your upbringing possibly know about her needs? Usopp was really having a hard time composing himself now. Upbringing? What did he mean by that? Kaya was looking at her caretaker in horror. Either Clahador didn't notice that he had offended or didn't care. He continued, Of course, I suppose I shouldn't set such high standards from the son of a filthy pirate. Breaking and entering must be second nature to you. But I'm afraid I must ask that you not come back. He was forcefully interrupted as Usopp's fist collided with his face. He fell back onto the ground and glared up at him in annoyance. Don't worry, Usopp said quietly. I was just leaving. He turned around and stomped out of the compound, the infuriated scowl never leaving his face. Kaya had covered her mouth and was watching him leave with regret. The veggie trio shouted insults at Clahador for good measure before running off after their captain. Even Kobe felt that it was wrong as to what happened. A child shouldn't bear the sins of his parents. Kobe muttered to himself as they already excited the hearing range of the so-called butler. What Kobe didn't know was that most of the world thought otherwise, a point that would soon make him realize something. Luffy found it funny and couldn't help but laugh out loud. Kobe frowned. You don't think that's unjust? Oh, gladly, Luffy said all smiles, but his smile this time had some rage in it. I just know a certain guy that, who was pretty famous of a pirate. God. Why am I hiding from you guys? You are going to be my future crewmate. Some of them wanted to protest that they hadn't joined yet or couldn't join, but they didn't interrupt Luffy. He seemed to be well informed about piracy and anything related to Marines more than him. He was the Pirate King, and he fell in love, fucked and made a woman pregnant. He said while he chuckled, that didn't quench the anger in the statement. After his execution, the Marines hunted that poor woman down and she by her sheer willpower held the baby for two whole years. They killed every child born in that time frame, all in the name of justice. And even after all that the poor woman died and passed on the child to someone that could protect the newborn, the government still put a hunt for that boy, all because the government wanted to diminish any living relative of Roger, to wipe away the lineage of the devil span. How fucking fantastic. Luffy laughed with sarcasm and anger. 
and some of his hockey might have gotten released. But all of his future crewmates found that one thing. The straw hat boy wasn't lying. One can't copy those raw emotions. Kobe was in horror that the Marines he always idolized did something so unjust. While others might doubt Luffy's origin of being Garp's grandson, Kobe didn't. It wasn't his naivety that he believed Luffy. No. Kobe knew people and understood them far better than anyone, a trait that his mother always told him he inherited from his father. And he knew Luffy wasn't a type of person to lie about something like that. Kobe knew Luffy wasn't completely honest by any means. Everyone had their secrets, but most of what Luffy said always seemed truthful to him. Even though he knew Luffy was trying to manipulate him into joining his crew, he knew that Luffy wasn't like the other pirates. Giving him the face mask and doing other stuff so that Kobe's chance or joining the Marines doesn't go wrong. All of those were genuine. Kobe wondered if what they heard was some top secret from the Marines. Because it sure as heck wasn't common knowledge. Maybe that was why the grandson of the Marine hero didn't want to join the Marines. He was too free-minded and stubborn to do so. No one said anything as they walked back. All of them were processing the information dump that Luffy just had given up. Luffy found Usopp sitting under a tree at the edge of a cliff. He walked over and sat down next to him. Usopp noticed but didn't look at him. He was lost in his own thoughts. After a while, Luffy spoke, It's not her fault, you know? Usopp still didn't turn to look at him. No, it's not, he said. And your visits are helping her, Luffy added. Usopp looked up at the clouds and sighed. Yeah, I know, he said. Luffy nodded. That was that. Then, Kobe joined them soon enough staying silent, enjoying the midday breeze. They sat in silence for a minute before Luffy nudged Usopp, who looked up at him in question. Luffy put one finger to his lips and then pointed down at the beach. Usopp followed his finger and stiffened as he spotted Clahador walking towards an eccentrically dressed man with heart-shaped sunglasses that he had never seen before. Already suspicious, Usopp got down on his stomach and looked over the ledge. Luffy and Kobe followed suit. As they listened in on the conversation that was being held below them, Usopp's eyes gradually widened in shock and then narrowed in outrage, while Kobe's eyes widened in horror. Luffy kept a consistently focused glare on his face until the two men below them parted and walked in opposite directions. Usopp waited a few seconds to take in everything he had just heard, and then got up and abruptly started running in the direction of the village. Luffy quickly caught up and grabbed him by the arm, stopping him in his tracks. Let go. I have to warn them. Usopp shouted now that they were out of earshot. Kobe wondered why the rubber boy stopped him. Chapter 49 Let go. I have to warn them. Usopp shouted now that they were out of earshot. Kobe wondered why the rubber boy stopped him. Will they believe you? Can they even help anything if they do? Luffy asked quietly. Usopp's eyes widened as he realized the obvious answer to both questions. His expression turned troubled and he looked at the ground. Kobe was surprised at the quick thinking. Luffy didn't seem to be the thoughtful type. Then what can I do? This is the village I grew up in. I can't just abandon them to their fate. Usopp said, Then fight for what you believe. Luffy said. He also added, An island big as this should also have some marines patrolling the waters. But as you guys don't pay tax to world government, calling and help now would be ignored or thought of as a prank. Kobe snapped his head to Luffy. Tax? Wait, is that why some of the island Alvita attacked and Dokdon never had marines on them? Now everything added up. Luffy obviously added that part to manipulate Kobe. And the pink-haired kid knew it. And yet what Luffy said was nothing but the truth. Just how far is the corruption of the Marines? Is there any justice in that any organization to begin with? Fine. I will stand up against them. Usopp said with determination. I will die protecting the village like a hero. He said with shaky legs. Eh. Didn't you want to be a pirate? Yeah. But if I die, I won't be able to be one, Usopp added as he gulped. Why was he talking about his obvious demise? Then let's make sure you stay alive till then, Luffy said, with his odd laugh. Sparky, you brought the two guns I have told you to? The six-armed monkey popped up from a tree, as he took his bag out of his shoulders and scrambled something out of there. Two polished wooden guns. Toy guns made out of atom wood, Luffy said as he placed them at Usopp's shaky hands. 
salvaged them from an idiot price years ago. And after Sparky did a bit of tinkering, he was able to make it work with most round-shaped bullets. The only drawback is that it won't kill anyone. I, uh, they are surprisingly light, Usopp said. Luffy nodded. Yup, most things built from Atomwood are. When I first saw them, I just knew they would work well for my future sharpshooter. They also have minimal recoil, which also means less sound as well. Using your slingshot wouldn't be fast for pirates, and I want to see if you can master it in a day. Sparky would be helping you, of course. What Luffy was planning to John Wick Usopp up before the end of the year. Slingshots are awesome. No doubt there. But do you know what's even more awesome? Gun. Fucking guns. I tell you. The made a sound of appreciation as he took out six smaller-looking silver revolvers from his side. All of them seemed dangerous and both Usopp and Kobe had no doubts that they were. Usopp gulped. I thanks. I actually gave you this so you don't feel guilty for accidentally killing anyone, but it still uses gunpowder, so a shot to the eyes or throat could kill someone. But a shot to the chest, arms, legs, or any other areas won't knock out someone. Then again, it might be same for your slingshot. So you only have one chance for a headshot. Jez, you are not putting pressure on me at all. Usopp said, still a bit shaky, but he grabbed the guns. They were designed six-shot revolvers and used small round-type bullets, not much different from his usual slingshot ammo. The gun had an upper compartment where gunpowder needed to be added. Thanks. I actually don't want to accidentally kill someone. Luffy waved his hand. We will fix that as well. When we reach the Grandlands, we will find many bastards who you would love to blow their brains off. Luffy found some sick pleasure in the pale face of Usopp and laughed evilly. Let's not do that. The sniper said. Luffy nodded in acknowledgement and, having been prompted for advice, started brainstorming a plan out loud. Usopp and Kobe kept a focused expression and nodded every now and then, as well as throwing their own suggestions. By the time they met up with the rest of the crew, the veggie trio was nowhere in sight. Kunia seemed to be annoyed at Zoro for some reason, anger maybe, and Nami seemed to look at them warily. Kobe filled them in on what happened. Nami looked mildly disturbed but kept calm while Zoro and Kuina's expressions conveyed nothing of his thoughts. For them, it was just unpaid pirate cleaning. With the plan decided on, all of them started making preparations for the following morning. Only Usopp was out in the wild, trying to fix his aim with his new weapons. The gunshots weren't all that loud, so they could practice for some time in the edge of the island. Luffy had to say, Usopp was natural at gunslinging. There was also a reason why he put pressure on Usopp, it was to judge his talent, and also to make use of it. As in this world, talents are only shown when people are in huge pressure. And Luffy knew this one of those situations for Usopp, and he used it wisely. Taking inspiration from Usopp, Kobe also asked Luffy from hand-to-hand-to-hand -to -hand -to -hand combat training. And so Luffy drilled some basics into the pink-haired boy. He was real eager to fight of those pirates and show them justice. Huh, I'm really taking a good marine away from Grandpa for him. Anyway, Kobe also wanted to use a spear-like weapon, and found a sharp pitchfork. He was trying to copy who he saw as the strongest, so Luffy didn't mind giving him pointers. Luffy actually felt bad that he would be taking away such an honest figure from the marines. But oh well, they don't say, pirates are greedy for nothing. Chapter 50 They were waiting for the pirates to arrive. The crew was scattered around the village and the two coasts. Luffy, Sparky, Kobe, and Usopp were here, while others were elsewhere. Usopp had his wooden revolver on his side, strapped around his waist. They're here. They're coming from the other side. Luffy said, looking towards the south. Usopp and Kobe looked at him questionably. How do you know? Usopp asked skeptically. Observation hockey, which by estimate you both should be talented at. Without further explaining, Luffy grabbed Usopp and Kobe's arm. Well, let's get going. Wah. Usopp couldn't even finish his word when Luffy jumped in air bringing along with them. He then used his legs to launch them both high into the air and started using Jeppo to get them to the other side quickly. Observation hockey was about reading people's intent, and a group of pirates with malicious intent was like a flashlight in a dark forest. A good way to utilize observation hockey. Both Kobe and Usopp screamed comically, while Luffy just laughed. Sparky was on Luffy's shoulder barely even reacting. 
Usopp was flabbergasted about the concept of observation hockey as it is. But now, that didn't explain why Luffy could fly. Was he even human? It was about a six-kilometer stretch between the two coasts, and he crossed it in less than a minute. Usopp was a good runner, but it would have taken him at least ten minutes to go that distance. Zoro and Kuina took notice of them as they touched down on the slope leading down to the north shore. Nami spotted them and frowned in curiosity. The pirates have yet to reach the shore. How did they get here so fast? They are here, Kuina said, bringing their attention towards the large ship that had black cat pirates' marks on it. She was wearing her white kimono with a blue belt. Her traditional dress matched well with her sword. The Wado Ikamanji. The roar of pirates itching to pillage the village became discernible. They rushed off of the ship and flooded onto the path, running up the hill before stopping when the unexpected sight of their opposition reached their eyes. They looked at each other in confusion, having been told that no one would be expecting them. Oi, Django! One of them shouted back to the ship, There are a bunch of teenagers in the way. I thought this was supposed to be a surprise attack. Django looked a little confused as well but shouted back, does it matter? If they're in the way, just kill them. We're in a rush. Captain Kuro told us to meet him by morning. Before the pirate that had given his report could turn back to address the four of them, he felt a painful sting in his back and fell over onto the ground. The other pirates traced the path of the projectile back to one of the teenagers, who two wooden guns on his hand, one of them giving of smoke. They were surprised as they barely heard any gunshot before one of their comrades fell. That made the enemy pirates look at him with anger. And the one who got hit quickly got up, but he fell again when several shots him. Two more shots actually, and this time he wasn't getting up. Why you? Get that long nose brat. One of them screamed as they charged toward the group. Usopp, don't snipers usually snipe from a distance, Luffy said, making the long nose nod before running away to get high ground. Kobe was shaking, yet he held a pitchfork in front of him. Luffy found it cute that his pink-headed disciple was actually trying to copy how he used his Najinata. Kill those bastards, Django said, making the pirates pour out of the ship. Kuina moved first, taking the lead, charging headfirst at the group of pirates. Or what she would have done, if Luffy didn't stop her by placing Horn's Edge in front of her. You have to let the hatchings fight to gain some experience. He said, you and Zoro are strong enough to take them down without any problems, but let Kobe handle it. What? Kobe looked terrified at what Luffy said. Now, now, Usopp will have your back. The straw hat boy said, the long nose also yelled, but Luffy ignored that. You wanted to be a hero, right? So do it. Are you insane? It was Nami who spoke. Luffy looked her right in her eyes. If you truly want freedom, then you have to be ready to sacrifice something for it. If not, then you are one of the reasons why freedom never lasts. Nami felt those words slap her in the face. It was almost as if he was saying about her involvement with Arlong. Luffy saw the effect and stressed further, but to all of his crew. There's a quote I go by, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And... Weak men create hard times. If you want to break that cycle, then you have to be hard yourself. Weakness should never be celebrated, and strength should be always sought after. That is only how you keep the good times in check. All of the people were amazed at what Luffy said. Usopp and Kobe especially as they were pushed into battle right now. Now it made sense why Luffy was pushing them forward. But even still, Nami was worried about the pink-haired boy. Shouldn't we help? She asked more so whispered as Kobe took several steps forward with a pitchfork in his hand. Who? Him or them? Luffy said, have more faith in your future crewmates. He smiled. And lo and behold, Kobe was actually faring quite well against the cannon folder of the Black Cat Pirates. However, every time he would stab someone with his pitchfork and blood came out, the boy would be visibly shaken. It would have made the other pirates take down Kobe easily. But it wasn't the case because a certain sniper made sure to put a bullet right before they could attack Kobe. Nami was actually amazed at Kobe's and Usopp's teamwork. That's the end of part 1 in this tale for now. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in part 2. Feel free to support the author link in the description and my other stories on the channel. Peace.